Part 1, Chapter 1 of The White Peacock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. Part 1, Chapter 1. The People of Nethermere. I stood watching the shadowy fish slide through the gloom of the mill pond. They were grey, descendants of the silvery things that had darted away from the monks in the young days when the valley was lusty. The whole place was gathered in the musing of old age. The thick-piled trees on the far shore were too dark and sober to dally with the sun. The weeds stood crowded and motionless. Not even a little wind flickered the willows of the islets. The water lay softly, intensely still. Only the thin stream falling through the mill-race murmured to itself of the tumult of life which had once quickened the valley. I was almost startled into the water from my perch on the alder roots by a voice saying, Well, what is there to look at? My friend was a young farmer, stoutly built, brown-eyed, with a naturally fair skin burned dark and freckled in patches. He laughed, seeing me start, and looked down at me with lazy curiosity. I was thinking the place seemed old, brooding over its past. He looked at me with a lazy, indulgent smile, and lay down on his back on the bank, saying, It's all right for a doss, here. Your life is nothing else but a doss. I shall laugh when someone jerks you awake, I replied. He smiled comfortably, and put his hands over his eyes because of the light. Why shall you laugh? he drawled. "'Because you'll be amusing,' said I. "'We were silent for a long time, "'when he rolled over and began to poke with his finger in the bank. "'I thought,' he said in his leisurely fashion, "'there was some cause for all this buzzing.' "'I looked, and saw that he had poked out an old papery nest "'of those pretty field bees "'which seemed to have dipped their tails into bright amber dust. "'Some agitated insects ran round to the cluster of eggs,' most of which were empty now, the crowns gone. A few young bees staggered about in uncertain flight before they could gather power to wing away in a strong course. He watched the little ones that ran in and out among the shadows of the grass, hither and thither in consternation. "'Come here, come here,' he said, imprisoning one poor little bee under a grass stalk, while with another stalk he loosened the folded blue wings. "'Don't tease the little beggar,' I said. It doesn't hurt him. I wanted to see if it was because he couldn't spread his wings that he couldn't fly. There he goes. No, he doesn't. Let's try another. Leave them alone, said I. Let them run in the sun. They're only just out of the shells. Don't torment them into flight. He persisted, however, and broke the wing of the next. Oh, dear, pity, said he. And he crushed the little thing between his fingers. Then he examined the eggs and pulled out some silk from round the dead lava, and investigated it all in a desultory manner, asking of me all I knew about the insects. When he had finished, he flung the clustered eggs into the water and rose, pulling out his watch from the depth of his breeches pocket. "'I thought it was about dinner-time,' said he, smiling at me. "'I always know when it's about twelve. Are you coming in?' "'I'm coming down, at any rate,' said I as we passed along the pond bank and over the plank bridge that crossed the brow of the falling sluice. The bank side, where the grey orchard twisted its trees, was a steep declivity, long and sharp, dropping down to the garden. The stones of the large house were burdened with ivy and honeysuckle, and the great lilac bush that had once guarded the porch now almost blocked the doorway. We passed out of the front garden into the farmyard, and walked along the brick path to the back door. "'Shut the gate, will you?' he said to me over his shoulder, as he passed on first. We went through the large scullery into the kitchen. The servant girl was just hurriedly snatching the tablecloth out of the table drawer, and his mother, a quaint little woman with big brown eyes, was hovering round the wide fireplace with a fork. "'Dinner not ready?' said he, with a shade of resentment. "'No, George.' replied his mother apologetically. It isn't. The fire wouldn't burn a bit. You shall have it in a few minutes, though. He dropped on the sofa and began to read a novel. 
I wanted to go, but his mother insisted on my staying. Don't go, she pleaded. Emily will be so glad if you stay, and father will, I'm sure. Sit down now. I sat down on a rush chair by the long window that looked out into the yard. As he was reading, and as it took all his mother's powers to watch the potatoes boil and the meat roast, I was left to my thoughts. George, indifferent to all claims, continued to read. It was very annoying to watch him pulling his brown moustache and reading indolently, while the dog rubbed against his leggings and against the knee of his old riding breeches. He would not even be at the trouble to play with Tripp's ears, he was so content with his novel and his moustache. Round and round twirled his thick fingers, and the muscles of his bare arm moved slightly under the red-brown skin. The little square window above him filtered a green light from the foliage of the great horse-chestnut outside, and the glimmer fell on his dark hair, and trembled across the plates which Annie was reaching down from the rack, and across the face of the tall clock. The kitchen was very big, the table looked lonely, and the chairs mourned darkly for the lost companionship of the sofa. The chimney was a black cavern away at the back, and the ingle-nook seats shut in another little compartment, ruddy with firelight, where the mother hovered. It was rather a desolate kitchen, such a bare expanse of uneven grey flagstone, such far away dark corners and sober furniture. The only gay things were the chintz coverings of the sofa and the armchair cushions, bright red in the bare sombre room. Some might smile at the old clock, adorned as it was with remarkable and vivid poultry. In me it only provoked wonder and contemplation. In a little while he heard the scraping of heavy boots outside, and the father entered. He was a big burly farmer with his half-bald head sprinkled with crisp little curls. Hello, Cyril, he said cheerfully. You've not forsaken us, then. And turning to his son, Have you many more rows in the coppice close? Finished replied George, continuing to read. That's all right. You've got on with them. The rabbits have bitten them turnips down, Mother. I expect so, replied his wife, whose soul was in the saucepans. At last she deemed the potatoes cooked and went out with the steaming pan. The dinner was set on the table and the father began to carve. George looked over his book to survey the fare, then read until his plate was handed to him. The maid sat at her little table near the window, and we began the meal. There came the treading of four feet along the brick path, and a little girl entered, followed by her grown-up sister. The child's long brown hair was tossed wildly back beneath her sailor hat. She flung aside this article of her attire, and sat down to dinner, talking endlessly to her mother. The elder sister, a girl of about twenty-one, gave me a smile and a bright look from her brown eyes, and went to wash her hands. Then she came and sat down, and looked discontinently at the underdone beef on her plate. "'I do hate this raw meat,' she said. "'Good for you,' replied her brother, who was eating industriously. "'Give you some muscle to wallop the nippers.' pushed it aside and began to eat the vegetables. Her brother recharged his plate and continued to eat. "'Well, Aunt George, I do think you might pass a body that gravy.' said Molly, the younger sister, in injured tones. Certainly, he replied. Won't you have the joint as well? No, retorted the young lady of twelve. I don't expect you've done with it yet. Never, he exclaimed across a mouthful. Do you think so? said the elder sister, Emily, sarcastically. Yes, he replied complacently. You've made her as sharp as yourself, I see, since you've had her in standard six. I'll try a potato, mother, if you can find one that's done. Oh, George, they seem mixed. I'm sure that was done that I tried. There, they are mixed. Look at this one. It's soft enough. I'm sure they were boiling long enough. Don't explain and apologise to him, said Emily irritably. Perhaps the kids were too much for her this morning, he said calmly to nobody in particular. No, chimed in Molly. She knocked a lad across his nose and made it bleed. Little wretch, said Emily, swallowing with difficulty. I'm glad I did. Some of my lads belong to, to, to the devil, suggested George, but she would not accept it from him. Her father sat laughing. Her mother, with distress in her eyes, looked at her daughter, who hung her head and made patterns on the tablecloth with her finger. Are they worse than the last lot? 
asked the mother, softly, fearfully. No, nothing extra, was the curt answer. She merely felt like bashing them, said George, calling as he looked at the sugar bowl and at his pudding. Fetch some more sugar, Annie. The maid rose from her little table in the corner, and the mother also hurried to the cupboard. Emily trifled with her dinner, and said bitterly to him, I only wish you would have a taste of teaching. It would cure your self-satisfaction. Phew, <laughs> he replied contemptuously. I could easily bleed the noses of a handful of kids. You wouldn't sit there bleating like a fatted calf, she continued. This speech so tickled Molly that she went off into a burst of laughter, much to the terror of her mother, who stood up in trembling apprehension lest she should choke. You made a joke, Emily, he said, looking at his younger sister's contortions. Emily was too impatient to speak to him further, and left the table. Soon the two men went back to the fallow to the turnips, and I walked along the path with the girls as they were going to school. He irritates me in everything he does and says, burst out Emily with much heat. He's a pig sometimes, said I. He is, she insisted. He irritates me past bearing with his grand know-all way and his heavy smartness. I can't beat it. And the way Mother humbles herself to him. It makes you wild, said I. Wild, she echoed, her voice vibrating with nervous passion. We walked on in silence, till she asked, Have you brought me those verses of yours? No, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten them again. As a matter of fact, I've sent them away. But you promised me. You know what my promises are. I'm as irresponsible as a puff of wind. She frowned with impatience, and her disappointment was greater than necessary. When I left her at the corner of the lane, I felt a sting of her deep reproach in my mind. I always felt the reproach when she had gone. I ran over the little bright brook that came from the weedy bottom pond. The stepping stones were white in the sun, and the water slid sleepily among them. One or two butterflies, indistinguishable against the blue sky, trifled from flower to flower, and led me up the hill, across the field where the hot sunshine stood as in a bowl, and I was entering the caverns of the wood, where the oaks bowed over and saved us a grateful shade. Within, everything was so still and cool that my steps hung heavily along the path. The bracken held out arms to me, and the bosom of the wood was full of sweetness, but I journeyed on, spurred by the attacks of an army of flies which kept up a guerrilla warfare round my head, till I had passed the black rhododendron bushes in the garden, where they left me, scenting, no doubt, Rebecca's pots of vinegar and sugar. The low red house, with its roof discoloured and sunken, dozed in sunlight, and slept profoundly in the shade thrown by the massive maples encroaching from the wood. There was no one in the dining-room, but I could hear the word of a sewing-machine coming from the little study, a sound as of some great vindictive insect buzzing about, now louder, now softer, now settling. Then came a jingle of four or five keys at the bottom of the keyboard of the drawing-room piano, continuing till the whole range had been covered in little leaps, as if some very fat frog had jumped from end to end. That must be Mother dusting the drawing-room, I thought. The unaccustomed sound of the old piano startled me. The vocal cords behind the green silk bosom, you only discovered it was not a bronze silk bosom by poking a fold aside, had become as thin and tuneless as a dried old woman's. Age had yellowed the teeth of my mother's little piano and shrunken its spindle legs. Poor old thing, it could but screech in answer to Letty's fingers flying across it in scorn. So the prim brown lips were always closed save to admit the duster. Now, however, the little old maidish piano began to sing a tinkling Victorian melody, and I fancied it must be some demure little woman with curls like bunches of hops on either side of her face who was touching it. The coy little tune teased me with old sensations, but my memory would give me no assistance. As I stood trying to fix my vague feelings, Rebecca came in to remove the cloth from the table. Who is playing, Beck? I asked. Your mother, Cyril. But she never plays. I thought she couldn't. Ah, replied Rebecca, you forget when you was a little thing sitting playing against her frock with the prayer book and she singing to you. 
You can't remember her when her curls was long like a piece of brown silk. You can't remember her when she used to play and sing before Letty came and your father was... Rebecca turned and left the room. I went and peeped in the drawing room. Mother sat before the little brown piano with her plump, rather stiff fingers moving across the keys, a faint smile on her lips. At that moment, Letty came flying past me and flung her arms round Mother's neck, kissing her and saying, Oh, my dear, fancy my dear playing the piano. Oh, little woman, we never knew you could. Nor can I, replied Mother, laughing, disengaging herself. I only wondered if I could just strum out this old tune. I learned it when I was quite a girl, on this piano. It was a cracked one then, the only one I had. But play again, dearie, do play again. It was like the clinking of lustre glasses, and you look so quaint at the piano. Do play, my dear, pleaded Letty. Nay, said my mother. The touch of the old keys on my fingers is making me sentimental. You would like to see me reduced to the tears of old age. Old age? scolded Letty, kissing her again. You are young enough to play little romances. Tell us about it, mother. About what, child? When you used to play? All my fingers were stiff with fifty-odd years. Where have you been, Cyril, that you weren't into dinner? Only down to Australia Mill, said I. Of course, said mother coldly. Why, of course, I asked. And you came away as soon as Em went to school? said Letty. I did, said I. They were cross with me, these two women. After I had swallowed my little resentment, I said, They would have me stay to dinner. My mother felt safe no reply. And has the great George found a girl yet? asked Letty. No, I replied, he never will at this rate. Nobody will ever be good enough for him. I'm sure I don't know what you can find in any of them to take you there so much, said my mother. Don't be so mean, Mater, I answered, nettled. You know I like them. I know you like her, said my mother sarcastically. As for him, he's an unlicked cub. What can you expect when his mother has spoiled him as he she has? But I wonder you are so interested in licking him. Mother sniffed contemptuously. He is rather good-looking said Letty with a smile. You can make a man of him, I am sure, I said, bowing satirically to her. I am not interested, she replied, also satirical. Then she tossed her head, and all the fine hairs that were free from bonds made a mist of yellow light in the sun. What frock shall I wear, Mater? she asked. Nay, hey, don't ask me, replied her mother. I think I'll wear the heliotrope, though this sun will fade it she said pensively. She was tall, nearly six feet in height, but slenderly formed. Her hair was yellow, tended towards a dun brown. She had beautiful eyes and brows, but not a nice nose. Her hands were very beautiful. Where are you going? I asked. She did not answer me. To Tempest, I said. She did not reply. Well, I don't know what you can see in him, I continued. Indeed, said she, He's as good as most folk. We both began to laugh. Not, she continued blushing, that I think anything about him. I'm, I'm merely going for a game of tennis. Are you coming? What should you say if I agree? I asked. Oh, she tossed her head. We shall all be very pleased, I'm sure. Hooray, said I with fine irony. She laughed at me, blushed, and ran upstairs. Half an hour afterwards she popped her head in the study to bid me good-bye, wishing to see if I appreciated her. She was so charming in her fresh linen frock and flowered hat that I could not but be proud of her. She expected me to follow her to the window, or, from between the great purple rhododendrons, she waved me a lace mitten, then glinted on like a flower moving brightly through the green hazels. Her path lay through the wood in the opposite direction from Streddy Mill, down the red drive, across the tree scattered pace, to the high road. This road ran along the end of our lakelet, Nethermere, for about a quarter of a mile. Nethermere is the lowest in a chain of three ponds. The other two are the upper and lower mill ponds at Strelly. This is the largest and most charming piece of water, a mile long and about a quarter of a mile in width. Our wood 
runs down to the water's edge. On the opposite side, on a hill beyond the farthest corner of the lake, stands Hightlose. It looks across the water at us in Woodside with one eye, as it were, while our cottage casts a sidelong glance back again at the proud house and peeps coyly through the trees. I could see Letty like a distant sail stealing along the water's edge, her parasol flowing above. She turned through the wicket under the pine clump, climbed the steep field, and was enfolded again in the trees beside Hightlow's. Leslie was sprawled on a camp chair under a copper beech on the lawn, his cigar glowing. He watched the ash grow strange and grey in the warm daylight, and he felt sorry for poor Nell Witcherly, whom he had driven that morning to the station. For would she not be frightfully cut up as the train whirled her further and further away? These girls are so daft with a fellow. But she was a nice little thing. He kept Marie to write to her. At this point he caught sight of a parasol fluttering along the drive, and immediately he fell into a deep sleep, with just a tiny slit in his slumber to allow him to see Letty approach. She, finding her watchman ungallantly asleep, and his cigar, instead of his lamp untrimmed, broke off a twig of syringa whose ivory buds had not yet burst with luscious scent. I know not how the end of his nose tickled in anticipation before she tickled him in reality, but he kept bravely still until the petals swept him. Then, starting from his sleep, he exclaimed, Letty, I was dreaming of kisses. Of the bridge of your nose? laughed she. But whose were the kisses? Who produced the sensation? he smiled. Since I only tapped your nose, you should dream of... Go on, said he expectantly. Of Dr. Slop, she replied, smiling to herself as she closed her parasol. I do not know the gentleman, he said, afraid that she was laughing at him. No, your nose is quite classic, she answered, giving him one of those brief, intimate glances with which women flatter men so cleverly. He radiated with pleasure. End of Part 1 Chapter 1Part 1, Chapter 2 of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 2 Dangling the Apple. The long drawn booming of the wind in the wood, and the sobbing and moaning in the maples and oaks near the house, had made Letty restless. She did not want to go anywhere, she did not want to do anything so she insisted on my just going out with her as far as the edge of the water. Across the tangle of fern and bracken, bramble and wild raspberry canes that spread in the open base before the house, and we went down the grassy slope to the edge of Nethermere. The wind whipped up noisy little wavelets, the cluck and clatter of these among the pebbles, the swish of the rushes and the freshening of the breeze against our faces, roused us. The tall meadow sweet was in bud along the tiny beach, and we walked knee-deep among it, watching the foamy race of the ripples and the whitening of the willows on the far shore. At the place where Nethermere narrows to the upper end, and receives the brook from Strelly, the wood sweeps down and stands with its feet washed round with waters. We broke our way along the shore, crushing the sharp-scented wild mint, whose odour checks the breath, and examining here and there among the marshy places ragged nests of waterfowl now deserted. Some slim young lapwings started at our approach and sped lightly from us, their necks outstretched in straining fear of that which could not hurt them. One, two, fled cheeping into cover of the wood. Almost instantly they coursed back again to where we stood, to dart off from us at an angle, in an ecstasy of bewilderment and terror. What has frightened the crazy little things? asked Letty. I don't know. They've cheek enough sometimes. Then they go whining, scalping off from a fancy as if they had a snake under their wings. Letty, however, paid small attention to my eloquence. She pushed aside an elder bush, which graciously showered down upon her myriad crumbs from its flowers like slices of bread, and bathed her in a medicinal scent. I followed her, taking my dose, and was startled to hear her sudden, Oh, Cyril! 
On the bank before us lay a black cat, both hind paws torn and bloody in a trap. It had no doubt been bounding forward after its prey when it was caught. It was gaunt and wild. No wonder it frightened the poor lapwings into cheeping hysteria. It glared at us fiercely, growling low. How cruel! Oh, how cruel! cried Letty, shuddering. I wrapped my cap and Letty's scarf over my hands and bent to open the trap. The cat struck with her teeth, tearing the cloth convulsively. When it was free, it sprang away with one bound and fell, panting, watching us. I wrapped the creature in my jacket and picked her up, murmuring, Poor Mrs. Nicky Ben, we always prophesied it of you. What would you do with it? asked Letty. It is one of the Australian mill cats, said I, and so I'll take her home. The poor animal moved and murmured, and I carried her, but we brought her home. They stared on seeing me enter the kitchen, coatless, carrying a strange bundle, while Letty followed me. I have brought poor Mrs. Nicky Ben, said I, unfolding my burden. Oh, what a shame, cried Emily, putting out her hand to touch the cat, but drawing him quickly back like the peewits. This is how they all go, said the mother. I wish keepers had to sit two or three days with their bare ankles in a trap, said Molly in a vindictive tone. We laid the poor brute on the rug and gave it warm milk. It drank very little, being too feeble. Molly, full of anger, fetched Mr. Nicky Ben, another fine black cat, to survey his crippled mate. Mr. Nicky Ben looked, shrugged his sleek shoulders, and walked away with high steps. There was a general feminine outcry on masculine callousness. George came in for hot water. He exclaimed in surprise on seeing us, and his eyes became animated. Look at Mrs. Nicky Ben, cried Molly. He dropped on his knees on the rug and lifted the wounded paws. Broken, said he. How awful, said Emily, shuddering violently and leaving the room. Both, I asked. Only one, look. You're hurting her, cried Betty. It's no good, said he. Molly and the mother hurried out of the kitchen into the parlour. What are you going to do? asked Letty. Put her out of her misery, he replied, taking up the poor cat. We followed him into the barn. The quickest way, said he, is to swing her round and knock her head against the wall. You make me sick, exclaimed Letty. I'll drown her then, he said with a smile. We watched him morbidly as he took a length of twine and fastened a noose round the animal's neck, and near it an iron goose. He kept a long piece of cord attached to the goose. "'You're not coming, are you?' said he. Letty looked at him. She had grown rather white. "'It'll make you sick,' he said. She did not answer, but followed him across the yard to the garden. On the bank of the lower mill pond he turned again to us and said, "'Now for it. You are chief mourners.' As neither of us replied, he smiled and dropped the poor writhing cat into the water, saying, "Goodbye, Mrs. Nicky Ben." We waited on the bank some time. He eyed us curiously. "Cyril," said Letty quietly, "isn't it cruel? Isn't it awful?" I had nothing to say. "Do you mean me?" asked George. "Not you in particular. Everything. If we move, the blood rises in our heel prints." He looked at her seriously with dark eyes. I had to drown her out of mercy, said he, fastening the cord he held to an ash pole. Then he went to get a spade, and with it he dug a grave in the old black earth. If, said he, the poor old cat had made a prettier corpse, you'd have thrown violets on her. He struck the spade into the ground, and hauled up the cat and the iron goose. Well, he said, surveying the hideous object, haven't her good looks gone? She was a fine cat. Bury it and have done, Letty replied. He did so, asking, Shall you have bad dreams after it? Dreams do not trouble me, she answered, turning away. We went indoors into the parlour where Emily sat by a window, biting her finger. The room was long and not very high. There was a great rough beam across the ceiling. On the mantelpiece and in the fireplace and over the piano, were wild flowers and fresh leaves plentifully scattered. The room was cool with the scent of the woods. "'Has he done it?' asked Emily. "'And did you watch him? If I had seen it, I should have hated the sight of him, and I'd rather have touched a maggot than him.' 
I shouldn't be particularly pleased if he touched me, said Letty. There's something so loathsome about callousness and brutality, said Emily. He fills me with disgust. Does he? said Letty, smiling coldly. She went across to the old piano. He's only healthy. He's never been sick. Not anywhere yet. She sat down and played at random, letting the numbed notes fall like dead leaves from the haughty ancient piano. Emily and I talked on by the window about books and people. She was intensely serious and generally succeeded in reducing me to the same state. After a while, when the milking and feeding were finished, George came in. Letty was still playing the piano. He asked her why she didn't play something with a tune in it, and this caused her to turn round in her chair to give him a withering answer. His appearance, however, scattered her words like startled birds. He had come straight from washing in the scullery to the parlour, and he stood behind Letty's chair, unconcernedly wiping the moisture from his arms. His sleeves were rolled up to the shoulder, and his shirt was opened wide at the breast. Letty was somewhat taken aback by the sight of him standing with legs apart, dressed in dirty leggings and boots and breeches torn at the knee, naked at the breast and arms. "'Why don't you play something with a tune in it?' he repeated, rubbing the towel over his shoulders beneath the shirt. "'A tune?' she echoed, watching the swelling of his arms as he moved them, and the rise and fall of his breasts, wonderfully solid and white." Then, having curiously examined the sudden meeting of the sun-hot skin with the white flesh in his throat, her eyes met his, and she turned again to the piano, while the colour grew in her ears, mercifully sheltered by a profusion of bright curls. "'What shall I play?' she asked, fingering the keys somewhat confusedly. He dragged out a book of songs from a little heap of music, and set it before her. "'Which do you want to sing?' she asked, thrilling a little as she felt his arms so near her. "'Anything you like.' "'A love song,' she said. "'If you like, yes, a love song,' he laughed with clumsy insinuation that made the girl writhe. She did not answer, but began to play Sullivan's Titwillow. He had a passable bass voice, not of any great depth, and he sang with gusto. Then she gave him, "'Drink to me only with thine eyes.' At the end she turned and asked him if he liked the words. He replied that he thought them rather daft, but he looked at her with glowing brown eyes as if in hesitating challenge. "'That's because you have no wine in your eyes to pledge with,' she replied, answering his challenge with a blue blaze of her eyes. Then her eyelashes drooped onto her cheek. He laughed with a faint ring of consciousness and asked her how could she know. "'Because,' she said slowly, looking up at him with pretended scorn, because there's no change in your eyes when I look at you. I always think people who are worth much talk with their eyes. That's why you are forced to respect many quite uneducated people. Their eyes are so eloquent and full of knowledge. She had continued to look at him as she spoke, watching his faint appreciation of her upturned face and her hair where the light was always tangled watching his brief self-examination to see if he could feel any truth in her words, watching till he broke into a little laugh which was rather more awkward and less satisfied than usual. Then she turned away, smiling also. "'There's nothing in this book nice to sing,' she said, turning over the leaves discontentedly. I found her a volume, and she sang, "'Should he upbraid?' She had a fine soprano voice, and the song delighted him. He moved nearer to her, and when at the finish she looked round with a flashing, mischievous air, she found him pledging her with wonderful eyes. "'You like that?' said she, with the air of superior knowledge, as if, dear me, all one had to do was turn over to the right page of the vast volume of one's soul to suit these people. "'I do,' he answered emphatically, thus acknowledging her triumph. I'd rather dance and sing round wrinkled care than carefully shut the door on him while I slept in the chimney, wouldn't you? she asked. He laughed, and began to consider what she meant before he replied. As you do, she added. What? he asked. Keep half your senses asleep, half alive. Do I? he asked. Of course you do. Boss, Bovis, and Ox. You are like a stalled ox, food and comfort no more. Don't you love comfort? 
she smiled. Don't you, he replied, smiling shamefaced. Of course. Come and turn over me while I play this piece. Well, I'll nod when you must turn. Bring a chair. She began to play a romance of Schubert's. He leaned nearer to her to take hold of the leaf of music. She felt her loose hair touch his face, and turned to him a quick, laughing glance while she played. At the end of the page she nodded, but he was oblivious. Yes, she said, suddenly impatient, and he tried to get the leaf over. She quickly pushed his hand aside, turned the page herself, and continued playing. Sorry, said he, blushing actually. Don't bother, she said, continuing to play without observing him. When she'd finished, there, she said, now tell me how you felt while I was playing. Oh, a fool, he replied, covered with confusion. I'm glad to hear it, she said, but I didn't mean that. I meant, how did the music make you feel? I don't know whether it made me feel anything, he replied deliberately, pondering over his answer as usual. I tell you, she declared, you're either asleep or stupid. Did you really see nothing in the music? But what did you think about? He laughed, and thought a while, and laughed again. Why? he admitted, laughing, and trying to tell the exact truth. I thought how pretty your hands are, and what they are like to touch, and I thought it was a new experience to feel somebody's hair tickling my cheek. When he had finished his deliberate account, she gave his hand a little knock, and left him, saying, You are worse and worse. She came across the room to the couch where I was sitting, talking to Emily, and put her arm round my neck. Isn't it time to go home, Pat? she asked. Half past eight, quite early, said I. But I believe, I think I ought to be home now, she said. Don't go, said he. Why, I asked. Stay to supper, urged Emily. But I believe, she hesitated. She has another fish to fry, I said. I'm not sure, she hesitated again. Then she flashed at a sudden wrath, exclaiming, Don't be so mean and nasty, Cyril. Were you going somewhere? asked George humbly. Why, no, she said, blushing. Then stay to supper, will you? he begged. She laughed and yielded. He went into the kitchen. Mr. Saxton was sitting reading. Tripp, the big bull terrier, lay at his feet, pretending to sleep. Mr. Nicky Ben reposed calmly on the sofa. Mrs. Saxton and Molly were just going to bed. We bade them good night and sat down. Annie, the servant, had gone home, so Emily prepared the supper. Nobody can touch that piano like you, said Mr. Saxton to Letty, beaming upon her with admiration and deference. He was proud of the stately, mumbling old thing, and used to say that it was full of music for those that liked to ask for it. Letty laughed, and said that so few folks ever tried it that her honour was not great. "'What do you think of Aunt George's singing?' <laughs> asked the father proudly, but with a deprecating laugh at the end. "'I tell him, when he's in love, he'll sing quite well,' she said. "'When he's in love?' echoed the father, laughing aloud, very pleased. "'Yes,' she said, "'when he finds out something he wants and can't have.' George thought about it, and he laughed also. Emily, who was laying the table, said, there's hardly any water in the pippin, George. Oh, dash, she exclaimed, I've taken my boots off. Not a very big job to put them on again, said his sister. Why couldn't Annie fetch it? What's she here for? he said angrily. Emily looked at us, tossed her head, and turned her back on him. I'll go, I'll go after supper, said the father in a comforting tone. After supper? laughed Emily. George got up and shuffled out. He had to go into the spinney near the house to a well, and being warm, disliked turning out. We just sat down to supper when Tripp rushed, barking to the door. Be quiet, ordered the father, thinking of those in bed, and he followed the dog. It was Leslie. He wanted Letty to go home with him at once. This she refused to do, so he came indoors and was persuaded to sit down at table. He swallowed a morsel of bread and cheese and a cup of coffee, talking to Letty of a garden party which was going to be arranged at High Close for the following week. "'What is it for, then?' interrupted Mr. Saxon. "'For?' echoed Leslie. "'Is it for the missionaries, or the unemployed, or something?' 
explained Mr. Saxton. It's a garden party, not a bazaar, said Leslie. Oh, a private affair. I thought it would be some church matter of your mother's. She's very big at the church, isn't she? She is interested in the church, yes, said Leslie, and proceeded to explain to Letty that he was arranging a tennis tournament in which she was to take part. At this point he became aware that he was monopolising the conversation and turned to George, just as the latter was taking a piece of cheese from his knife with his teeth, asking, Do you play tennis, Mr Saxon? I know Miss Saxton does not. No, said George, working the piece of cheese into his cheek. I never learned any ladies' accomplishments. Leslie turned to Emily, who had nervously been pushing two plates over a stain in the cloth, and who was very startled when she found herself addressed. My mother would be so glad if you would come to the party, Miss Saxton. I cannot. I shall be at school. Thanks very much. Ah, it's very good of you, said the father, beaming. George smiled contemptuously. When supper was over, Leslie looked at Letty to inform her that he was ready to go. She, however, refused to see his look, but talked brightly to Mr Saxton, who was delighted. George, flattered, joined in the talk with gusto. Then Leslie's angry silence began to tell on us all. After a dull lapse, George lifted his head and said to his father, Oh, I should be surprised if that little red heifer calved tonight. Let his eyes flashed with a spark of amusement at this thrust. No, assented the father, I thought so myself. For a moment's silence, George continued deliberately. I felt her gristles. George, said Emily sharply. We will go, said Leslie. George looked up sideways at Letty, and his black eyes were full of sardonic mischief. Lend me a shawl, will you, Emily? said Letty. I brought nothing, and I think the wind is cold. Emily, however, regretted that she had no shawl, and so Letty must needs wear a black coat over her summer dress. It fitted so absurdly that we all laughed, but Leslie was very angry that she should appear ludicrous before them. He showed her all the polite attentions possible, fastened the neck of her coat with his pearl scarf-pin, refusing the pin Emily discovered after some search. Then we sallied forth. When we were outside, he offered Letty his arm with an air of injured dignity. She refused it, and he began to remonstrate. I considered you ought to have been home as you promised. Pardon me, she replied, but I did not promise. But you knew I was coming, he said he. Well, you found me, she retorted. Yes, he assented, I did find you, flirting with a common fellow, he sneered. Well, she returned, he did, it is true, call a heifer a heifer. And I should think you liked it, he said. I didn't mind, she said, with galling negligence. I thought your taste was more refined, he replied sarcastically, but I suppose you thought it romantic. Very ruddy, dark, and really thrilling eyes, said she. I hate to hear a girl talk rot, said Leslie. He himself had crisp hair of the ginger class. But I mean it, she insisted, aggravating his anger. Leslie was angry. I'm glad he amuses you. Of course, I'm not hard to please, she said pointedly. Stung to the quick. Then there's some comfort in knowing I don't please you, he said coldly. Oh, but you do. You amuse me also, she said. After that he would not speak, preferring, I suppose, not to amuse her. Letty took my arm, and with her disengaged hand held her skirts above the wet grass. When he had left us at the end of the riding in the wood, Letty said, What an infant he is. A bit of an ass, I admitted. But really, she said, he's more agreeable on the whole than, than my Taurus. Your pool, I repeated, laughing. End of Part 1, Chapter 2Part 1, Chapter 3 of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 3, A Vendor of Visions. The Sunday following Letty's visit to the mill, Leslie came up in the morning, admirably dressed and perfected by a grand air. I showed him into the dark drawing room and left him. Ordinarily, he would have wandered to the stairs and sat there calling to Letty. Today, he was silent. 
I carried the news of his arrival to my sister, who was pinning on her brooch. And how is the day, old boy? she asked. I have not inquired, said I. She laughed and loitered about till it was time to set off for church before she came downstairs. Then she also assumed the grand air and bowed to him with a beautiful bow. He was somewhat taken aback and had nothing to say. She rustled across the room to the window, where the white geraniums grew magnificently. I must adorn myself, she said. It was Leslie's custom to bring her flowers. As he had not done so this day, she was piqued. He hated the scent and chalky whiteness of the geraniums. So she smiled at him as she pinned them into the bosom of her dress, saying, They are very fine, are they not? He muttered that they were. Mother came downstairs, greeted him warmly, and asked him if he would take her to church. If you will allow me, said he. You are modest today, laughed Mother. Today, he repeated. I hate modesty in a young man, said Mother. Come, we shall be late. Letty wore the geraniums all day, till evening. She brought Alice Gall home to tea, and bade me bring up Montoro when his farm work was over. The day had been hot and close. The sun was reddening in the west as we leaped across the lesser brook. The evening scents began to awake and wander unseen through the still air. An occasional yellow sunbeam would slant through the thick roof of leaves and cling passionately to the orange clusters of mountain ash berries. The trees were silent, drawing together to sleep. Only a few pink orchids stood palely by the path looking wistfully out at the ranks of red-purple bugle, whose last flowers, glowing from the top of the bronze column, yearned darkly for the sun. We sauntered on in silence, not breaking the first hush of the woodlands. As we drew near home, we heard a murmur from among the trees, from the lover's seat, where a great tree had fallen and remained mossed and covered with fragile growth. There, a crooked bough made a beautiful seat for two. Fancy being in love and making a row in such a twilight, said I, as we continued our way. But when we came opposite the fallen tree, we saw no lovers there, but a man sleeping and muttering through his sleep. The cap had fallen from his grizzled hair, and his head leaned back against a profusion of the little wild geraniums that decorated the dead bough so delicately. The man's clothing was good, but slovenly and neglected. His face was pale and warm with sickness and dissipation. As he slept, his grey beard wagged, and his loose, unlovely mouth moved in indistinct speech. He was acting over again some part of his life, and his features twitched during the unnatural sleep. He would give a little groan, gruesome to hear, and then talk to some woman. His features twitched as if with pain, and he moaned slightly. The lips opened in a grimace, showing the yellow teeth behind the beard. Then he began again talking in his throat, thickly, so that we could only tell part of what he said. It was very unpleasant. I wonder how we should end it. Suddenly, through the gleam of the twilight-haunted woods, came the scream of a rabbit caught by a weasel. The man awoke with a sharp, Ah! He looked round in consultation, then, sinking down again wearily, said, I was dreaming again. You don't seem to have nice dreams, said George. The man winced, then, looking at us, said, almost sneering, And who are you? We did not answer, but waited for him to move. He sat still, looking at us. So, he said at last, wearily, I do dream, I do, I do. He sighed heavily. Then he added sarcastically, Were you interested? No, said I, but you are out of your way. Surely, which road do you want? You want me to clear out? he said. Well, I said, laughing in deprecation, I don't mind your dreaming, but this is not the way to anywhere. Where may you be going, then? he asked. I? Home, I replied with dignity. You are a birdsell? he queried, eyeing me with bloodshot eyes. I am, I replied with more dignity, wondering who the fellow could be. He sat a few moments, looking at me. It was getting dark in the wood. Then he took up an ebony stick with a gold head and rose. The stick seemed to catch at my imagination. I watched it curiously as we walked with the old man along the path to the gate. We went with him into the open road. 
When we reached the clear sky, where the light from the west fell full on our faces, he turned again and looked at us closely. His mouth opened sharply, as if he would speak, but he stopped himself and only said, Goodbye. Goodbye. Shall you be all right? I asked, seeing him totter. Yes, all right. Goodbye, lad. He walked away feebly into the darkness. We saw the lights of a vehicle on the high road. After a while, we heard the bang of a door, and a cab rattled away. Well, whoever's he? said George, laughing. You know, said I, it's made me feel a bit rotten. Aye, he laughed, turning up the end of the exclamation with indulgent surprise. We went back home, deciding to say nothing to the women. They were sitting in the window seat watching for us, Mother and Alice and Letty. You have been a long time, said Letty. We've watched the sun go down. It's set splendidly. Look, the room of the hill is smouldering yet. What have you been doing? Waiting till your Taurus finish work. Now be quiet, she said hastily, and, turning to him, You've come to sing hymns? Anything you like, he replied. How nice of you, George, exclaimed Alice ironically. She was a short, plump girl, pale, with daring, rebellious eyes. Her mother was a wild, a family famous either for shocking lawlessness or for extreme uprightness. Alice, with an admirable father and a mother who loved her husband passionately, was wild and lawless on the surface, but at heart very upright and amenable. Her mother and she were fast friends, and Letty had a good deal of sympathy with her. But Letty generally deplored Alice's outrageous behaviour, though she relished it, if superior friends were not present. Most men enjoyed Alice in company, but they fought shy of being alone with her. Would you say the same to me? she asked. It depends what you'd answer, he said laughingly. How oh, you're so blooming cautious! I'd rather have a tack in my shoe than a cautious man, wouldn't you, Letty? Well, it depends how far I had to walk, was Letty's reply. But if I hadn't to limp too far... Alice turned away from Letty, whom she often found rather irritating. You do look glum, Sybil, she said to me. Did somebody want to kiss you? I laughed, on the wrong side, understanding her malicious feminine reference, and answered, If they had, I should have looked happy. Dear boy, smile now then, and she tipped me under the chin. I drew away. Oh, gum, we are solemn. What's the matter with you? Georgie, say something, else I'll begin to feel nervous. What shall I say? he asked, shifting his feet and resting his elbows on his knees. Oh, law, she cried in great impatience. He did not help her, but sat clasping his hands, smiling on one side of his face. He was nervous. He looked at the pictures, the ornaments, and everything in the room. Letty got up to settle some flowers on the mantelpiece, and he scrutinised her closely. She was dressed in some blue foulard stuff with lace at the throat and lace cuffs to the elbow. She was tall and supple. Her hair had a curling fluffiness, very charming. He was no taller than she, and looked shorter, being strongly built. He too had a grace of his own, but not as he sat stiffly on a horsehair chair. She was elegant in her movements. After a little while, Mother called us in to supper. Come, said Letty to him, take me in to supper. He rose, feeling very awkward. Give me your arm, said she to tease him. He did so and flushed under his tan, afraid of her round arm half hidden by lace which lay among his sleeve. When we were seated, she flourished her spoon and asked him what he would have. He hesitated, looking at the strange dishes, and said he would have some cheese. They insisted on his eating new, complicated meats. I'm sure you'd like tantaflins, don't you, Georgie? said Alice, in her mocking fashion. He was not sure. He could not analyse the flavours. He felt confused and bewildered, even through his sense of taste. Alice begged him to have salad. No, thanks, said he. I don't like it. Oh, George, she said, how can you say so when I'm offering it to you? Well, I've only had it once, said he, and that was when I was working with Flint, and he gave us fat bacon and bits of lettuce soaked in vinegar. Have a bit more salt, he kept saying, but I'd had enough. But all our lettuce, said Alice with a wink, is as sweet as a nut. No vinegar about our lettuce. 
George laughed in much confusion at her pun on my sister's name. I believe you, he said with pompous gallantry. Think of that, cried Alice. Aunt Georgie believes me. Oh, I am so, so pleased. He smiled painfully. His hand was resting on the table, the thumb tucked tight under his fingers, his knuckles white as he nervously gripped his thumb. At last, supper was finished, and he picked up his serviette from the floor and began to fold it. Nettie also seemed ill at ease. She had teased him till the sense of his awkwardness had become uncomfortable. Now she felt sorry and a, and a trifle repentant, so she went to the piano, as she always did, to dispel her moods. When she was angry, she played tender fragments of Tchaikovsky. When she was miserable, Mozart. Now she played Handel in a manner that suggested the plains of heaven in the long notes, and in the little trills, as if she were waltzing up the ladder of Jacob's dream like the damsels in Blake's pictures. Often told her she flattered herself scandalously through the piano, but generally she pretended not to understand me, and occasionally she surprised me by a sudden rush of tears to her eyes. For George's sake she played Gounod's Ave Maria, knowing that the sentiment of the chant would appeal to him and make him sad, forgetful of the petty evils of this life. I smiled as I watched the cheap spell working. When she finished, her fingers lay motionless for a minute on the keys. Then she spun round and looked him straight in the eyes, giving promise of a smile. She glanced down at her knee. You are tired of music, she said. No, he replied, shaking his head. Like it better than a salad? she asked, with a flash of raillery. He looked up at her with a sudden smile, but did not reply. He was not handsome. His features were too often in a heavy repose. But when he looked up and smiled unexpectedly, he flooded her with an access of tenderness. Then you'll have a little more, said she, and she turned again to the piano. She played soft, wistful morsels, then suddenly broke off in the midst of one sentimental plaint and left the piano, dropping into a low chair by the fire. There she sat and looked at him. He was conscious that her eyes were fixed on him, but he dared not look back at her, so he pulled his moustache. "'You're only a boy, after all,' she said to him quietly. And he turned and asked her why. "'It is a boy that you are,' she repeated, leaning back in her chair and smiling lazily at him. "'I never thought so,' he replied seriously. "'Really?' she said, chuckling. "'No,' said he, trying to recall his previous impressions. She laughed heartily, saying, "'You're growing up.' "'How?' Oh he asked. Growing up, she repeated, still laughing. But I'm sure I was never boyish, said he. I'm teaching you, said she, and when you're boyish, you'll be a very decent man. A mere man dared to be a boy for fear of tumbling off his manly dignity, and then he'd be a fool, poor thing. He laughed and sat still to think about it, as was his way. Do you like pictures? she asked suddenly, being tired of looking at him. Better than anything, he replied. Except dinner and a warm hearth and a lazy evening, she said. He looked at her suddenly, hardening at her insult and biting his lips at the taste of this humiliation. She repented and smiled her plaintive regrets to him. I'll show you some, she said, rising and going out of the room. He felt he was nearer her. She returned, carrying a pile of great books. Jove, you're pretty strong, said he. You were charming in your compliment, she said. He glanced at her to see if she were mocking. That's the highest you could say of me, isn't it? She insisted. Is it? he asked, unwilling to compromise himself. For sure, she answered. And then, laying the books on the table, I know how a man will compliment me by the way he looks at me. He kneeled before the fire. Some look at my hair, some watch the rise and fall of my breathing, some look at my neck, and a few, not you among them, look me in the eyes for my thoughts. To you I am a fine specimen, strong, pretty strong, you primitive man. He sat, twisting his fingers. She was very contrary. Bring your chair up, she said, sitting down at the table and opening a book. She talked to him of each picture, 
insisting on hearing his opinion. Sometimes he disagreed with her and would not be persuaded. At such times she was piqued. If, said she, an ancient Briton in his skins came and contradicted me as you do, wouldn't you tell him not to make an ass of himself? I don't know, said he. Then you ought to, she replied. You know nothing. How is it you ask me then, he said. She began to laugh. Why, that's a pertinent question. I think you might be rather nice, you know. Thank you, he said, smiling ironically. Oh, she said, I know you think you're perfect, but you're not. You're very annoying. Yes, exclaimed Alice, who had entered the room again, dressed ready to depart. He's so blooming slow. Great whiz. Who wants fellows to carry cold dinners? Shouldn't you like to shake him, Letty? I don't feel concerned enough, replied the other calmly. Did you ever carry a boiled pudding, Georgie? asked Alice with innocent interest, punching me slyly. Me? Why, what makes you ask? he replied, quite at a loss. Oh, I only wondered if your people needed any indigestion mixture. Pa mixes it. One and a penny halfpenny a bottle. I don't see, he began. ta old boy, I'll give you time to think about it. Good night, Nettie. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, Georgie, of someone else. Farewell. Come along, Sybil, love. The moon is shining. Good night, all. Good night. I escorted her home, while they continued to look at the pictures. He was a romanticist. He liked Copley, Fielding, Catamull and Burkitt Foster. He could see nothing whatsoever in Girtin or David Cox. They fell out decidedly over George Clausen. But, said Letty, he's a real realist. He makes common things beautiful. He sees the mystery and magnificence that envelops us, even when we work menially. I do know, and I can speak. If I hoed in the fields beside you... This was a very new idea for him, almost a shock to his imagination, and she talked unheeded. The picture under discussion was a watercolour, hoeing by Clausen. You be just that colour in the sunset, she said, thus bringing him back to the subject. And if you looked at the ground, you'd find there was a sense of warm gold fire in it. And once you'd perceived the colour, it would strengthen till you'd see nothing else. You're blind. You're only half born. You're gross with good living and heavy sleeping. You are a piano which will only play a dozen common notes. Sunset is nothing to you. It merely happens anywhere. Oh, but you make me feel as if I'd like to make you suffer. If you'd ever been sick, if you'd ever been born into a home where there was something oppressed you and you couldn't understand, if ever you'd believed or even doubted, you might have been a man by now. You'd never grow up like balms which spend all summer getting fat and fleshy but never wakening the germ of a flower. As for me, the flower is born in me, but it wants bringing forth. Things don't flower if they're overfed. You have to suffer before you blossom in this life. When death is just touching a plant, it forces it into a passion of flowering. You wonder how I have touched death. You don't know. There's always a sense of death in this home. I believe my mother hated my father before I was born. That was death in her veins for me before I was born. It makes a difference. As he sat listening, his eyes grew wide and his lips were parted, like a child who feels the tale but does not understand the words. She, looking away from herself at last, saw him, began to laugh gently, and patted his hand, saying, Oh, my dear heart, are you bewildered? How amiable of you to listen to me. There isn't any meaning at all. There isn't, really. But, said he, why do you say it? Oh, the question, she laughed. Let us go back to our muttons. We're gazing at each other like two dazed images. They turned on, chatting casually, till George suddenly exclaimed, There! It was Maurice Griffinhagen's idyll. What of it? she asked, gradually flushing. She remembered her own enthusiasm over the picture. Wouldn't it be fine, he exclaimed, looking at her with glowing eyes, his teeth showing white and a smile that was not amusement. What? she asked, dropping her head in confusion. That a, a girl like that, half afraid, a passion. He lit up, curiously. She may well be half afraid when the barbarian comes out in his glory, skins and all. But don't you like it? he asked. 
He shrugged her shoulders, saying, Make love to the next girl you meet, and by the time the poppy's red in the field, she'll hang in your arms. She'll have need to be more than half afraid, won't she? She played with the leaves of the book and did not look at him. But, he faltered, his eyes glowing, it would be rather... Don't, sweet lad, don't, she cried, laughing. But I shouldn't, he insisted. I don't know whether I should like any girl I know to. Precious Sir Galahad, she said in a mock, caressing voice, and stroking his cheek with her finger. You ought to have been a monk, a martyr, a Carthusian. He laughed, taking no notice. He was breathlessly quivering under the new sensation of heavy, unappeased fire in his breast and in the muscles of his arms. He glanced at her bosom and shivered. Are you studying just how to play the part? she asked. No, but... He tried to look at her, but failed. He shrank, laughing, and dropped his head. What? she asked with vibrant curiosity. Having become a few degrees calmer, he looked up at her now, his eyes wide and vivid, with a declaration that made her shrink back, as if flame had leaped towards her face. She bent down her head and picked at her dress. Didn't you know the picture before? she said in a low, toneless voice. He shut his eyes and shrank with shame. No, I've never seen it before, he said. I'm surprised, she said. It is a very common one. Is it? he answered. And this make-believe conversation fell. She looked up and found his eyes. They gazed at each other for a moment before they hid their faces again. It was a torture to each of them to look thus nakedly at the other, a dazzled, shrinking pain that they forced themselves to undergo for a moment, that they might the moment after tremble with a fierce sensation that filled their veins with fluid, fiery electricity. She sought almost in panic for something to say. I believe it's in Liverpool, the picture, she contrived to say. He did not kill this conversation. He was too self-conscious. He forced himself to reply, I didn't know there was a gallery in Liverpool. Oh yes, a very good one, she said. Their eyes met in the briefest flash of a glance, then both turned their faces aside. Thus averted, one from the other, they made talk. At last she rose, gathered the books together, and carried them off. At the door she turned. She must steal another key moment. Are you marring my strength? she asked. Her pose was fine. With her head thrown back, the roundness of her throat ran finely down to the bosom, which swelled above the pile of books held by her straight arms. He looked at her. Her lips smiled curiously. She put back her throat as if she were drinking. They felt the blood beating madly in their necks. Then, suddenly breaking into a slight trembling, she turned round and left the room. While she was out, he sat twisting his moustache. She came back along the hall, talking madly to herself in French, having been much impressed by Sarah Bernhardt's Dame au Camilla and Adrienne la Couvreur. Letty had caught something of the weird tone of this great actress, and her raillery and mockery came out in little wild waves. She laughed at him, and at herself, and at men in general, and at love in particular. Whatever he said to her, she answered in the same mad clatter of French, speaking high and harshly. The sound was strange and uncomfortable. There was a painful perplexity in his brow, such as I often perceived afterwards, a sense of something hurting, something he could not understand. Well, 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 she exclaimed at last. We must be mad sometimes, or we should be getting aged, huh? I wish I could understand, he said plaintively. Poor dear, she laughed. How sober he is. And will you really go? They will think we've given you no supper. You look so sad. I have supped full, he began, his eyes dancing with a smile as he ventured upon a quotation. He was very much excited. Of horrors, she cried, competing it. Now that is worse than anything I have given you. Is it? he replied and they smiled at each other. Far worse, she answered. They waited in suspense for some moments. He looked at her. 
Goodbye, she said, holding out her hand. Her voice was full of insurgent tenderness. He looked at her again, his eyes flickering. Then he took her hand. She pressed his fingers, holding them a little while. Then, ashamed of her display of feeling, she looked down. He had a deep cut across his thumb. What a gash! she exclaimed, shivering and clinging a little tighter to his fingers before she released them. He gave a little laugh. Does it hurt you? she asked very gently. He laughed again. No, he said softly, as if his thumb were not worthy of consideration. They smiled again at each other, and with a blind movement he broke the spell and was gone. End of Part 1, Chapter 3《ワン・チャプター・フォー・オブ・ザ・ワイト・ピーコック・バイ・ディ・エイチ・ロレンス。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part One, Chapter Four, The Father. Autumn set in, and the red dahlias which kept the warm light alive in their bosoms so late into the evening died in the night, and the morning had nothing but brown balls of rottenness to show. They called me as I passed the post office door in Eberwich one evening, and they gave me a letter for my mother. The distorted, sprawling handwriting perplexed me with a dim uneasiness. I put the letter away and forgot it. I remembered it later in the evening when I wished to recall something to interest my mother. She looked at the handwriting and began hastily and nervously to tear open the envelope. She held it away from her in the light of the lamp, and with eyes drawn half-closed, tried to scan it. So I found her spectacles, but she did not speak her thanks, and her hand trembled. She read the short letter quickly, then she sat down and read it again, and continued to look at it. "'What is it, mother?' I asked. She did not answer, but continued staring at the letter. I went up to her and put my hand on her shoulder, feeling very uncomfortable. She took no notice of me, beginning to murmur, Poor Frank! Poor Frank! That was my father's name. What is it, mother? Tell me what's the matter. She turned and looked at me as if I were a stranger. She got up and began to walk about the room. Then she left the room and I heard her go out of the house. The letter had fallen onto the floor. I picked it up. The handwriting was very broken. The address gave a village some few miles away. The date was three days before. My dear Lettuce, you want to know I am gone. I can hardly last a day or two. My kidneys are nearly gone. I came over one day. I didn't see you, but I saw the girl by the window, and I had a few words with the lad. He never knew, and he felt nothing. I think the girl might have done. If you knew how awfully lonely I am, Lettuce, how awfully I have been, you might feel sorry. I have saved what I could to pay you back. I have had the worst of it, Lettuce, and I am glad the end has come. I have had the worst of it. Goodbye, forever, your husband, Frank Birdsell. I was numbed by this letter of my father's. With almost agonised effort I strove to recall him, but I knew that my image of a tall, handsome, dark man with pale grey eyes was made up from my mother's few words and from a portrait I had once seen. The marriage had been unhappy. My father was a frivolous, rather vulgar character, but plausible, having a good deal of charm. He was a liar, without notion of honesty, and he had deceived my mother thoroughly. One after another she discovered his mean dishonesties and deceits, and her soul revolted from him, and because the illusion of him had broken him into a thousand vulgar fragments, she turned away with the scorn of a woman who finds her romance has been a trumpery tale. When he left her for other pleasures, Letty being a baby of three years while I was five, she rejoiced bitterly. She had heard of him indirectly, and of him nothing good, although he prospered, but he had never come to see her or written to her, in all the eighteen years. In a while my mother came in. She sat down, pleating up the hem of her black apron, and smoothing it out again. 
You know, she said, he had a right to the children, and I've kept them all the time. He could have come, said I. I set them against him. I've kept them from him, and he wanted them. I ought to be by him now. I ought to have taken you to him long ago. But how could you, when you knew nothing of him? He would have come. He wanted to come. I have felt it for years. But I kept him away. I know I have kept him away. I have felt it, and he has. Poor Frank. You'll see his mistakes now. He would not have been as cruel as I have been. Nay, mother, it is only the shock that makes you say so. This makes me know. I have felt in myself a long time that he was suffering. I have had the feeling of him in me. I knew. Yes, I did know he wanted me and you. I felt it. I have had the feeling of him upon me this last three months especially. I have been cruel to him. Well, we'll go to him now, shall we? I said. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, she replied, noticing me really for the first time. I go in the morning. And I'll go with you. Yes, in the morning. Letty has her party to Chatsworth. Don't tell her. We won't tell her. No, said I. Shortly after, my mother went upstairs. Letty came in rather late from Highclose. Leslie did not come in. In the morning they were going with a motor party into Matlock and Chatsworth, and she was excited and did not observe anything. After all, mother and I could not sit out until the warm-tempered afternoon. The air was full of a soft yellowness when we stepped down from the train at Costhay. My mother insisted on walking the long two miles to the village. We went slowly along the road, lingering over the little red flowers in the high hedge bottom up the hillside. We were reluctant to come to our destination. As we came in sight of the little grey tower of the church, we heard the sound of braying, brassy music. Before us, filling a little croft, the wakes was in full swing. Some wooden horses careered gaily round, and the swing boats leaped into the mild blue sky. We sat upon the stile, my mother and I, and watched. There were booths and coconut shies and roundabouts scattered in the small field. Groups of children moved quietly from attraction to attraction. A deeply tanned man came across the field swinging two dripping buckets of water. Women looked from the doors of their brilliant caravans, and lean dogs rose lazily and settled down again under the steps. The fair moved slowly, for all its noise. A stout lady, with a husky, masculine voice, invited the excited children into her peep-show. A swarthy man stood with his thin legs astride on the platform of the roundabouts, and, sloping backwards, his mouth distended with a row of fingers, he whistled astonishingly to the coarse row of the organ, and his whistling sounded clear, like the flight of a wild goose high over the chimney-tops, as he was carried round and round. A little fat man, with an ugly swelling on his chest, stood screaming from a filthy booth to a crowd of urchins, bidding them challenge a big, stolid young man who stood with folded arms, his fists pushing out his biceps. On being asked if he would undertake any of these prospective challenges, this young man nodded, not having yet attained a talking stage. Yes, he would take two at a time, screamed the little fat man with the big excrescent on his chest, pointing at the cowering lads and girls. Further off, Punch's quaint voice could be heard when the coconut man ceased grinding out screeches from his rattle. The coconut man was wroth, for these youngsters would not risk a penny shy, and the rattle yelled like a fiend. A little girl came along to look at us, daintily licking an ice-cream sandwich. We were uninteresting, however, so she passed on to stare at the caravans. We had almost gathered courage to cross the wakes, when the cracked bell of the church sent its note falling over the babel. One, two, three. Had it really sounded three? Then it rang on a lower bell. One, two, three. A passing bell for a man. I looked at my mother. She turned away from me. The organ flared on. The husky woman came forward to make another appeal. Then there was a lull. The man with a lump on his chest had gone inside the rag to spar with the solid fellow. The coconut man had gone to the three tons in fury, and a brazen girl of seventeen or so was in charge of the nuts. The horses careered round, carrying two frightened boys. Suddenly 
the quick throbbing note of the low bell struck again through the din. I listened, but could not keep count. One, two, three, four. For the third time that great lad had determined to go on the horses, and they had started while his foot was on the step, and he had been foiled. Eight, nine, ten. No wonder that whistling man had such a big Adam's apple. I wondered if it hurt his neck when he talked, being so pointed. Nineteen, twenty. The girl was licking more ice cream with precious, tiny licks. Twenty-five, twenty-six. I wondered if I did count to twenty-six mechanically. At this point I gave it up and watched for Lord Tennyson's bald head to come spinning round on the painted rim of the roundabouts, followed by a red-faced Lord Roberts and a villainous-looking Disraeli. Fifty-one, said my mother. Come, come along. We hurried through the fair, towards the church, towards a garden where the last red sentinels looked out from the top of the hollyhock spires. The garden was a tousled mass of faded pink chrysanthemums and weak-eyed Michaelmas daisies and spectre stalks of hollyhock. It belonged to a low, dark house which crouched behind a screen of yews. We walked along to the front. The blinds were down and in one room we could see the stale light of candles burning. "'Is this new cottage?' asked my mother of a curious lad. "'It's Mrs Mays,' replied the boy. "'Does she live alone?' I asked. "'She had French Carlin, but he's dead, and she's left him the candles to keep the old lad off on him.' We went to the house and knocked. "'Had you come about him?' hoarsely whispered a bent old woman looking up with very blue eyes, nodding her old head with its velvet net significantly towards the inner room. Yes, said my mother. We had a letter. Hi, poor fellow, he's gone, missus, and the old lady shook her head. Then she looked at us curiously, leaned forward, and, putting her withered old hand on my mother's arm, her hand with its dark blue veins, she whispered in confidence, And the candles has gone out twice. You were a funny fella, very funny. I must come in and settle things. I am his nearest relative, said my mother, trembling. Yes, I must adore, for when I looked up, it were black darkness. Mrs. I doesn't sit up with him no more, and many a one I've laid out. Eh, but his sufferings, Mrs. Poor fella. Eh, Mrs. She lifted her ancient hands and looked up at my mother with her eyes so intensely blue. "'Do you know where he kept his papers?' asked my mother. "'Yes, I asked Father Burns about it. He said we would pray for him. I bought him candles out of my own pocket. He wore a rum fellow he wore.' Again she shook her grey head mournfully. My mother took a step forward. "'Did you want to see him?' asked the old woman, with half-timid questioning. "'Yes,' replied my mother, with a vigorous nod. She perceived now that the old lady was deaf. We followed the woman into the kitchen, the long, low, broom, dark, withdrawn blinds. "'Sit ye down,' said the old lady in the same low tone, as if she were speaking to herself. "'Ye are his sister, Appen?' My mother shook her head. "'Oh, his brother's wife,' persisted the old lady. We shook our heads. "'On your cousin,' she guessed, and looked at us appealingly. I nodded assent. "'Sit ye there a minute,' she said and trotted off. She banged the door and jarred a chair as she went. When she returned, she set down a bottle and two glasses with a thump on the table in front of us. Her thin, skinny wrist seemed hardly capable of carrying the bottle. "'It's one as it only just begun off. Have a drop to keep you up. Do now, poor thing,' she said, pushing the bottle to my mother and hurrying off, returning with the sugar and the kettle. We refused. "'He won't want it no more, poor fellow.' And it's good, missus. He allus drank it good. Ay, and he hadn't a drop the last three days, poor man, poor fella, not a drop. Come now, it'll stay ye, come now. We refused. It's in there, she whispered, pointing to a closed door and a dark corner of the gloomy kitchen. I stumbled up a little step and went plunging against a rickety table on which was a candle and a tall brass candlestick. Over went the candle, and it rolled on the floor, and the brass holder fell with much clanging. "'Hey, hey, dear Lord, dear heart, dear heart!' wailed the old woman. She hastened, trembling, round to the other side of the bed, 
and relit the extinguished candle at the taper which was still burning. As she returned, the light glowed on her old wrinkled face and on the burnished knobs of the dark mahogany bedstead, while a stream of wax dripped down onto the floor. By the glimmering light of the tube tapers we could see the outlined form under the counterpane. She turned back the hem and began to make painful wailing sounds. My heart was beating heavily, and I felt choked. I did not want to look, but I must. It was the man I had seen in the woods, with the puffiness gone from his face. I felt the great wild pity, and a sense of terror, and a sense of horror, and a sense of awful littleness and loneliness among a great empty space. I felt beyond myself, as if I were a mere fleck drifting unconsciously through the dark. Then I felt my mother's arm round my shoulders, and she cried pitifully, Oh, my son, my son! I shivered and came back to myself. There were no tears in my mother's face, only a great pleading. Never mind, mother, ne never mind, I said incoherently. She rose and covered the face again and went round to the old lady, and held her still and stayed her little wailings. The woman wiped from her cheeks the few tears of old age, and pushed her grey hair smooth under the velvet network. "'Where are all his things?' asked Mother. "'Eh?' said the old lady, lifting up her ear. "'Are all his things here?' Mother repeated in a louder tone. "'Here?' the woman waved her hand round the room. It contained the great mahogany bedstead, naked of hangings, a desk and an oak chest, and two or three mahogany chairs. I couldn't get him upstairs. He's only been here about a three week. Where's the key to the desk? said my mother loudly in the woman's ear. Yes, she replied. It's his desk. She looked at us, perplexed and doubtful, fearing she had misunderstood us. This was dreadful. Key! I shouted. Where is the key? Her old face was full of trouble as she shook her head. I took it that she did not know. Where are his clothes? Clothes, I repeated, pointing to my coat. She understood and muttered, I'll fetch them ye. We should have followed her as she hurried upstairs through a door near the head of the bed, had we not heard a heavy footstep in the kitchen and a voice saying, Is the old lady going to drink with the devil? Hello, Mrs. May, come and drink with me. We heard the tinkle of the liquor poured into a glass, and almost immediately the light tap of the empty tumbler on the table. I'll see what the old girl's up to, he said, and the heavy tread came towards us. Like me, he stumbled at the little step, but, but escaped collision with the table. Damn that fool step, he said heartily. It was the doctor, for he kept his hat on his head and did not hesitate to stroll about the house. He was a big, burly, red-faced man. I, I beg your pardon, he said, observing my mother. My mother bowed. Mrs. Beardsall, he asked, taking off his hat. My mother bowed. I posted a letter to you. You are a relative of his, of poor old Carlin's? He nodded sideways towards the bed. The nearest, said my mother. Poor fellow, he was a bit stranded. Comes of being a bachelor man. I was very much surprised to hear from him, said my mother. Yes, I guess he's not been much of a one for writing to his friends. He's had a bad time lately. You have to pay some time or other. We bring them on ourselves, silly devils as we are. I beg your pardon. There was a moment of silence during which the doctor sighed, and then began to whistle softly. Well, we might be more comfortable if we had the blind up, he said, letting daylight in among the glimmer of the tapers as he spoke. At any rate, he said, you won't have any trouble settling up. No debt or anything of that. I believe there's a bit to leave, so it's not so bad. Poor devil, he was very down at the last. But we have to pay at one end or the other. What on earth is the old girl after? he asked, looking up at the raftered ceiling, which was rumbling and thundering with the old lady's violent rummaging. We wanted the key of his desk, said my mother. Oh, I can find you that, and the will. He told me where they were, and to give them you when you came. He seemed to think a lot of you. Perhaps he might have done better for himself. Here we heard the heavy tread of the old lady coming downstairs. The doctor went to the foot of the stairs. Hello now, be careful, he bawled. 
poor old woman did as he expected, and trod on the braces of the trousers she was training, and came crashing into his arms. He set her tenderly down, saying, Not hurt, are you? No. And he smiled at her and shook his head. Here, doctor, here, doctor, bless ye, I thank you you've come. You'll see to him now, will ye? Yes, he nodded in his bluff, winning way, and hurrying into the kitchen, he mixed her a glass of whisky, and brought one for himself, saying to her, There you are. It was a nasty shaking for you. The poor old woman sat in a chair by the open door of the staircase, the pile of clothing tumbling about her feet. She looked round pitifully at us, and at the daylight struggling among the candlelight, making a ghostly beam on the bed where the rigid figure lay unmoved. Her hand trembled so that she could scarcely hold her glass. The doctor gave us the keys, and we rifled the desk and the drawers, sorting out all the papers. The doctor sat sipping and talking to us all the time. Yes, he said, he'd only been here about two years. Felt himself beginning to break up then, I think. He'd been a long time abroad. They always called him Frenchy. The doctor sipped and reflected, and sipped again. Aye, he'd run the rig in his day. He used to dream dreadfully. Good thing the old woman was so deaf. Awful when a man gives himself away in his sleep. Played the deuce with him, knowing it. Sip, 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 and more reflections, and another glass to be mixed. But he was a jolly decent fellow, generous, open-handed. The folks didn't like him because they couldn't get to the bottom of him. They always hate a thing they can't fathom. He was close, there's no mistake, save when he was asleep sometimes. The doctor looked at his glass and sighed. However, we shall miss him. Shan't we, Mrs May? he bawled suddenly startling us, making us glance at the bed. He lit his pipe and puffed voluminously in order to obscure the attraction of the glass. Meanwhile, we examined the papers. There were very few letters, one or two addressed to Paris. There were many bills and receipts and notes. Business, all business. There was hardly a trace of sentiment among all the litter. My mother sorted out such papers as she considered valuable, the others, letters and missives, which she glanced at cursorily and put aside, she took into the kitchen and burned. She seemed afraid to find out too much. The doctor continued to, to colour his tobacco smoke with a few pensive words. Aye, he said, there are two ways. You can burn your lamp with a big draught, and it'll flare away till the oil's gone, then it'll stink and smoke itself out. Or you can keep it trim on the kitchen table, dirty your fingers occasionally trimming it up, and it'll last a long time and sink out mildly. Here he turned to his glass, and finding it empty, was awakened to reality. Anything I can do, madam? he asked. No, thank you. Aye, I don't suppose there's much to settle. Not many tears to shed, when a fellow spends his years and his prime on the Lord knows who. You can't expect those that remember him young to feel his loss too keenly. He'd had his fling in his day, though, ma'am. Aye, <laughs> Must have had some rich times. No lasting satisfaction in it, though. Always wanting, craving. There's nothing like marrying. You've got your dish before you, then, and you've got to eat it. He lapsed again into reflection, from which he did not rouse till we had locked up the desk, burned the useless papers, put the others into my pockets and the black bag, and were standing ready to depart. Then the doctor looked up suddenly and said, But what about the funeral? Then he noticed the weariness of my mother's look, and he jumped up and quickly seized his hat, saying, Come across to my wife and have a cup of tea. Buried in these damn holes, a fellow gets such a bore. Do come, my little wife is lonely. Come just to see her. My mother smiled and thanked him. We turned to go. My mother hesitated in her walk. On the threshold of the room she glanced round at the bed, but she went on. Outside, in the fresh air of the fading afternoon, I could not believe it was true. It was not true, that sad, colourless face with grey beard, wavering in the yellowed candlelight. It was a lie, that wooden bedstead, that deaf woman. They were fading phrases of the untruth. That yellow blaze of little sunflowers was true, and the shadow from the sundial on the warm old armhouses, that was real. The heavy afternoon sunlight came round us warm and reviving. We shivered, and the untruth went out of our veins, and we were no longer chilled. 
The doctor's house stood sweetly among the beech trees, and at the iron fence in front of the little lawn, a woman was talking to a beautiful Jersey cow that pushed its dark nose through the fence from the field beyond. She was a little dark woman with vivid colouring. She rubbed the nose of the delicate animal, peeped right into the dark eyes, and talked in a lovable Scottish speech, talked as a mother talks softly to her child. When she turned round in surprise to greet us, there was still the softness of a rich affection in her eyes. She gave us tea and scones and apple jelly, and all the time we listened with delight to her voice, which was musical as bees humming in the lime trees. Though she said nothing significant, we listened to her attentively. Her husband was merry and kind. She glanced at him with quick glances of apprehension, and her eyes avoided him. He, in his merry, frank way, chafed her and praised her extravagantly, and teased her again. Then he became a trifle uneasy. I think she was afraid he had been drinking. I think she was shaken with horror when she found him tipsy, and bewildered and terrified when she saw him drunk. They had no children. I noticed he ceased to joke when she became a little constrained. He glanced at her often, and looked somewhat pitiful when she avoided his looks, and he grew uneasy, and I could see he wanted to go away. "'I had better go with you to the see the vicar, then,' he said to me, and we left the room whose windows looked south over the meadows, the room where dainty little watercolours and beautiful bits of embroidery and empty flower vases and two dirty novels from the town library and the closed piano and the odd cups and the chipped spout of the teapot causing stains on the cloth all told one story. We went to the joiners and ordered the coffin, and the doctor had a glass of whisky on it. The graveyard fees were paid, and the doctor sealed the engagement with a drop of brandy. The vicar's port completed the doctor's joviality, and we went home. This time the disquiet and the little woman's dark eyes could not dispel the doctor's merriment. He rattled away, and she nervously twisted her wedding ring. He insisted on driving us to the station in spite of our alarm. But you will be quite safe with him, said his wife in her caressing highland speech. When she shook hands at parting, I noticed the hardness of the little palm, and I have always hated an old black alpaca dress. It is such a long way home from the station at Eberwich. We rode part way in the bus, then we walked. It is a very long way for my mother when her steps are heavy with trouble. Rebecca was out by the rhododendrons looking for us. She hurried to us all solicitous, and asked Mother if she had had tea. "'What you'll do with another cup?' she said, and ran back into the house. She came into the dining-room to take my mother's bonnet and coat. She wanted us to talk. She was distressed on my mother's behalf. She noticed the blackness that lay under her eyes, and she fidgeted about, unwilling to ask anything, yet uneasy and anxious to know. "'Letty has been home,' she said. And gone back again? asked Mother. She only came to change her dress. She put the green poplin on. She wondered where you'd gone. What did you tell her? I said you'd just gone out a bit. She said she was glad. She was as lively as a squirrel. Rebecca looked wistfully at my mother. At length the latter said, He's dead, Rebecca. I've seen him. Now thank God for that. No more need to worry over him. Well... He died all alone, Rebecca, all alone. He died as you've lived, said Becky, with some asperity. But I've had the children. I've had the children. We won't tell Letty, Rebecca. No. Rebecca left the room. You and Letty will have the money, said Mother to me. There was a sum of four thousand pounds or so. It was left to my mother, or in default to Letty and me. Well, mother, if it's ours, it's yours. There was silence for some minutes. Then she said, You might have had a father. We're thankful we hadn't, mother. You spared us that. But how can you tell? said my mother. I can, I replied, and I am thankful to you. If ever you feel scorn for one who is near you, rising in your throat, try and be generous, my lad. Well, said I. Yes, she replied. We'll say no more. Some time you must tell Letty. You tell her. 
I did tell her a week or so afterwards. Who knows? she asked, her face hardening. Mother, Becky and ourselves. Nobody else? No. Then it's a good thing he's out of the way if he was such a nuisance to Mother. Where is she? Upstairs. Betty ran to her. End of Part 1, Chapter 4Part 1, Chapter 5 of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 5 The Scent of Blood. The death of the man who was our father changed our lives. It was not that we suffered a great grief. The chief trouble was the unanswered crying of failure. But we were changed in our feelings and in our relations. There was a new consciousness, a new carefulness. We had lived between the woods and the water all our lives, Letty and I, and she had sought the bright notes in everything. She seemed to hear the water laughing and the leaves tittering and giggling like young girls. The aspen fluttered like the draperies of a flirt, and the sound of the wood pigeons was almost foolish in its sentimentality. Lately, however, she had noticed again the cruel, pitiful crying of a hedgehog caught in a gin and she had noticed the traps for the fierce little murderers, traps walled in with a small fence of fur, and baited with the guts of a killed rabbit. On an afternoon, a short time after our visit to Costhay, Letty sat in the window seat. The sun clung to her hair, and kissed her with passionate splashes of colour brought from the vermilion dying creeper outside. The sun loved Letty, and was loath to leave her. She looked out over Nethermere to high close, vague in the September mist. Had it not been for the scarlet light on her face, I should have thought her look was sad and serious. She nestled up to the window and leaned her head against the wooden shaft. Gradually she drooped into sleep. Then she became wonderfully childish again. It was the girl of seventeen sleeping there, with her full pouting lips slightly apart and the breath coming lightly. I felt the old feeling of responsibility. I must protect her and take care of her. There was a crunch of the gravel. It was Leslie coming. He lifted his hat to her, thinking she was looking. He had that fine, lithe physique, suggestive of much animal vigour. His person was exceedingly attractive. One watched him move about and felt pleasure. His face was less pleasing than his person. He was not handsome. His eyebrows were too light, his nose was large and ugly, and his forehead, though high and fair, was without dignity. But he had a frank, good-natured expression, and a fine, wholesome laugh. He wondered why she did not move. As he came nearer, he saw, and he winked at me and came in. He tiptoed across the room to look at her. The sweet carelessness of her attitude, the appealing, half-pitiful girlishness of her face, touched his responsive heart he leaned forward and kissed her cheek where already was a crimson stain of sunshine. He roused half out of her sleep with a little petulant, oh, as an awakened child. He sat down behind her and gently drew her head against him, looking down at her with a tender, soothing smile. I thought she was going to fall asleep thus, but her eyelids quivered and her eyes beneath them flickered into consciousness. Leslie, oh, let me go she exclaimed, pushing him away. He loosed her and rose, looking at her reproachfully. She shook her dress and went quickly to the mirror to arrange her hair. You are mean, she exclaimed, looking very flushed, vexed and dishevelled. He laughed indulgently, saying, You shouldn't go to sleep then and look so pretty. Who could help? It's not nice, she said, frowning with irritation. We are not nice, are we? I thought we were proud of our unconventionality. Why shouldn't I kiss you? Because it's a question of me, not of you alone. Dear me, you are in a way. Mother's coming. Is she? You'd better tell her. Mother was very fond of Leslie. Well, sir, she said, why are you frowning? He broke into a laugh. Letty is scolding me for kissing her when she was playing Sleeping Beauty. The conceit of the boy to play Prince, said my mother. Oh, but it appears I was sadly out of character he said ruefully. 
Letty laughed and forgave him. Well, he said, looking at her and smiling, I came to ask you to go out. It is a lovely afternoon, said Mother. She glanced at him and said, I feel dreadfully lazy. Never mind, he replied, you'll wake up. Go and put your hat on. He sounded impatient. She looked at him. He seemed to be smiling peculiarly. She lowered her eyes and went out of the room. She'll come all right, he said to himself, and to me, she likes to play you on a string. She must have heard him. When she came in again, drawing on her gloves, she said quietly, You come as well, Pat. He swung round and stared at her in angry amazement. I had rather stay and finish this sketch, I said, feeling uncomfortable. No, but do come, there's a dear. She took the brush from my hand and drew me from my chair. The blood flushed into his cheeks. He went quietly into the hall and brought my cap. All right, he said angrily. Women like to fancy themselves Napoleons. They do, dear Aunt Duke, they do, she mocked. Yes, there's a Waterloo in all their histories, he said, since she had supplied him with the idea. Say Peterloo, my general, say Peterloo. Aye, Peterloo, he replied with a splendid curl of the lip. Easy conquest. He came, he saw, he conquered, Letty recited. Are you coming? he said, getting more angry. When you bid me, she replied, taking my arm. We went through the wood and through the dishevelled borderlands to the high road. Through the borderland that should have been park-like, but which was shaggy with loose grass and yellow molehills, ragged with gorse and bramble and briar, with wandering old thorn trees and a queer clump of Scotch firs. On the highway, the leaves were falling, and they chattered under our steps. The water was mild and blue, and the corn stood drowsily in stoop. We climbed the hill behind Highclose and walked on along the upland looking across towards the hills of arid Derbyshire, and seeing them not, because it was autumn. We came in sight of the headstocks of the pit at Selsby, and of the ugly village standing blank and naked on the brow of the hill. Letty was in very high spirits. She laughed and joked continually. She picked bunches of hips and stuck them in her dress. Having got a thorn in her finger from a spray of blackberries, she went to Leslie to have it squeezed out. We were all quite gay as we turned off the high road, and went along the bridle path, with the woods on our right, the high strilly hills shutting in our small valley in front, and the fields on the common to the left. About halfway down the lane we heard the slur of the scythe stone on the scythe. Letty went to the hedge to see. It was George mowing the oats on the steep hillside where the machine could not go. His father was tying up the corn into sheaves. Breaking his back, Mr Saxon saw us and called to us to come and help pushed through a gap in the hedge and went up to him. Up then, said the father to me, take that coat off. And to Letty, have you brought us a drink? No, come, that sounds bad. Going a walk, I guess. You see what it is to get fat. And he pulled a wry face as he bent over to tie the corn. He was a man beautifully ruddy and burly in the prime of life. Show me, I'll do some, said Letty. Nay, he answered gently. It would scratch your wrists and break your stays. Hark at my hands, he rubbed them together, like sandpaper. George had his back to us and had not noticed us. He continued to mow. Leslie watched him. That's a fine movement, he exclaimed. Yes, replied the father, rising very red in the face from the tying. And our George enjoys a bit of mowing. It puts you in fine condition when you get over the first stiffness. We moved across to the standing corn. The sun being mild, George had thrown off his hat, and his black hair was moist and twisted into confused half-curls. Firmly planted, he swung with a beautiful rhythm from the waist. On the hip of his belted breeches hung the scythe stone. His shirt, faded almost white, was torn just above the belt, and showed the muscles of his back playing like lights upon the white sand of a brook. There was something exceedingly attractive in the rhythmic body. I spoke to him, and he turned round. He looked straight at Letty with a flashing, betraying smile. He was remarkably handsome. He tried to say some words of greeting. Then he bent down and gathered an armful of corn, and deliberately bound it up. Like him, Letty had found nothing to say. Leslie, however, remarked, I should think mowing is a nice exercise. 
It is, he replied, and continued as Leslie picked up the scythe. But it will make you sweat, and your hands will be sore. Leslie tossed his head a little, threw off his coat, and said briefly, How do you do it? Without waiting for a reply, he proceeded. George said nothing, but turned to Letty. You are picturesque, she said, a trifle awkwardly. Quite fit for an idyll. And you, he said. She shrugged her shoulders, laughed, and turned to pick up a scarlet pimpernel. How do you bind the corn? she asked. He took some long straws, cleaned them, and showed her the way to hold them. Instead of attending, she looked at his hands, big, hard, inflamed by the snaith of the scythe. I don't think I could do it, she said. No, he replied quietly, and watched Leslie mowing. The latter, who was wonderfully ready at everything, was doing fairly well, but he had not the invincible sweep of the other, nor did he make the same crisp, crunching music. I bet he'll sweat, said George. Don't you, she replied. A bit, but I'm not dressed up. Do you know, she said suddenly, your arms tempt me to touch them. They're such a fine brown colour and they look so hard. He held out one arm to her. She hesitated, then she swiftly put her fingertips on the smooth brown muscle and drew them along. Quickly, she hid her hand into the folds of her skirt, blushing. He laughed a low, quiet laugh, at once pleasant and startling to hear. I wish I could work here, she said, looking away at the standing corn and the dim blue woods. He followed her look and laughed quietly with indulgent resignation. I do, she said emphatically. You feel so fine, he said, pushing his hand through his open shirt front and gently rubbing the muscles of his side. It's a pleasure to work or to stand still. It's a pleasure to yourself, your own physique. She looked at him, full at his physical beauty, as if he were some great firm bud of life. Leslie came up, wiping his brow. Jove, said he, I do perspire. George picked up his coat and helped him into it, saying, You may take a chill. It's a jolly nice form of exercise, said he. George, who had been feeling one fingertip, now took out his penknife and proceeded to, to dig a thorn from his hand. What a hide you must have, said Leslie. Letty said nothing, but she recoiled slightly. The father, glad of an excuse to straighten his back and to chat, came to us. You'd soon had enough, he said, laughing to Leslie. George startled us with a sudden, Halloa! We turned and saw a rabbit which had burst from the corn, go coursing through the hedge, dodging and bounding the sheaves. The standing corn was a patch along the hillside some fifty paces in length and ten or so in width. I didn't think there'd have been any in, said the father, picking up a short rake and going to the low wall of the corn. We all followed. Watch, said the father, if you see the heads of the corn shake. We prowled round the patch of corn. Hold, look out, shouted the father excitedly, and immediately after a rabbit broke from the cover. Ay, 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 was the shout. Turn him, turn him. We set off full pelt. The bewildered little brute, scared by Leslie's wild running and crying, turned from its course and dodged across the hill, threading its terrified course through the maze of lying sheaves, spurting on in a painful zigzag, now bounding over an untied bundle of corn, now swerving from the sound of a shout. The little wretch was hard-pressed. George rushed upon it. It darted into some fallen corn, but he had seen it and had fallen on it. In an instant he was up again, and the little creature was dangling from his hand. We returned, panting, sweating, our eyes flashing to the edge of the standing corn. I heard Letty calling, and turning round saw Emily and the two children entering the field as they passed from school. There's another, shouted Leslie. I saw the oak tops quiver. Here, here, I yelled. The animal leaped out and made for the hedge. George and Leslie, who were on that side, dashed off, turned him, and he coursed back our way. I headed him off to the father, who swept in pursuit for a short distance, but who was too heavy for the work. The little beast made towards the gate, but this time Molly, with her hat in her hand and her hair flying, whirled upon him, and she and the little fragile lad sent him back again. The rabbit was getting tired. It dodged the sheaves badly, running towards the top hedge. I went after it. 
If I could have let myself fall on it, I could have caught it. But this was impossible to me, and I merely prevented its dashing through the hole into safety. It raced along the hedge bottom. George tore after it. As he was upon it, it darted into the hedge. He fell flat and shot his hand into the gap. But it had escaped. He lay there, panting in great sobs, and looking at me with eyes in which excitement and exhaustion struggled like flickering light and darkness. When he could speak, he said, Why didn't you fall on top of it? I couldn't, said I. We returned again. The two children were peering into the thick corn also. We thought there was nothing more. George began to mow. As I walked round, I caught sight of a rabbit skulking near the bottom corner of the patch. Its ears lay pressed against its back. I could see the palpitation of the heart under the brown fur, and I could see the shining dark eyes looking at me. I felt no pity for it, but still I could not actually hurt it. I beckoned to the father. He ran up and aimed a blow with a rake. There was a sharp little cry which sent a hot pain through me, as if I had been cut. But the rabbit ran out, and instantly I forgot the cry, and gave pursuit, fairly feeling my fingers stiffen to choke it. It was all lame. Leslie was upon it in a moment, and he almost pulled its head off in his excitement to kill it. I looked up. The girls were at the gate, just turning away. There are no more, said the father. At that instant Mary shouted, There's one down this hole! The hole was too small for George to get his hand in, so we dug it out with a rake handle. The stick went savagely down the hole, and there came a squeak. Mice, said George, and as he said it, the mother slid out. Somebody knocked her on the back, and the hole was opened out. Little mice seemed to swarm everywhere. It was like killing insects. We counted nine little ones lying dead. Poor brute, said George, looking at the mother. What a job she must have had rearing that lot. He picked her up handling her curiously and with pity. Then he said, Well, I may as well finish this tonight. His father took another scythe from off the hedge, and together they soon laid the proud, quivering heads low. Leslie and I tied up as they mowed, and soon all was finished. The beautiful day was flushing to die. Over the west the mist was gathering bluer. The intense stillness was broken by the rhythmic hum of the engines at the distant coal mine, as they drew up the last bantles of men. As we walked across the fields, the tubes of stubble tinkled like dulcimers. The scent of the corn began to rise gently. The last cry of the pheasants came from the wood, and the little clouds of birds were gone. I carried a scythe, and we walked, pleasantly weary, down the hill towards the farm. The children had gone home with the rabbits. When we reached the mill, we found the girls just rising from the table. Emily began to carry away the used pots and to set clean ones for us. She merely glanced at us and said her formal greeting. Letty picked up a book that lay in the ingle seat and went to the window. George dropped into a chair. He had flung off his coat and had pushed back his hair. He rested his great brown arms on the table and was silent for a moment. Funny like that, he said to me, before passing his hands over his eyes, makes you more tired than a whole day's work. Don't think I shall do it again. The sport's exciting while it lasts, said Leslie. It does you more harm than the rabbits do us good, said Mrs. Saxon. Oh, I don't know, mother, drawled her son. It's a couple of shillings. And a couple of days off your life. What be that, he replied, taking a piece of bread and butter and biting a large piece from it. Pour us a drop of tea, he said to Emily. I don't know that I shall wait on such brutes, she replied, relenting and flourishing the teapot. Oh, said he, taking another piece of bread and butter, I'm not all alone in my savageness this time. Men are all brutes, said Letty hotly, without looking up from her book. You can tame us, said Leslie, in mighty good humour. She did not reply. George began in that deliberate voice that so annoyed Emily. It does make you mad, though, to touch the fur and not be able to grab him. He laughed quietly. Emily moved off in disgust. Letty opened her mouth sharply to speak, but remained silent. I don't know, said Leslie. When it comes to killing, it goes against the stomach. If you can run, said George, you should be able to run to death. When your blood's up, you don't hang halfway. 
I think a man is horrible, said Letty, who can tear the head off a little mite of a thing like a rabbit after running it in torture over a field. When he's nothing but a barbarian to begin with, said Emily. If you began to run yourself, you'd be the same, said George. Why, women are cruel enough, said Leslie with a glance at Letty. Yes, he continued, they're cruel enough in their way. Another look and a comical little smile. Well, said George, what's the good finicking? If you feel like doing a thing, you'd better do it. Unless you haven't courage, said Emily, bitingly. He looked up at her with dark eyes, suddenly full of anger. But, said Letty, she could not hold herself from asking, don't you think it's brutal now that you do think? Isn't it degrading and mean to run the poor little things down? Perhaps it is, he replied, but it wasn't an hour ago. You have no feeling, she said bitterly. He laughed deprecatingly, but said nothing. He finished tea in silence, Letty reading, Emily moving about the house. George got up and went out at the end. A moment or two after, we heard him across the yard with the milk buckets, singing The Ash Grove. He doesn't care a scrap for anything, said Emily, with accumulated bitterness. Letty looked out of the window across the yard, thinking. She looked very glum. After a while we went out also, before the light faded altogether from the pond. Emily took us into the lower garden to get some ripe plums. The old garden was very low. The soil was black. The combine and goose grass were clutching at the ancient gooseberry bushes which sprawled by the paths. The garden was not very productive, save of weeds, and perhaps tremendous lank artichokes or swollen marrows. At the bottom, where the end of the farm buildings rose high and grey, there was a plum tree which had been crucified to the wall, and which had broken away and leaned forward from bondage. Now, under the boughs, were hidden great mist-bloomed crimson treasures, splendid globes. I shook the old ragged trunk, green, with even the fresh gum dulled over, and the treasures fell heavily, thudding down among the immense rhubarb leaves below. The girls laughed, and we divided the spoil and turned back to the yard. We went down to the edge of the garden which skirted the bottom pond, a pool chained in a heavy growth of weeds. It was moving with rats, the father had said. The rushes were thick below us. Opposite, the great bank fronted us, with orchard trees climbing it like a hillside. The lower pond received the overflow from the upper by our tunnel from the deep back sluice. Two rats ran into the black culvert at our approach. We sat on some piled mossy stones to watch. The rats came out again, ran a little way, stopped, ran again, listened, were reassured, and slid about freely, dragging their long, naked tails. Soon, six or seven grey beasts were playing round the mouth of the culvert in the gloom. They sat and wiped their sharp faces, stroking their whiskers. Then one would give a little rush and a little squirm of excitement and would jump vertically into the air, alighting on four feet, running, sliding into the black shadow. One dropped with an ugly plop into the water and swam toward us, the hoary imp, his sharp snout and his wicked little eyes moving at us. Letty shuddered. I threw a stone into the dead pool and frightened them all. But we had frightened ourselves more, so we hurried away and stamped our feet in relief on the three pavement of the yard. Leslie was looking for us. He had been inspecting the yard and the stock under Mr Saxton's supervision. Were you running away from me? he asked. No, she replied. I have been to fetch you a plum. Look. And she showed him two in a leaf. They are too pretty to eat, said he. You have not tasted yet, she laughed. Come, he said, offering her his arm. Let us go up to the water. He took his arm. It was a splendid evening, with the light all thick and yellow lying on the smooth pond. Letty made him lift her onto a leaning bough of willow. He sat with his head resting against her skirts. Emily and I moved on. We heard him murmur something, and her voice replied gently, caressingly. No, let us be still. It is all so still. I love it best of all now. Emily and I talked, sitting at the base of the alders a little way on. After an excitement, and in the evening, especially in autumn, 
One is inclined to be sad and sentimental. We have forgotten that the darkness was weaving. I heard in the little distance Leslie's voice begin to murmur like a flying beetle that comes not too near. Then, away down in the yard, George began singing the old song, I sowed the seeds of love. This interrupted the flight of Leslie's voice, and as the singing came nearer, the hum of low words ceased. We went forward to meet George. Leslie sat up, clasping his knees, and did not speak. George came near, saying, The moon is going to rise. Let me get down, said Letty, lifting her hands to him to help her. He, mistaking her wish, put his hands under her arms and set her gently down as one would a child. Leslie got up quickly and seemed to hold himself separate, resenting the intrusion. I thought you were all four together, said George quietly. Letty turned quickly at the apology. So we were. So we are. Five now. Is it there the moon will rise? Yes, I'd like to see it come over the wood. It lifts slowly up to stare at you. I always think it wants to know something, and I always think I have something to answer, only I don't know what it is, said Emily. Where the sky was pale in the east over the room of wood came the forehead of the full yellow moon. We stood and watched in silence. Then, as the great disc, nearly full, lifted and looked straight upon us, we were washed off our feet in a vague sea of moonlight. We stood with the light like water on our faces. Letty was glad, a little bit exalted. Emily was passionately troubled. Her lips were parted, almost beseeching. Leslie was frowning, oblivious. And George was thinking, and the terrible immense moonbeams braided through his feeling. At length, Leslie said softly, mistakenly, Come along, dear. And he took her arm. She let him lead her along the bank of the pond and across the plank over the sluice. Do you know, she said, as we were carefully descending the steep bank of the orchard, I feel as if I wanted to laugh or dance something rather outrageous. Surely not like that now, Leslie replied in a low voice, feeling really hurt. I do, though. I'll race you to the bottom. No, no, dear. He held her back. When he came to the wicket leading on to the front lawns, he said something to her softly as he held the gate. I think he wanted to utter his half-finished proposal, and so bind her. She broke free, and observing the long lawn which lay in grey shadow between the eastern and western glows, she cried, Polka! A polka! One could dance a polka where the grass is smooth and short, even if there are some fallen leaves. Yes, yes, how jolly! She held out her hand to Leslie, but it was too great a shock to his mood. So she called to me, and there was a shade of anxiety in her voice, lest after all she should be caught in the toils of the night's sentiment. Pat, you'll dance with me. Leslie hates a polka. I dance with her. I do not know the time when I could not polka. It seems innate in one's feet to dance that dance. We went flying round, hissing through the dead leaves. The night, the low-hung yellow moon, the pallor of the west, the blue cloud of evening overhead, went round and through the fantastic branches of the old laburnum, spinning a little madness. You cannot tire, Letty. Her feet are wings that beat the air. When at last I stayed her, she laughed as fresh as ever, as she bound her hair. There, she said to Leslie, in tones of extreme satisfaction. That was lovely. Do you come and dance now? Not a polka, said he sadly feeling the poetry in his heart insulted by the jigging measure. But one cannot dance anything else on wet grass and through shuffling dead leaves. You, George? Emily says I jump, he replied. Come on, come on. And in a moment they were bounding across the grass. After a few steps she fell in with him and they spun round the grass. It was true, he leaped, sprang with large strides, carrying her with him. It was a tremendous, irresistible dancing. Emily and I must join, making an inner ring. Now and again there was a sense of something white flying near, a wild rustle of draperies and a swish of disturbed leaves as they whirled past us. Long after we were tired, they danced on. At the end he looked big, erect, nerved with triumph, and she was exhilarated like a bacchante. 
Have you finished? Leslie asked. She knew she was safe from his question that day. Yes, she panted. You should have danced. Give me my hat, please. Do I look very disgraceful? He took her hat and gave it to her. Disgraceful, he repeated. Oh, you are solemn tonight. What is it? Yes, what is it? He repeated ironically. Must be the moon. Now is my hat straight? Tell me now, you're not looking. Then put it level. Now then. Why, your hands are quite cold and mine so hot. I feel so impish. And she laughed. There, now I'm ready. Do you notice those little chrysanthemums trying to smell sadly? When the old moon is laughing and winking through those boughs? What business have they with their sadness? She took a handful of petals and flung them into the air. There, if they sigh, they ask for sorrow. I like things to wink and look wild. End of Part 1, Chapter 5「and the cultivated land was bounded on the east by the sharp dip of the brook course, a thread of woodland broadening into a spinney and ending at the upper pond. Beyond this, on the east, rose the sharp, wild, grassy hillside, scattered with old trees, ruinous with the gaunt, ragged bones of old hedgerows grown into thorn trees. Along the rim of the hills, beginning in the northwest, were dark woodlands, which swept round east and south till they raced down in riot to the very edge of southern Nethermere, surrounding our house. From the eastern hill crest, looking straight across, you could see the spar of Selsby Church, and a few roofs, and the headstocks of the pit. So, on three sides the farm was skirted by woods, the dens of rabbits, and the common held another warren. Now the squire of the estate, head of an ancient, even once famous, but now decayed house, loved his rabbits. Unlike the family fortunes, the family tree flourished amazingly. Sherwood could show nothing comparable. Its ramifications were stupendous. It was more like a banyan than a British oak. How was the good squire to nourish himself and his lady, his name, his tradition, and his thirteen lusty branches on his meagre estates? An evil fortune discovered to him that he could sell each of his rabbits, those bits of furry vermin, for a shilling or thereabouts in Nottingham, since which time the noble family subsisted by rabbits. Farms were gnawed away, corn and sweet grass departed from the face of the hills, cattle grew lean, unable to eat the defiled herbage. Then the farm became the home of a keeper, and the country was silent, with no sound of cattle, no clink of horses, no barking of lusty dogs. But the squire loved his rabbits, he defended them against the snares of the despairing farmer, protected them with gun and notices to quit. How he glowed with thankfulness as he saw the dishevelled hillside heave when the gnawing hosts moved on. "'Are they not quails and manor? said he to his sporting guest early one Monday morning, as the high meadow broke into life at the sound of his gun. "'Quails and manor in the wilderness?' "'They are, by Jove,' assented the sporting guest as he took another gun while the Saturnine keeper smiled grimly. Meanwhile, Australia Mill began to suffer under this gangrene. It was the outpost in the wilderness. It was an understood thing that none of the squire's tenants had a gun. Well, said the squire to Mr. Saxon, you have the land for next to nothing, next to nothing, at a rent really absurd. Surely the little that the rabbits eat. It's not a little. Come and look for yourself, replied the farmer. The squire made a gesture of impatience. "'What do you want?' he inquired. "'Will you wire me off?' was the repeated request. "'Wire is, what does Hawkett say? "'So much per yard, and it would come to—' 
What did Hawkins tell me now? But a large sum. No, I can't do it. Well, I can't live like this. Have another glass of whisky. Yes, yes, I want another laugh myself, and I can't drink alone. So if I am to enjoy my glass, that's it. Now, surely you exaggerate a little. It's not so bad. I can't go on like it, I'm sure. Well, we'll see about compensation. We'll see. I'll have a talk with Hawkett, and I'll come down and have a look at you. We'll all find a pinch somewhere. It's nothing but humanity's heritage. I was born in September, and love it best of all the months. There is no heat, no hurry, no thirst and weariness in corn harvest as there is in the hay. If the season is late, as is usual with us, then mid-September sees the corn still standing in stook. The mornings come slowly. The earth is like a woman married and fading. She does not leap up with a laugh for the first fresh kiss of dawn, but slowly, quietly, unexpectantly lies watching the waking of each new day. The blue mist, like memory in the eyes of an neglected wife, never goes from the wooded hill, and only at noon creeps from the nearer hedges. There is no bird to put a song in the throat of morning, only the crow's voice speaks during the day. Perhaps there is the regular breathing hush of the scythe, even the fretful jar of the mowing machine. But next day, in the morning, all is still again. The lying corn is wet, and when you have bound it and lift the heavy sheaf to make the stoop, the tresses of oats wreathe round each other and droop mournfully. As I worked with my friend through the still mornings, we talked endlessly. I would give him the gist of what I knew of chemistry and botany and psychology. Day after day I told him what the professors had told me, of life, of sex and its origins, of Schopenhauer and William James. We had been friends for years, and he was accustomed to my talk. But this autumn fruited the first crop of intimacy between us. I taught a great deal of poetry to him, and of rudimentary metaphysics. He was very good stuff. He had hardly a single dogma, save that of pleasing himself. Religion was nothing to him. So he heard all I had to say with an open mind, and understood the drift of things very rapidly, and quickly made these ideas part of himself. We tramped down to dinner with only the clinging warmth of the sunshine for a coat. In this still, enfolding weather, a quiet companionship is very grateful. Autumn creeps through everything. The little damsons in the pudding taste of September, and are fragrant with memory. The voices of those at table are softer and more reminiscent than at hay time. Afternoon is all warm and golden. Oat sheaves are lighter. They whisper to each other as they freely embrace. A long, stout stubble tinkles as the foot brushes over it. The scent of the straw is sweet. When the poor bleached sheaves are lifted out of the hedge, a spray of nodding wild raspberries is disclosed, with belated berries ready to drop. Among the damp grass, lush blackberries may be discovered. Then one notices that the last bell hangs from the ragged spire of foxglove. The talk is of people, an odd book, of one's hopes and the future, of Canada, where work is strenuous, but not life, where the plains are wide and one is not lapped in a soft valley, like an apple that falls in a secluded orchard. The mist steals over the face of the warm afternoon. The tying up is all finished, and it only remains to rear up the fallen bundles into shocks. The sun sinks into a golden glow in the west. The gold turns to red. The red darkens like a fire burning low. The sun disappears behind the banks of milky mist, purple like the pale bloom on blue plums. And we put on our coats and go home. In the evening, when the milking was finished and all the things fed, then we went out to look at the snares. We wandered on across the stream and up the wild hillside. Our feet rattled through black patches of devil's bit scabious. We skirted a swim of thistledown which glistened when the moon touched it. We stumbled on through wet, coarse grass over soft mole hills and black rabbit holes. The hills and woods cast shadows. The pools of mist in the valleys gathered the moonbeams in cold, shivery light. We came to an old farm that stood on the level brow of the hill. The woods swept away from it, 
leaving a great clearing of what was once cultivated land. The handsome chimneys of the house silhouetted against the light sky drew my admiration. I noticed that there was no light or glow in any window, though the house had only the width of one room, and though the night was only at eight o'clock. We looked at the long, impressive front. Several of the windows had been bricked in, giving a pitiful impression of blindness. The places where the plaster had fallen off the walls showed blacker in the shadow. We pushed open the gate, and as we walked down the path, weeds and dead plants brushed our ankles. We looked in at a window. The room was lighted also by a window from the other side, through which the moonlight streamed onto the flagged floor, dirty, littered with paper and wisps of straw. A hearth lay in the light, with all its distress of grey ashes and piled cinders of burnt paper, and a child's headless doll, charred and pitiful. On the borderline of shadow lay a round fur cap, a gamekeeper's cap. I blamed the moonlight for entering the desolate room. The darkness alone was decent and reticent. I hated the little roses on the illuminated piece of wallpaper. I hated that far side. With farmer's instinct, George turned to the outhouse. The cow yard startled me. It was a forest of the tallest nettles I have ever seen, nettles far taller than my six feet. The air was sodden with the dank scent of nettles. As I followed George along the obscure brick path, I felt my flesh creep. But the buildings when we entered them were in splendid condition. They had been restored within a small number of years. They were well timbered, neat and cosy. Here and there we saw feathers, bits of animal wreckage, even the remnants of a cat, which we hastily examined by the light of a match. As we entered the stable there was an ugly noise, and three great rats half rushed at us and threatened us with their vicious teeth. I shuddered and hurried back, stumbling over a bucket rotten with rust, and so filled with weeds that I thought it part of the jungle. There was a silence, made horrible by the faint noises that rats and flying bats give out. The place was bare of any vestige of corn or straw or hay, only choked with a growth of abnormal weeds. When I found myself free in the orchard, I could not stop shivering. There were no apples to be seen overhead between us and the clear sky. Either the birds had caused them to fall, when the rabbits had devoured them, or someone had gathered the crop. This, said George bitterly, is what the mill will come to. After your time, I said. My time, my time, I shall never have a time. I shouldn't be surprised if father's time isn't short, with rabbits and one thing and another. As it is, we depend on the milk ground and on the carting which I do for the council. You can't call it farming. We're a miserable mixture of farmer, milkman, greengrocer and carting contractor. It's a shabby business. You have to live, I retorted. Yes, but it's rotten. And father won't move, and he won't change his methods. Well, what about you? Me? What should I change for? I'm comfortable at home. As for my future, it can look after itself, so long as nobody depends on me. Laissez-faire, said I, smiling. This is no laissez-faire, he replied, glancing round. This is pulling the nipple out of your lips and letting the milk run away sour. Look there. Through the thin veil of moonlit mist that slid over the hillside, we could see an army of rabbits bunched up or hopping a few paces forward, feeding. We set off at a swinging pace down the hill, scattering the hosts. As we approached the fence that bounded the mill fields, he exclaimed, Hello, and hurried forward. I followed him and observed the dark figure of a man rise from the hedge. It was a gamekeeper. He pretended to be examining his gun. As we came up, he greeted us with a calm, Good evening. George replied by investigating the little gap in the hedge. I'll trouble you for that snare, he said. Will you? answered Annabel, a broad, burly, black-faced fellow. And I should like to know what you're doing on the wrong side of the edge. You can see what we're doing. Hand over my snare and the rabbit, said George angrily. What rabbit? said Annabel, turning sarcastically to me. You know well enough, and you can hand it over or... George replied, Or what? Spit it out. The psalm won't kill me. The man grinned with contempt. 
Hand over here, said George, stepping up to the man in a rage. Now don't, said the keeper, standing stock still, and looking unmovedly at the proximity of George. You'd better get a form, both you and him. You get neither snare nor rabbit. See. We will see, said George, and he made a sudden move to get hold of the man's coat. Instantly he went staggering back with a heavy blow under the left ear. Damn brute, I ejaculated, bruising my knuckles against the fellow's jaw. Then I too found myself sitting dazedly on the grass, watching the great skirts of his velveteens flinging round him as if he had been a demon as he strode away. I got up, pressing my chest where I had been struck. George was lying in the hedge bottom. I turned him over and rubbed his temples and shook the drenched grass on his face. He opened his eyes and looked at me, dazed. Then he drew his breath quickly and put his hand to his head. He, he nearly stunned me, he said. The devil, I answered. I wasn't ready. No. Did he knock me down? Aye, me too. He was silent for some time, sitting limply. Then he pressed his hand against the back of his head, saying, My head does sing. I tried to get up, but failed. Good God, be knocked into this state by a damned keeper. Come on, I said. Let's see if we can't get indoors. No, he said quickly. We needn't tell them. Don't let them know. I sat thinking of the pain in my own chest and wishing that I could remember hearing Annabel's jaw smash and wishing that my knuckles were more bruised than they were. Now that was bad enough. I got up and helped George to rise. He swayed, almost pulling me over. But in a while he could walk evenly. Am I, he said, covered with clay and stuff? Not much, I replied, troubled by the shame and confusion with which he spoke. Get it off, he said, standing still to be cleaned. I did my best. Then we walked about the fields for a time, gloomy, silent and sore. Suddenly, as we went by the pond side, we were startled by great swishing black shadows that swept just above our heads. The swans were flying up for shelter now that a cold wind had begun to fret Nethermere. They swung down onto the glassy mill-pond, shaking the moonlight in flecks across the deep shadows. The night rang with the clacking of their wings on the water. The stillness and calm were broken. The moonlight was furrowed and scattered and broken. The swans, as they sailed into shadow, were dim, haunting spectres. The wind found us shivering. Don't... you won't say anything, he asked as I was leaving him. No. Nothing at all, not to anybody. No. Good night. About the end of September, our countryside was alarmed by the harrying of sheep by strange dogs. One morning, the squire, going the round of his fields, as was his custom, to his grief and horror found two of his sheep torn and dead in the hedge bottom, and the rest huddled in a corner, swaying about in terror, smeared with blood. The squire did not recover his spirits for days. There was a report of two grey, wolfish dogs. The squire's keeper had heard yelping in the fields of Dr. Collins of the Abbey about dawn. Three sheep lay soaked in blood when the labourer went to tend the flocks. Then the farmers took alarm. Lord of the White House farm intended to put his sheep in pen with his dogs in charge. It was Saturday, however, and the lads ran off to the little travelling theatre that had been halted at Westworld. While they sat open-mouthed in the theatre, gloriously nicknamed the Blood Tub, watching heroes die with much writhing and heaving and struggling up to say a word and collapsing without having said it, six of their silly sheep were slaughtered in the field. At every house it was inquired of the dog, Nowhere had one been loose. Mr. Saxton had some thirty sheep on the common. George determined that the easiest thing was for him to sleep out with them. He built a shelter of hurdles interlaced with brushwood, and in the sunny afternoon we collected piles of bracken, browning to the ruddy winter brown now. He slept there for a week, but that week aged his mother like a year. She was out in the cold morning twilight watching, with her apron over her head, for his approach. She did not rest with the thought of him out on the common. Therefore, on Saturday night, he brought down his rugs and took up Jip to watch in his stead. For some time we sat looking at the stars over the dark hills. Now and then a sheep coughed or a rabbit rustled beneath the brambles and Jip whined. 
The mist crept over the gorse bushes, and the webs on the brambles were white. A devil throws his net over the blackberries as soon as September's back is turned, they say. I saw two fellows go by with bags and nets, said George, as he sat looking out of his little shelter. Poachers, said I. Did you speak to them? No, they didn't see me. I was dropping asleep when a rabbit rushed under the blanket all of a shiver, and a whippet dog after it. I gave the whippet a punch in the neck, and he yelped off. The rabbit stopped with me quite a long time. Then it went. How did you feel? I didn't care. I don't care much what happens just now. Father could get along without me, and Mother has the children. I think I shall emigrate. Why didn't you before? Oh, I don't know. A lot of little comforts and interests at home that one would miss. Besides, you feel somebody in your own countryside. You're nothing in a foreign part, I expect. But you're going? What is there to stop here for? The valley is all running wild and unprofitable. You've no freedom for thinking of what the other folks think of you. And everything round you keeps the same, and so you can't change yourself, because everything you look at brings up the same old feeling and stops you from feeling fresh things. And what is there that's worth anything? What's worth having in my life? I thought, said I, your comfort was worth having. He sat still and did not answer. What's shaking you out of your nest? I asked. I don't know. I've not felt the same since that row with Annabel. And Letty said to me, Here, you can't live as you like, in any way or circumstance. You're like a bit out of those coloured marble mosaics in the hall. You have to fit in your own set, fit into your own pattern, because you're put there from the first. But you don't want to be like a fixed bit of a mosaic. You want to fuse into life and melt and mix with the rest of folk to have something burned out of you. He was downright serious. Well, you need not believe her. When did you see her? She came down on Wednesday when I was getting the apples in the morning. She climbed a tree with me, and there was a wind. That's why I was getting all the apples, and it rocked us, me right up top of the top, she sitting halfway down holding the basket. I asked her, didn't you think the free kind of life was the best? And that was how she answered me. You should have contradicted her. It seemed true. I never thought of it being wrong, in fact. Come, that sounds bad. No, I thought she looked down on us, on our way of life. I thought she meant I was like a toad in a hole. You should have shown her different. How could I, when I could see no different? It strikes me you're in love. He laughed at the idea, saying, No, but it is rotten to find that there isn't a single thing you have to be proud of. This is a new tune for you. He pulled the grass moodily. And when do you think of going? Oh, I don't know. I've said nothing to Mother. Not yet. At any rate, not till spring. Not till something has happened, said I. What? he asked. Something decisive. I don't know what can happen, unless the squire turns us out. No, I said. He did not speak. You should make things happen said I. Don't make me feel a worse fool, Cyril, he replied despairingly. Jip whined and jumped, tugging her chain to follow us. The grey blurs among the blackness of the bushes were resting sheep. A chill, dim mist crept along the ground. But for all that, Cyril, he said, to have her laugh at you across the table, to hear her sing as she moved about before you were washed at night when the fire's warm and you're tired, to have her sit by you on the hearth-seat, close and soft. In Spain, I said, in Spain. He took no notice, but turned suddenly laughing. Do you know, when I was stooking up, lifting the sheaves, it felt like having your arm round a girl. It was quite a sudden sensation. You better take care, said I. You'll mesh yourself in the silk of dreams, and then... He laughed, not having heard my words. The time seems to go like lightning. Thinking, he confessed, I seemed to sweep the mornings up in a handful. Up, oh, Lord, said I, why don't you scheme for getting what you want instead of dreaming fulfilments? Well, he replied, if it was a fine dream, wouldn't you want to go on dreaming? And with that he finished, and I went home. I sat at my window looking out, trying to get things straight. 
Mist rose and wreathed round Nethermere like ghosts meeting and embracing sadly. I thought of the time when my friend should not follow the harrow on our own snug valley side, and when Letty's room next mine should be closed to hide its emptiness, not its joy. My heart clung passionately to the hollow which held us all. How could I bear that it should be so desolate? I wondered what Letty would do. In the morning I was up early, when daybreak came with a shiver through the woods. I went out while the moon still shone sickly in the west. The world shrank from the morning. It was then that the last of the summer things died. The wood was dark, and smelt damp and heavy with autumn. On the paths the leaves lay clogged. As I came near the farm I heard the yelling of dogs. Running I reached the common, and saw the sheep huddled and scattered in groups. Something leaped round them. George burst into sight, pursuing. Directly there was the bang, bang of a gun. I picked up a heavy piece of sandstone and ran forwards. Three sheep scattered wildly before me. In the dim light I saw their grey shadows move among the gorse bushes. Then a dog leaped, and I flung my stone with all my might. I hit. There came a high-pitched howling yelp of pain. I saw the brute make off and went after him, dodging the prickly bushes, leaping the trailing brambles. The gunshots rang out again, and I heard the men shouting with excitement. My dog was out of sight, but I followed still, slanting down the hill. In a field ahead I saw someone running. Leaping the low hedge I pursued, and overtook Emily, who was hurrying as fast as she could through the wet grass. There was another gunshot and great shouting. Emily glanced round, saw me, and started. "'It's gone to the quarries!' she panted. We walked on without saying a word. Skirting the spinney, we followed the brook course and came at last to the quarry fence. The old excavations were filled now with trees. The steep walls, twenty feet deep in places, were packed with loose stones and trailed with hanging brambles. We climbed down the steep bank of the brook and entered the quarries by the bed of the stream. Under the groves of ash and oak, a pale primrose still lingered, glimmering wanly beside the hidden water. Emily found a smear of blood on a beautiful trail of yellow convolvulus. We followed the tracks on to the open, where the brook flowed on the hard rock bed, and the stony floor of the quarry was only a tangle of gorse and bramble and honeysuckle. "'Take a good stone,' said I, and we pressed on, where the grove and the great excavation darkened again, and the brook slid secretly under the arms of the bushes and the hair of the long grass. We beat the cover almost to the road. I thought the brute had escaped, and I pulled a bunch of mountain ash berries and stood tapping them against my knee. I was startled by a snarl and a little scream. Running forward, I came upon one of the old horseshoe lime kilns that stood at the head of the quarry. There, in the mouth of one of the kilns, Emily was kneeling on the dog, her hands buried in the hair of its throat, pushing back its head. The little jerks of the brute's body were the spasms of death. Already the eyes were turning inward, and the upper lip was drawn from the teeth by pain. "'Good Lord, Emily, but he's dead!' I exclaimed. "'Has he hurt you?' I drew her away. She shuddered violently and seemed to feel a horror of herself. "'No, no,' she said, looking at herself, with blood all on her skirt, when she had knelt on the wound which I had given the dog, and pressed the broken rib into the chest. There was a trickle of blood on her arm. "'Did he bite you?' I asked, anxious. "'No, oh no, I just peeped in and he jumped. But he had no strength, and I hit him back with my stone, and I lost my balance and fell on him. "'Let me wash your arm.' "'Oh!' she exclaimed. "'Isn't it horrible? Oh, I think it's so awful.' "'What?' said I, busy bathing her arm in the cold water of the brook. This, this whole brutal affair. It ought to be cauterised, said I, looking at a score on her arm from the dog's tooth. That scratch, that's nothing. Can you get that off my skirt? I feel hateful to myself. I washed her skirt with my handkerchief as well as I could, saying, Let me just sear it for you. We can go to the kennels. Do you, I don't feel safe otherwise. Really, she said, glancing up at me, a smile coming into her fine dark eyes. Yes, come along. Ha ha, she laughed. You look so serious. I took her arm and drew her away. She linked her arm in mine and leaned on me. It's just like Lorna Doon, she said, as if she enjoyed it. But you will let me do it, said I, referring to the cauterizing. You make me. 
but I shall feel... Oh, I daren't think of it. Get me some of those berries. I plucked a few bunches of Goulder rose fruits, transparent ruby berries. She stroked them softly against her lips and cheap, caressing them. Then she murmured to herself, I've always wanted to put red berries in my hair. The shawl she had been wearing was thrown across her shoulders and her head was bare, and her black hair, soft and short and ecstatic, tumbled wildly into loose, light curls. She thrust the stalks of the berries under her combs. Her hair was not heavy or long enough to have held them. Then, with the ruby bunches glowing through the black mist of curls, she looked up at me, brightly, with wide eyes. I looked at her and felt the smile winning into her eyes. Then I turned and dragged a trail of golden-leaved convolvulus from the hedge, and I twisted it into a coronet for her. There, said I, you're crowned. She put back her head, and the low laughter shook in her throat. What? she asked, putting all the courage and recklessness she had into the question, and in her soul, trembling. Not Chloe, not Bacanti. You've always got your soul in your eyes, such an earnest, troublesome soul. The laughter faded at once, and her great seriousness looked out again at me, pleading. You are like Burne Jones's damsels. Troublesome shadows are always crowding across your eyes, and you cherish them. You think the flesh of the apple is nothing, nothing. You only care for the eternal pips. Why don't you snatch your apple and eat it, and throw the core away? She looked at me sadly, not understanding, but believing that I, in my wisdom, spoke truth, as she always believed when I lost her in a maze of words. She stooped down, and the chaplet fell from her hair, and only one bunch of berries remained. The ground around us was strewn with the four-lipped burrs of beech-nuts, and the quaint little nut pyramids were scattered among the ruddy fallen leaves. Emily gathered a few nuts. "'I love beech-nuts,' she said, "'but they make me long for my childhood again till I could almost cry out. "'To go out for beech-nuts before breakfast, to thread them for necklaces before supper, "'to be the envy of the others at school next day. "'There was as much pleasure in a beech-necklace then as there is in the whole autumn now.' and no sadness. There are no more unmixed joys after you have grown up. She kept her face to the ground as she spoke, and she continued to gather the fruits. Do you find any with nuts in? I asked. Not many. Here, here are two, three. You have them. No, I don't care about them. I stripped one of its horny brown coat and gave it to her. She opened her mouth slightly to take it, looking up into my eyes. Some people, instead of bringing with them clouds of glory, trail clouds of sorrow. They are born with the gift of sorrow. Sorrows, they proclaim, alone are real. The veiled grey angels of sorrow work out slowly the beautiful shapes. Sorrow is beauty and the supreme blessedness. You read it in their eyes and in the tones of their voices. Emily had the gift of sorrow. It fascinated me, but it drove me to rebellion. We followed the soft, smooth-bitten turf road under the old beeches. The hillside fell away, dishevelled with thistles and coarse grass. Soon we were in sight of the kennels, the red old kennels which had been the scene of so much animation in the time of Lord Byron. They were empty now, overgrown with weeds. The barred windows of the cottages were grey with dust. There was no need now to protect the windows from cattle, dog or man. One of the three houses was inhabited, Clear water trickled through a wooden runnel into a great stone trough outside, near the door. "'Come here,' said I to Emily. "'Let me fasten the back of your dress.' "'Is it undone?' she asked, looking quickly over her shoulder and blushing. As I was engaged in my task, a girl came out of the cottage with a black kettle and a teacup. She was so surprised to see me thus occupied that she forgot her own duty and stood open-mouthed. "'Saran! Saran!' called a voice from inside. Aren't they going to come in and shut that door? Sarah Ann hastily poured a few cups of water into the kettle. Then she put down both utensils and stood holding her bare arms to warm them. Her chief garment consisted of a skirt with grey bodice and red flannel skirt, very much torn. Her black hair hung in wild tails onto her shoulders. We must go in here, said I, approaching the girl. She, however, hastily seized the kettle and ran indoors with an, Oh, mother! 
A woman came to the door. One breast was bare and hung over her blouse, which, like a dressing jacket, fell loose over her skirt. Her fading red-brown hair was all frowsy from the bed. In the folds of her skirt clung a swarthy urchin with a shockingly short shirt. He stared at us with big black eyes, the only portion of his face undecorated with egg and jam. The woman's blue eyes questioned us languidly. I told her our errand. Come in, come in, she said. But don't look at the house. The children's not been long up. Go in, Billy, we're now on. We entered, taking the forgotten kettle lid. The kitchen was large but scantily furnished, save indeed for children. The eldest, a girl of twelve or so, was standing toasting a piece of bacon with one hand and holding back her nightdress in the other. As the toast hand got scorched, she transferred the bacon to the other, gave the hot fingers a lick to cool them, and then held back her nightdress again. Her auburn hair hung in heavy coils down her gown. A boy sat on the steel fender, catching the dropping fat on a piece of bread. One, two, three, four, five, six drops, and he quickly bit off the tasty corner and resumed the task with the other hand. When we entered, he tried to draw his shirt over his knees, which caused the fat to fall, wasted. A fat baby, evidently laid down from the breast, lay kicking on the squab, purple in the face, while another lad was pushing bread and butter into its mouth. The mother swept to the sofa, poked up the bread and butter, pushed her finger into the baby's throat, lifted the child up, punched it back, and was highly relieved when it began to yell. Then she administered a few sound spanks to the native buttocks of the crammer. He began to howl, but stopped suddenly on seeing us laughing. On the sackcloth which served as hearthrug sat a beautiful child washing the face of a wooden doll with tea and wiping it on her nightgown. At the table, an infant in a high chair sat sucking a piece of bacon, till the grease ran down his swarthy arms, oozing through his fingers. An old lad stood in the big armchair, whose back was hung with a calfskin, and was industriously pouring the dregs of the teacups into a basin of milk. The mother whisked away the milk and made a rush for the urchin, the baby hanging over her arm the while. "'I could half kill thee,' she said, but he had slid under the table, and sat serenely unconcerned. "'Could you?' I asked, when the mother had put her bonny baby again to her breast. "'Could you lend me a knitting-needle?' "'Ah, oh, Sir Anne, where's thy knitting-needles?' asked the woman, wincing at the same time and putting her hand to the mouth of the sucking child. Catching my eye, she said, "'You wouldn't have credit how he bites. He's no but two teeth, but they like six needles.' She drew her brows together and pursed her lips, saying to the child, "'Naughty lad, naughty lad! I should I have it? No, not if to bites thy mother like that.' The family interest was now divided between us, and the private concerns in process when we entered, save, however, that the bacon-sucker had sucked on solidly, immovable, all the time. "'Oh, Sam, where's my knitting? Thou's had it?' cried Sir Anne, after a little search. "Aina," replied Sam from under the table. "'Yes, there is,' said the mother, giving a blind prod under the table with her foot. "'Aina, then,' persisted Sam. The mother suggested various possible places of discovery, and at last the knitting was found at the back of the table drawer, among forks and old wooden skewers. "'I am to tell you where everything is,' said the mother, in mild reproach. Sir Anne, however, gave no heed to her parent. Her heart was torn for her knitting, the fruit of her labours. It was a red woollen cuff for the winter. A corkscrew was bored through the web, and the ball of red wool was bristling with skewers. "'It's of thee, our son,' she wailed. "'I know it's of thee and thy ABC.' Samuel, under the table, croaked out in a voice of fierce monotony. Beers for porcupine whose bristles so strong kill the broad lion by pricking his tongue. The mother began to shake with quiet laughter. His father learnt him that, made it all up, she whispered proudly to us and to him. Tell us what bee is, son. Shama, grunted Sam. Go on, there's a ducky, and I'll make thee a treacle pudding. Today, asked Sir Anne eagerly. Go on, Sam, me duck, persisted the mother. "'That's not got no treacle,' said Sam, conclusively. The needle was in the fire. The children stood about, watching. "'Will you do it yourself?' I asked Emily. "'I?' she exclaimed, with wide eyes of astonishment, and she shook her head emphatically. 
Then I must. I took out the needle, holding it in my handkerchief. I took her hand and examined the wound. When she saw the hot glow of the needle, she snatched away her hand and looked into my eyes, laughing in a half-hysterical fear and shame. I was very serious, very insistent. She yielded me her hand again, biting her lips in imagination of the pain and looking at me. While my eyes were looking into hers, she had courage. When I was forced to pay attention to my cauterizing, she glanced down, and with a sharp, ah, ending in a little laugh, she put her hands behind her and looked again up at me with wide brown eyes, all quivering with apprehension and a little shame, and a laughter that held much pleading. One of the children began to cry. It is no good, said I, throwing the fast cooling needle onto the hearth. I gave the girls all the pennies I had. Then I offered Sam, who crept out of the shelter of the table, a sixpence. You ought to have that, he said, turning from the small coin. <laughs> I have no more pennies, so nothing will be your share. I gave the other boy a rickety knife I had in my pocket. Sam looked fiercely at me. Eager for revenge, he picked up the porcupine quill by the hot end. He dropped it with a shout of rage, and, seizing a cup off the table, flung it at the fortunate Jack. It smashed against the fireplace. The mother grabbed at Sam, but he was gone. A girl, a little girl, wailed. Oh, that's my rosy mug! My rosy mug! He fled from the scene of confusion. Emily had hardly noticed it. Her thoughts were of herself, and of me. I am an awful coward, said she humbly. But I, I can't help it. She looked beseechingly. Never mind, said I. All my flesh seems to jump from it. You don't know how I feel. Well, never mind. I couldn't help it, not for my life. I wonder, said I, if anything could possibly disturb that young bacon sucker. He didn't even look round at the smash. No, said she, biting the tip of her finger moodily. Another conversation was interrupted by howls from the rear. Looking round, we saw Sam careering after us over the close-bitten turf, howling, scorn and derision at us. Rabbit tail! Rabbit tail! he cried, his bare little legs twinkling and his little shirt fluttering in the cold morning air. Fortunately, at last he trod on a thistle or a thorn, for when we looked round again to see why he was silent, he was capering on one leg, holding his wounded foot in his hands. End of Part 1 Chapter 6《Part One, Chapter Seven of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. — Part One, Chapter Seven. — Letty Pulls Down the Small Gold Grapes During the falling of the leaves, Letty was very wilful. She uttered many banalities concerning men and love and marriage. She taunted Leslie and thwarted his wishes. At last, he stayed away from her. She had been several times down to the mill, but because she fancied they were very familiar, receiving her on their rough plane like one of themselves, she stayed away. Since the death of our father she had been restless. Since inheriting her little fortune she had become proud, scornful, difficult to please. Difficult to please in every circumstance. She, who had always been so rippling in thoughtless life, sat down in the window sill to think, and her strong teeth bit at her handkerchief till it was torn in holes. She would say nothing to me. She read all things that dealt with modern women. One afternoon, Nettie walked over to Eberwich. Leslie had not been to see us for a fortnight. It was a grey, dree afternoon. The wind drifted a clammy fog across the hills, and the roads were black and deep with mud. The trees in the wood slouched sulkily. It was a day to be shut out and ignored, if possible. I heaped up the fire and went to draw the curtains and make perfect the room. Then I saw Letty coming along the path quickly, very erect. When she came in, her colour was high. "'Tea not laid?' she said briefly. "'Rebecca has just brought in the lamp,' said I. Letty took off her coat and furs and flung them on the couch. 
She went to the mirror, lifted her hair, all curled by the fog, and stared haughtily at herself. Then she swung round, looked at the bare table, and rang the bell. It was so rare a thing for us to ring the bell from the dining room that Rebecca went first to the outer door. Then she came in the room, saying, Did you ring? I thought tea would have been ready, said Nettie coldly. Rebecca looked at me and at her and replied, It has put half past four. I can bring it in. Mother came down hearing the clink of the teacups. Well, she said to Letty, who was unlacing her boots, and did you find it a pleasant walk? Except for the mud, was the reply. Ah, I guess you wished you'd stayed at home. What a state for your boots, and your skirts too, I know. Here, let me take them into the kitchen. Let Rebecca take them, said Letty, but Mother was out of the room. When Mother had poured out the tea, we sat silently at table. It was on the tip of our tongues to ask Letty what ailed her, but we were experienced and we refrained. After a while she said, Do you know, I met Leslie Tempest. Oh, said Mother tentatively, did he come along with you? He did not look at me. Oh, exclaimed Mother, and it was speaking volumes. Then after a moment she resumed, Perhaps he did not see you. Or was it a stony Britisher? I asked. He saw me, declared Letty, or he wouldn't have made such a babyish show of being delighted with Margaret Raymond. It may have been no show. He still may not have seen you. I felt at once that he had. I could see his animation was extravagant. He need not have troubled himself. I was not going to run after him. You seem very cross, said I. Indeed I am not. But he knew I had to walk all this way home, and he could take up Margaret, who was only half the distance. Was he driving? In the dog cart. Cut her toast into strips viciously. We waited patiently. It was mean of him, wasn't it, Mother? Well, my girl, you have treated him badly. What a baby! What a mean, manly baby! Men are great infants. And girls, said Mother, do not know what they want. A grown-up quality, I added. Nevertheless, said Letty, he is a mean fop, and I detest him. He rose and sorted out some stitchery. Letty never stitched unless she were in a bad humour. Mother smiled at me, sighed, and proceeded to Mr Gladstone for comfort. Her breviary and missile were Morley's Life of Gladstone. I had to take a letter to High Close to Mrs Tempest, from my mother, concerning a bazaar in process at the church. I will bring Leslie back with me, said I to myself. The night was black and hateful. The lamps by the road from Eberwich ended at Nethermere. Their yellow blur on the water made the cold, wet inferno of the night more ugly. Leslie and Marie were both in the library. Half a library, half a business office, used also as a lounge room, being cosy. Leslie lay in a great armchair by the fire, immune among clouds of blue smoke. Marie was perched on the steps, a great volume on her knee. Leslie got up in his cloud, shook hands, greeted me curtly, and vanished again. Marie smiled me a quaint, vexed smile, saying, Oh, Cyril, I'm so glad you've come. I'm so worried. And Leslie says he's not a pastry cook, though I'm sure I don't want him to be one, only he need not be a bear. What's the matter? She frowned, gave the big volume a little smack, and said, why, I do so much want to make some of those Spanish tartlets of your mother's that are so delicious. And of course Mabel knows nothing of them, and they're not in my cookery book, and I've looked through page upon page of the encyclopedia, right through Spain, and there's nothing yet, and there are fifty pages more, and Leslie won't help me, though I've got a headache, because he's frabs about something. She looked at me in comical despair. Do you want them for the bazaar? Yes, for tomorrow. Cook has done the rest, but I had fairly set my heart on these. Don't you think they are lovely? Exquisitely lovely. Suppose I go and ask Mother. If you would. But no, oh no, you can't make all that journey this terrible night. We are simply besieged by mud. The men are both out. William has gone to meet Father, and Mother has sent George to carry some things to the vicarage. 
I can't ask one of the girls on a night like this. I shall have to let it go, and the cranberry tarts too. It cannot be helped. I am so miserable. Ask Leslie, said I. He's too cross, she replied, looking at him. He did not deign a remark. Will you, Leslie? What? Go across to Woodside for me. What for? A recipe. Do, there's a dear boy. Where are the men? They're both engaged. They're out. Send a girl, then. At night, like this, who would go? Sissy. I shall not ask her. Isn't he mean, Cyril? Men are mean. I will come back, said I. There's nothing at home to do. Mother is reading and Letty is stitching. The weather disagrees with her, as it does with Leslie. But it is not fair, she said, looking at me softly. Then she put away the great book and climbed down. Won't you go, Leslie? she said, laying her hand on his shoulder. Women, he said, rising as if reluctantly. There's no end to their wants and their caprices. I thought he would go, said she warmly. She ran to fetch his overcoat. He put one arm slowly in the sleeve, and then the other, but he would not lift the coat onto his shoulders. Well, she said, struggling on tiptoe, you are a great creature. Can't you get it on, naughty child? Give her a chair to stand on, he said. She shook the collar of the coat sharply, but he stood like a sheep, impassive. Leslie, you, you are too bad. I can't get it on, you stupid boy. I took the coat and jerked it on. There, she said, giving him his cap. Now don't be long. What a damn dirty night, said he, when we were out. It is, said I. The town anywhere is better than this hell of a country. <laughs> How did you enjoy yourself? He began a long history of three days in the metropolis. I listened and heard little. I heard more plainly the cry of some night birds over Nethermere and the peevish, wailing, yarling cry of some beast in the wood. I was thankful to slam the door behind me, to stand in the light of the hall. Leslie, exclaimed Mother, I am glad to see you. Thank you, he said, turning to Letty, who sat with her lap full of work, her head busily bent. You see, I can't get up, she said, giving him her hand, adorned as it was by the thimble. How nice of you to come. We did not know you were back. But, he exclaimed, then he stopped. I suppose you enjoyed yourself, she went on calmly. Immensely, thanks. Snap, 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 went her needle through the new stuff. Then, without looking up, she said, Yes, no doubt, you have the air of a man who's been enjoying himself. How do you mean? A kind of guilty, or shall I say embarrassed, look. Don't you notice it, mother? I do, said my mother. I suppose it means we may not ask him questions, Letty concluded, always very busily sewing. He laughed. She had broken her cotton and was trying to thread the needle again. What have you been doing this miserable weather? he inquired awkwardly. Oh, we have sat at home desolate. Ever of thee I am fondly dreaming, and so on. Haven't we, mother? Well, said mother, I don't know. We imagine him all sorts of lions up there. What a shame we may not ask him to roar his old roars over for us, said Letty. What are they like? he asked. How should I know? Like a sucking dove, to judge from your present voice. A monstrous little voice. He laughed uncomfortably. She went on saying, suddenly beginning to sing to herself. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been up to London to see the fine queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under the stair. I suppose she added, that may be so. Poor mouse, but I guess she's none the worse. You did not see the Queen, though. She was not in London, he replied sarcastically. You don't, she said, taking two pins from between her teeth. I suppose you don't mean by that she was in Eberwich, your Queen. I don't know where she was. He answered angrily. Oh, she said very sweetly. I thought perhaps you had met her in Eberwich. When did you come back? Last night, he replied. Oh, why didn't you come and see us before? I've been at the offices all day. I've been up to Eberwich, 
she said innocently. Have you? Yes, and I feel so cross because of it. I thought I might see you. I felt as if you were at home. She stitched a little and glanced up secretly to watch his face redden. Then she continued innocently. Yes, I felt you had come back. It is funny how one has a feeling occasionally that someone is near, when it is someone that one has a sympathy with. He continued to stitch. Then she took a pin from her bosom and fixed her work, all without the least suspicion of guile. I thought I might meet you when I was out. Another pause, another fixing, a pin to be taken from her lips. But I didn't. I was at the office till rather late, he said quickly. She stitched away calmly, provokingly. She took the pin from her mouth again, fixed down a fold of stuff and said softly, You little liar. Mother had gone out of the room for her recipe book. He sat on his chair, dumb with mortification. She stitched swiftly and unerringly. There was silence for some moments. Then he spoke. I did not know you wanted me for the pleasure of plucking this crow, he said. I wanted you, she exclaimed, looking up for the first time. Who said I wanted you? No one. If you didn't want me, I may as well go. The sound of stitching alone broke the silence for some moments. Then she said deliberately, What made you think I wanted you? I don't care a damn whether you wanted me or whether you didn't. It seems to upset you. And don't use bad language. This is the privilege of those near and dear to one. That's why you begin it, I suppose. I cannot remember, she said loftily. He laughed sarcastically. Well, he was so beastly cut up about it. He put this tentatively, expecting a soft answer. But she refused to speak and went on stitching. He fidgeted about, twisting his cap uncomfortably, and sighed. At last he said, Well, you, have we done then? She had the vast superiority in that she was engaged in ostentatious work. She could fix the cloth, regard it quizzically, rearrange it, settle down and begin to sew before she replied. This humbled him. At last she said, I thought so this afternoon. But good God, Letty, can't you drop it? And then? The question started him. Why, forget it, he replied. Well? She spoke softly, gently. He answered to the call like an eager hound. He crossed quickly to her side as she sat sewing, and said in a low voice, You do care something for me, don't you, Letty? Well? It was modulated kindly, a sort of a promise of assent. You have treated me rottenly, you know, haven't you? You know, I, well, I care a good bit. It's a queer way of showing it. Her voice was now a gentle reproof, the sweetest of surrenders and forgiveness. He leaned forward, took her face in his hands, and kissed her, murmuring, You are a little tease. She laid her sewing in her lap and looked up. The next day, Sunday, broke wet and dreary. Breakfast was late, and about ten o'clock we stood at the window looking upon the impossibility of our going to church. There was a driving drizzle of rain, like a dirty curtain before the landscape. The nasturtium leaves by the garden walk had gone rotten in a frost, and the gay green discs had given place to the first black flags of winter, hung on flaccid stalks, pinched at the neck. The grass plot was strewn with fallen leaves, wet and brilliant. Scarlet splashes of Virginia creeper, golden drift from the limes, ruddy brown shawls under the beeches, and away, back in the corner, the black mat of maple leaves, heavily soddened. They ought to have been a vivid lemon colour. Occasionally, one of these great black leaves would loose its hold and zigzag down, staggering in the dance of death. There now, said Letty suddenly. I looked up in time to see a crow close his wings and clutch the topmost bough of an old grey holly tree on the edge of the clearing. He flapped again, recovered his balance, and folded himself up in black resignation to the detestable weather. Why is the old wretch settled just over our noses? 
said Nettie petulantly, just to blot the promise of a sorrow. Yours or mine? I asked. He's looking at me, I declare. You can see the wicked pupil of his eye at this distance, I insinuated. Well, she replied, determined to take this omen upon herself. I saw him first. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a letter, four for a boy, five for silver, six for gold, and seven for a secret never told. You may bet he's only a messenger in advance. There'll be three more shortly, and you'll have your four, said I, comforting. You know, she said, it is very funny, but whenever I particularly notice one crow, I've had some sorrow or other. And when you've noticed four, I asked. You should have had old Mrs. Wagstaff, was her reply. She declares an old crow croaked in the apple tree every day for a week before Jerry got drowned. Great sorrow for her, I remarked. Oh, but she wept abundantly. I felt like weeping too, but somehow I laughed. She hoped he'd gone to heaven, but... I'm sick of that word, but... It is always twangling one's thoughts. But Jerry, I insisted. Oh, she lifted up her forehead and the tears dripped off her nose. He must have been an old nuisance, Sib. I can't understand why women marry such men. I feel downright glad to think of the drunken old wretch toppling into the canal out of the way. She pulled the thick curtain across the window and nestled down in it, resting her cheek against the edge, protecting herself from the cold window pane. The wet grey wind shook the half-naked trees, whose leaves dripped and shone sullenly. Even the trunks were blackened, trickling with the rain which drove persistently. Well down the sky, like black maple leaves, caught up aloft, came two more crows. They swept down and clung hold of the trees in front of the house, staying near the old forerunner. Then he watched them, half amused, half melancholy. One bird was carried past. He swerved round and began to battle up the wind, rising higher and rowing laboriously against the driving wet current. Here comes your fourth, said I. He did not answer but continued to watch. The bird wrestled heroically, but the wind pushed him aside, tilted him, caught under his broad wings, and bore him down. He swept in level flight down the stream, outspread and still, as if fixed in despair. I grieve for him. Sadly, two of his fellows rose and were carried away after him, like souls hunting for a body to inhabit and despairing. Only the first ghost was left on the withered, silver-grey skeleton of the holly. He won't even say never more, I remarked. He has more sense, replied Letty. She looked a trifle lugubrious. Then she continued, Better say never more than evermore. Why? I asked. Oh, I don't know. Fancy this evermore. She'd been sure in her own soul that Leslie would come. Now she began to doubt. Things were very perplexing. The bell in the kitchen jangled. She jumped up. I went and opened the door. He came in. She gave him one bright look of satisfaction. He saw it and understood. Helen has got some people over. I have been awfully rude to leave them now, he said quietly. What a dreadful day, said Mother. Oh, fearful. Your face is red, Letty. What have you been doing? Looking into the fire? What did you see? The pictures wouldn't come plain. Nothing. He laughed. We were silent for some time. You were expecting me, he murmured. Yes, I knew you'd come. They were left alone. He came up to her and put his arm round her as she stood with her elbow on the mantelpiece. You do want me, he pleaded softly. Yes, she murmured. He held her in his arms and kissed her repeatedly, again and again, till she was out of breath, and put up her hand and gently pushed her face away. You are a cold little lover. You are a shy bird, he said, laughing into her eyes. He saw her tears rise, swimming on her lids, but not falling. Why, my love, my darling, why? He put his face to hers and took the tear on his cheek. I know you love me, he said, gently, all tenderness. You know, he murmured, 
I can positively feel the tears rising up from my heart and throat. They're quite painful gathering, my love. There, you can do anything with me. They were silent for some time. After a while, a rather long while, she came upstairs and found Mother, and at the end of some minutes I heard my mother go to him. I sat by my window and watched the low clouds reel and stagger past. It seemed as if everything were being swept along. I myself seemed to have lost my substance to have become detached from concrete things and the firm, trodden pavement of everyday life. Onward, always onward, not knowing where nor why, the wind, the clouds, the rain and the birds and the leaves, everything whirling along. Why? All this time the old crow sat motionless, though the clouds tumbled and were rent and piled, though the trees bent and the window panes shivered with running water. Then I found it had ceased to rain, that there was a sickly yellow gleam of sunlight brightening on some great elm leaves near at hand, till they looked like ripe lemons hanging. The crow looked at me. I was certain he looked at me. What do you think of it all? I asked him. He eyed me with contempt. Great featherless half-winged bird as I was, incomprehensible, contemptible, but awful. I believe he hated me. But, said I, if a raven could answer, why won't you? He looked wearily away. Nevertheless, my gaze disquieted him. He turned uneasily. He rose, waved his wings as if for flight, poised, then settled defiantly down again. You are no good, said I. You won't help even with a word. He sat stolidly unconcerned. Then I heard the lapwings in the meadow crying, crying. They seemed to seek the storm, yet to rail at it. They wheeled in the wind, yet never ceased to complain of it. They enjoyed the struggle and lamented it in wild lament, through which came a sound of exultation. All the lapwings cried, cried the same tale. Bitter, bitter the struggle, for nothing, nothing, nothing. And all the time they swung about on their broad wings, revelling. There, said I to the crow, they try it and find it bitter, but they wouldn't like to miss it, to sit still like you, you old corpse. He could not endure this. He rose in defiance, flapped his wings and launched off, uttering one caw of sinister foreboding. He was soon whirled away. I discovered that I was very cold, so I went downstairs. Twisting a curl round his finger, one of those loose curls that always dance free from the captured hair, Leslie said, Look how fond your hair is of me. Look how it twines round my finger. Do you know, your hair, the light in it is like, oh, buttercups in the sun. It is like me. It won't be kept in bounds, she replied. Shame if it were. Like this, it brushes my face, so, and sets me tingling like music. Behave, now be still, and I'll tell you what sort of music you make. Oh, well, tell me. Like the calling of throstles and burlackies in the evening, frightening the pale little wooden enemies, till they run panting and swaying right up to our wall. Like the ringing of bluebells when the bees are at them. Like hyponomenes, out of breath, laughing because he's won. Kissed her with rapturous admiration. Marriage music, sir, she added. What golden apples did I throw? he asked lightly. What? she exclaimed, half mocking. This Atalanta, he replied, looking lovingly upon her. This Atalanta, I believe she just lagged at last, on purpose. You have it? she cried, laughing, submitting to his caresses. It was you! The apples of your firm heels, the apples of your eyes, the apples eve bit that won me, huh? That was it. You are clever, you are rare, and I have won, won the ripe apples of your cheeks and your breasts and your very fists. They can't stop me and, and all your roundness and warmth and softness. I've won you, Letty. She nodded wickedly, saying, All those, those, yes. All. She admits it. Everything. 
Oh, but let me breathe. Did you claim everything? Yes, and you gave it me. Not yet. Everything, though. Every atom. But now you look... Did I look aside? With the inward eye. Suppose now we were two angels. Oh dear, a sloppy angel. Well, don't interrupt now. Suppose I were one like the blessed damosel. With a warm bosom. Don't be foolish now. I, a blessed damosel, and you kicking the brown beech leaves below, thinking, what are you driving at? Would you be thinking thoughts like prayers? What on earth do you ask that for? Oh, I think I'd be cursing, eh? No, saying fragrant prayers that your thin soul might mount up. Hang thin souls, Letty. I'm not one of your solely sort. I can't stand pre-Raphaelites. You, you're not a Burne Joneses, and you're an Albert Moore. I think there's more in the warm touch of a soft body than in a prayer. I'll pray with kisses. And when you can't? I'll wait till prayer time again. By Jove, I'd rather feel my arms full of you. I'd rather touch that red mouth, you grudger, than sing hymns with you in any heaven. I'm afraid you'll never sing hymns with me in heaven. Well, I have you here. Yes, I have you now. Our life is but a fading dawn. Liar! Well, you called me. Besides, I don't care. Carpe dear, my rosebud, my fawn. There's a nice carmen about a fawn. Time to leave its mother and venture into a warm embrace. Poor old Horace, I've forgotten him. Then poor old Horace. <laughs> well, I shan't forget you. What's that queer look in your eyes? What is it? Nay, you tell me. You're such a tease, there's no getting to the bottom of you. You can fathom the depth of a kiss. I will. I will. After a while he asked, When shall we be properly engaged, Letty? Oh, wait till Christmas, till I'm twenty-one. Nearly three months? Why on earth? It'll make no difference. I should be able to choose thee of my own free choice, then. But three months? I shall consider thee engaged. It doesn't matter about other people. I thought we should be married in three months. Ah, married in haste. But what would your mother say? Say? Oh, she'll say it's the first wise thing I've done. You'll make a fine wife, Letty, able to entertain and all that. You will flutter brilliantly. We will. No, you'll be the moth. I'll paint your wings, gaudy feather dust. Then when you lose your coloured dust, when you fly too near the light, or when you play dodge with a butterfly net, away goes my part. You can't fly. I... Alas, poor me! What becomes of the feather dust when the moth brushes his wings against a butterfly net? What are you making so many words about? You don't know now, do you? No, that I don't. Then just be comfortable. Let me look at myself in your eyes. Narcissus, Narcissus, do you see yourself well? Does the image flatter you? Or is it a troubled stream distorting your fair lineaments? I can't see anything, only feel you looking. You're laughing at me. What have you behind there? What joke? I'm thinking you're just like Narcissus, a sweet, beautiful youth. Be serious, do. It would be dangerous. You'd die of it, and I, I should... What? Be just like I am now, serious. He looked proudly thinking she referred to the earnestness of her love. In the wood, the wind rumbled and roared hoarsely overhead, but not a breath stirred among the saddened bracken. An occasional raindrop was shaken out of the trees. I slipped on the wet paths. Black bars striped the grey tree trunks where water had trickled down. The bracken was overthrown, its yellow ranks broken. I slid down the steep path to the gate, out of the wood. Armies of cloud marched in rank across the sky, heavily laden, almost brushing the gorse on the common. The wind was cold and disheartening. The ground sobbed at every step. 
The brook was full, swirling along, hurrying, talking to itself in absorbed, intent tones. The clouds darkened. I felt the rain. Careless of the mud, I ran and burst into the farm kitchen. The children were painting and they immediately claimed my help. Emily and George are in the front room, said the mother quietly, for it was Sunday afternoon. I satisfied the little ones. I said a few words to the mother and sat down to take off my clogs. In the parlour, the father, big and comfortable, was sleeping in an armchair. Emily was writing at the table. She hurriedly hid her papers when I entered. George was sitting by the fire, reading. He looked up as I entered, and I loved him when he looked up at me, and as he lingered on his quiet, hello. His eyes were beautifully eloquent, as eloquent as a kiss. We talked in subdued murmurs because the father was asleep, opulently asleep, his tanned face as still as a brown pear against the wall. The clock itself went slowly with languid throbs. We gathered round the fire and talked quietly about nothing, blissful merely in the sound of our voices, a murmured soothing sound, a grateful dispassionate love trio. At last George rose, put down his book, looked at his father, and went out. In the barn there was a sound of the pulper crunching the turnips. The crisp strips of turnips sprinkled quietly down onto a heap of gold which grew beneath the pulper. A smell of pulped turnips, keen and sweet, brings back to me the feeling of many winter nights, when frozen hoof prints crunch in the yard, and Orion is in the south, when a friendship was at its mystical best. I'll be on Sunday, I exclaimed. Father didn't do it yesterday. It's his work, and I didn't notice it. You know, father often forgets. He doesn't like to have to work in the afternoon now. The cattle stirred in their stalls. The chains rattled round the posts. A cow coughed noisily. When George had finished pulping, and it was quiet enough for talk, just as he was spreading the first layer of chop and turnip and meal, in ran Emily, with her hair in silken, twining confusion, her eyes glowing, to bid us to go into tea before the milking was begun. It was the custom to milk before tea on Sunday, but George abandoned it without demur. His father willed it so, and his father was master, not to be questioned on farm matters, however one disagreed. The last day in October had been dreary enough. The night could not come too early. We had tea by lamplight, merrily, with the father radiating comfort as the lamp shone yellow light. Sunday tea was imperfect without a visitor. With me, they always declared, it was perfect. I loved to hear them say so. I smiled, rejoicing quietly into my teacup, when the father said, It seems proper to have Cyril here at Sunday tea. It seems natural. He was most loath to break the delightful bond of the lamplit tea table. He looked up with a half appealing glance when George at last pushed back his chair and said he supposed he'd better make a start. Aye, said the father in a mild conciliatory tone. I'll be out in a minute. The lamp hung against the barn wall, softly illuminating the lower part of the building, where bits of hay and white dust lay in the hollows between the bricks where the curled chips of turnips scattered orange gleams over the earthen floor. The lofty roof, with its swallow's nests under the tiles, was deep in shadow, and the corners were full of darkness, hiding, half-hiding, the hay, the chopper, the bins. The light shone along the passages before the stalls, glistening on the moist noses of the cattle, and on the whitewash of the walls. George was very cheerful, but I wanted to tell him my message. When he finished the feeding and had at last sat down to milk, I said, I told you Leslie Tempest was at our house when I came away. He sat with the bucket between his knees, his hands at the cow's udder, about to begin to milk. He looked up a question at me. They are practically engaged now, I said. He did not turn his eyes away, but he ceased to look at me. As one who is listening for a far-off noise, he sat with his eyes fixed. Then he bent his head and leaned it against the side of the cow, as if he would begin to milk. But he did not. 
The cow looked round and stirred uneasily. He began to draw the milk and then to milk mechanically. I watched the movement of his hands, listening to the rhythmic clang of the jets of milk on the bucket as a relief. After a while, the movement of his hands became slower, thoughtful, then stopped. She's really said yes. I nodded. And what does your mother say? She is pleased. He began to milk again. The cow stirred uneasily, shifting her legs. He looked at her angrily and went on milking. Then, quite upset, she shifted again and swung her tail in his face. Stand still, he shouted, striking her on the haunch. She seemed to cower like a beaten woman. He swore at her and continued to milk. She did not yield much that night. She was very restive. He took the stool from beneath him and gave her a good blow. I heard the stool knock on her prominent hip bone. After that she stood still, but her milk soon ceased to flow. When he stood up he paused before he went to the next beast, and I thought he was going to talk. But just then the father came along with his bucket. He looked in the shed and, laughing in his mature, pleasant way, said, So you're an onlooker today, Cyril. I thought you'd have milked a cow or two for me by now. Nay, said I, Sunday is a day of rest, and milking makes your hands ache. You only want a bit more practice, he said, joking in his right fashion. Why, George, is that all you've got from Julia? It is. Oh, I shall soon go in dry. Julia, old lady, don't go and turn skinny. When he had gone, and the shed was still, the air seemed colder. I heard his good humour. Stand over, old lass, from the other shed, and the drum beats of the first jets of milk on the pail. He has a comfortable time, said George, looking savage. I laughed. He still waited. You really expected Letty to have him, I said. I suppose so, he replied. Then she made up her mind to it. It didn't matter what she wanted at the bottom. You? said I. If it hadn't been that he was a prize with a ticket, she'd have had... You? said I. She was afraid. Look how she turned and kept away. From you? said I. I should like to squeeze her till she screamed. You should have gripped her before and kept her, said I. She... she's like a woman, like a cat, running to comfort. She strikes a bargain. Women are all tradesmen. Don't generalise, it's no good. She's like a prostitute. It's banal, I believe she loves him. He started and looked at me queerly. He looked quite childish in his doubt and perplexity. She, what? Loves him, honestly. She'd have loved me better, he muttered and turned to his milking. I left him and went to talk to his father. When the latter's four beasts were finished, George's light still shone in the other shed. I went and found him at the fifth, the last cow. When at length he had finished, he put down his pail, and, going over to poor Julia, stood scratching her back and her pole and her nose, looking into her big startled eye and murmuring. He was afraid. She jerked her head, giving him a good blow on the cheek with her horn. You can't understand them, he said sadly, rubbing his face and looking at me with his dark, serious eyes. I never knew I couldn't understand them. I never thought about it, till... She you knows, Cyril. She led me on. I laughed at his rueful appearance. End of Part 1, Chapter 7Part 1, Chapter 8 of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 8 The Riot of Christmas. For some weeks, during the latter part of November and the beginning of December, I was kept indoors by a cold. 
At last came a frost which cleared the air and dried the mud. On the second Saturday before Christmas, the world was transformed. Tall, silver and pearl-grey trees rose pale against a dim blue sky, like trees in some rare, pale paradise. The whole woodland was if petrified in marble and silver and snow. The holly leaves and long leaves of the rhododendron were rimmed and spangled with delicate tracery. When the night came clear and bright, with a moon among the hoar-frost, I rebelled against confinement and the house. No longer the mists and dank weather made the home dear. Tonight even the glare of the distant little ironworks was not visible, for the low clouds were gone, and pale stars blinked from beyond the moon. Letty was staying with me. Leslie was in London again. She tried to remonstrate in a sisterly fashion when I said I would go out. Only down to the mill, said I. Then she hesitated a while, said she would come too. I suppose I looked at her curiously, for she said, Oh, if you would rather go alone. Come, come, yes, come, said I, smiling to myself. Letty was in her old, animated mood. She ran, leaping over rough places, laughing, talking to herself in French. We came to the mill. Jip did not bark. I opened the outer door, and we crept softly into the great dark scullery, peeping into the kitchen through the crack of the door. The mother sat by the hearth, where was a big bath half full of soapy water, and at her feet, warming his bare legs at the fire, was David, who had just been bathed. The mother was gently rubbing his fine fair hair into a cloud. Molly was combing out her brown curls, sitting by her father, who, in the fire seat, was reading aloud in a hearty voice with quaint precision. At the table sat Emily and George. She was quickly picking over a pile of little yellow raisins, and he, slowly, with his head sunk, was stoning the large raisins. David kept reaching forward to play with the sleepy cat, interrupting his mother's rubbing. There was no sound but the voice of the father, full of zest. I'm afraid they were not all listening carefully. I clicked the latch and entered. Letty! exclaimed George. Cyril! cried Emily. Cyril Ray! shouted David. Hello, Cyril! said Molly. Six large brown eyes, round with surprise, welcomed me. They overwhelmed me with questions and made much of us. At length they were settled and quiet again. Yes, I am a stranger, said Letty, who had taken off her hat and furs and coat. But you do not expect me often, do you? I may come at times, eh? We're only too glad, replied the mother. Nothing all day long but the sound of the sluice and mists and rotten leaves. I'm thankful to hear a fresh voice. Is Cyril really better, Letty? asked Emily softly. He's a spoiled boy. I believe he keeps a little bit ill so that we can cade him. Let me help you. Let me peel the apples. Yes, yes, I will. He went to the table and occupied one side with her apple peeling. George had not spoken to her, so she said, I won't help you, George, because I don't like to feel my fingers so sticky and because I love to see you so domesticated. You'll enjoy the sight a long time then, for these things are numberless. You should eat one now and then, I always do. If I had one, I should eat the lot. Then you may give me your one. He passed her a handful without speaking. That is too many. Your mother is looking. Let me just finish this apple. There, I've not broken the peel. He stood up, holding up a long, curling strip of peel. How many times must I swing it, Mrs. Saxton? Three times, but it's not all Hallow's Eve. Never mind, look. She carefully swung the long band of green peel over her head three times, letting it fall the third. The cat pounced on it. But Molly swept him off again. What is it? cried Letty, blushing. Gee, said the father, winking and laughing. The mother looked daggers at him. It isn't nothing, said David naively, forgetting his confusion at being in the presence of a lady in his shirt. Molly remarked in her cool way, It might be a Hess if you couldn't write. Or an L, I added. Letty looked over at me imperiously, and I was angry. What do you say, Emily? she asked. Nay, said Emily, it's only you can see the right letter. Tell us what's the right letter, said George to her. I, exclaimed Letty, 
who could look into the seeds of time? Those who have set them and watched them sprout, said I. She flung the peel into the fire, laughing a short laugh, and went on with her work. Mrs. Saxton leaned over to her daughter and said softly, said that she should not hear, that George was pulling the flesh out of the raisins. George, said Emily sharply, you're leaving nothing but the husks. He too was angry. And he would fain fill his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, he said quietly, taking a handful of the fruit he had picked and putting some in his mouth. Emily snatched away the basin. It is too bad, she said. Here, said Letty, handing him an apple she had peeled. You may have an apple, greedy boy. He took it and looked at it. Then a malicious smile twinkled round his eyes as he said, If you give me the apple, to whom will you give the peel? The swine, she said, as if she only understood his first reference to the prodigal son. He put the apple on the table. Don't you want it, she said. Mother, he said comically, as if jesting, she's offering me the apple like Eve. Like a flash, she snatched the apple from him, hid it in her skirts a moment, looking at him with dilated eyes, and then she flung it at the fire. She missed, and the father leaned forward and picked it off the hob, saying, The pigs may as well have it. You were a slow, George. When a lady offers you a thing, you don't have to make mouths. A ce qu'il paraît, she cried, laughing now at her ease, boisterously. Is she making love, Emily? asked the father, laughing suggestively. She said it too fast for me, said Emily. George was leaning back in his chair, his hands in his breeches' pockets. We shall have to finish his raisins after all, Emily, said Letty brightly. Look what a lazy animal he is. He likes his comfort, said Emily with irony. The picture of content, solid, healthy, easy-moving content, continued Letty. As he sat thus with his head thrown back against the end of the ingle seat, coatless, his red neck seen in repose, he did indeed look remarkably comfortable. I shall never fret my fat away, he said stolidly. No, you and I, we are not like Cyril. We do not burn our bodies in our hides, or our hearts, do we? We have it in common, said he, looking at her indifferently beneath his lashes as his head was tilted back. Letty went on with the paring and coring of her apples. Then she took the raisins. Meanwhile, Emily was making the house ring as she chopped the suet in a wooden bowl. The children were ready for bed. They kissed us all good night, save George. At last they were gone, accompanied by their mother. Emily put down her chopper and sighed that her arm was aching, so I relieved her. The chopping went on for a long time while the father read, Letty worked, and George sat tilted back, looking on. When at length the mincemeat was finished, we were all out of work. Letty helped to clear away, sat down, talked a little with effort, jumped up and said, oh, I'm too excited to sit still. It's so near Christmas. Let us play at something. A dance, said Emily. A dance, a dance. He suddenly sat straight and got up. Come on, he said. He kicked off his slippers, regardless of the holes in his stocking feet, and put away the chairs. He held out his arm to her. She came with a laugh, and away they went, dancing over the great flagged kitchen at an incredible speed, her light flying steps following his leaps. You could hear the quick light tap of her toes more plainly than the thud of his stockinged feet. Emily and I joined in. Emily's movements are naturally slow, but we danced at great speed. I was hot and perspiring, and she was panting when I put her in a chair. But they whirled on in the dance, on and on, till I was giddy, till the father, laughing, cried that they should stop. But George continued the dance. Her hair was shaken loose and fell in a great coil down her back. Her feet began to drag. You could hear a light slur on the floor. She was panting. I could see her lips murmur to him, begging him to stop. He was laughing with open mouth, holding her tight. At last her feet trailed. He lifted her, clasping her tightly and danced twice round the room with her thus. Then he fell with a crash on the sofa, pulling her beside him. His eyes glowed like coals. He was panting in sobs, and his hair was wet and glistening. She lay back on the sofa, with his arms still around her, not moving. She was quite overcome. Her hair was wild about her face. Emily was anxious. 
The father said with a shade of inquietude, You have overdone it. It is very foolish. When at last she recovered her breath and her life, she got up and, laughing in a queer way, began to put up her hair. She went into the scullery where were the brush and combs, and Emily followed with a candle. When she returned, ordered once more, with a little pallor succeeding the flush, and with a great black stain of sweat on her leathern belt where his hand had held her, he looked up at her from his position on the sofa, with a peculiar glance of triumph, smiling. "'You great brute!' she said, but her voice was not as harsh as her words. He gave a deep sigh, sat up, and laughed quietly. Another, he said. Will you dance with me? At your pleasure. Come then, a minuet. Don't know it. Nevertheless, you must dance it. Come along. He reared up and walked to her side. She put him through the steps, even dragging him round the waltz. It was very ridiculous. When it was finished, she bowed him to his seat, and, wiping her hands on her handkerchief, because his shirt, where her hand had rested on his shoulders, was moist, she thanked him. "'I hope you enjoyed it,' he said. "'Ever so much,' she replied. "'You made me look a fool, so no doubt you did.' "'You think you could look a fool? Why, you are ironical. Samash! In other words, you have come on. But it is a sweet dance.' He looked at her, lowered his eyelids, and said nothing. Ah, oh, well, she laughed. Some are bred for the minuet, and some for... Less tomfoolery, he answered. Ah, you call it tomfoolery, because you cannot do it. Myself, I like it so... And I can't do it. Could you? Did you? You're not built that way. Sort of Clarence McFadden, he said, lighting a pipe as if the conversation did not interest him. Yes, what ages since we sang that? Clarence McFadden, he wanted to dance, but his feet were not gated that way. I remember we sang it after one corn harvest. We had a fine time. I never thought of you before as Clarence. It is very funny. By the way, will you come to our party at Christmas? When? Who's coming? The twenty-six. Oh, only the old people. Alice, Tom Smith, Fanny, those from High Close. And what will you do? Sing charades? Dance a little? Anything you like? Polka? And minuets and valitas? Come and dance a valita, Cyril. He made me take her through a valita, a minuet, a mazurka, and she danced elegantly, but with a little of Carmen's ostentation, her dash and devilry. When we had finished, the father said, Very pretty, very pretty indeed. They do look nice, don't they, George? I wish I was young. As I am, said George, laughing bitterly. Show me how to do them some time, Cyril, said Emily, in her pleading way which displeased Letty so much. "'Why don't you ask me?' said the latter quickly. "'Well, but you're not often here.' "'I am here now. Come.' And she waved Emily imperiously to the attempt. Letty, as I've said, is tall, approaching six feet. She is lissom, but firmly moulded by nature, graceful. In her poise and harmonious movement are revealed the subtle sympathies of her artist's soul. The other is shorter, much heavier, in her every motion you can see the extravagance of her emotional nature. She quivers with feeling. Emotion conquers and carries havoc through her. For she has not a strong intellect, nor a heart of light humour. Her nature is brooding and defenceless. She knows herself powerless in the tumult of her feelings, and adds to her misfortunes a profound mistrust of herself. As they danced together, Letty and Emily, they showed in striking contrast. My sister's ease and beautiful poetic movement was exquisite. The other could not control her movements, but repeated the same error again and again. She gripped Letty's hand fiercely and glanced up with eyes full of humiliation and terror of her continued failure and passionate, trembling, hopeless desire to succeed. To show her, to explain, made matters worse. As soon as she trembled on the brink of an action, the terror of not being able to perform it properly blinded her, and she was conscious of nothing but that she must do something in a turmoil. At last Letty ceased to talk, and merely swung her through the dances haphazard. This way succeeded better. So long as Emily did not need to think about her actions, she had a large, free grace, 
and the swing and rhythm and time were imparted through her senses rather than through her intelligence. It was time for supper. The mother came down for a while and we talked quietly at random. Letty did not utter a word about her engagement, not a suggestion. She made it seem as if things were just as before, although I am sure she had discovered that I had told George. She intended that we should play as if ignorant of her bond. After supper, when we were ready to go home, Letty said to him, By the way, you must send us some mistletoe for the party, with plenty of berries, you know. Are there many berries on your mistletoe this year? I do not know. I have never looked. We'll go and see, if you like, George answered. But will you come out into the cold? He pulled on his boots and his coat and twisted a scarf round his neck. The young moon had gone. It was very dark. The liquid stars wavered. The great night filled us with awe. Letty caught hold of my arm and held it tightly. He passed out in front to open the gates. We went down to the front garden over the turf bridge where the sluice rushed coldly under, on to the broad slope of the bank. We could just distinguish the gnarled old apple trees leaning about us. We bent our heads to avoid the boughs and followed George. He hesitated a moment, saying, Let me see, I think there are there the two trees with mistletoes on. We again followed silently. Yes, he said, here they are. We went close and peered into the old trees. We could just see the dark bush of the mistletoe between the boughs of the tree. Letty began to laugh. Have we come to cut the berries, she said. I can't even see the mistletoe. She leaned forward and upwards to pierce the darkness. He, also straining to look, felt her breath on his cheek, and, turning, saw the pallor of her face close to his, and felt the dark glow of her eyes. He caught her in his arms, and held her mouth in a kiss. Then, when he released her, he turned away, saying something incoherent about going to fetch the lantern to look. She remained with her back towards me and pretended to be feeling among the mistletoe for the berries. Soon I saw the swing of the hurricane lamp below. He's bringing the lantern, said I. When he came up, he said, and his voice was strange and subdued, Now we can see what it's like. He went near and held up the lamp so that it illuminated both their faces and the fantastic boughs of the trees, and the weird bush of mistletoe sparsely pearled with berries. Instead of looking at the berries, they looked into each other's eyes. His lids flickered, and he flushed in the yellow light of the lamp, looking warm and handsome. He looked upwards in confusion and said, There are plenty of berries. As a matter of fact, there were very few. She too looked up and murmured her assent. The light seemed to hold them as in a globe, in another world, apart from the night in which I stood. He put up his hand and broke off a sprig of mistletoe with berries, and offered it to her. They looked into each other's eyes again. She put the mistletoe among her furs, looking down at her bosom. They remained still in the centre of light with the lamp uplifted. The red and black scarf wrapped loosely round his neck gave him a luxurious, generous look. He lowered the lamp and said, affecting to speak naturally, Yes, there is plenty this year. You will give me some, she replied, turning away and finally breaking the spell. When shall I cut it? He strode beside her, swinging the lamp as he went down the bank to go home. He came as far as the brooks without saying another word. Then he bade us good night. When he had lighted her over the stepping stones, she did not take my arm as we walked home. During the next two weeks, we were busy preparing for Christmas, ranging the woods for the reddest holly and pulling the gleaming ivy bunches from the trees. From the farms around came the cruel yelling of pigs, and in the evening later was a scent of pork pies. Far off on the highway could be heard the sharp trot of ponies hastening with Christmas goods. There the carts of the hucksters dashed by to the expectant villagers, triumphant with great bunches of light foreign mistletoe gay with oranges peeping through the boxes, and scarlet intrusion of apples, and wild confusion of cold, dead poultry. The hucksters waved their whips triumphantly, the little ponies rattled bravely under the sycamores, towards Christmas. 
In the late afternoon of the 24th, when dust was rising under the hazel brake, I was walking with Letty. All among the mesh of twigs overhead was tangled a dark red sky. The boles of the trees grew denser, almost blue. Tramping down the riding, we met two boys, 15 or 16 years old. Their clothes were largely patched with tough cotton moleskin. Scars were knotted round their throats, and in their pockets rolled tin bottles full of tea and the white knobs of their knotted snap bags. Why, said Letty, are you going to work on Christmas Eve? It looks like it, don't it? said the elder. At what time would you be coming back? At half past two. Christmas morning. You'll be able to look out for the Herald Angels and the Star, said I. They think we was two dirty little uns, said the younger lad, laughing. I'll happen a done before we get up to the top, added the older boy, and the nun venture down the shaft. If they did, put in the other, he'd have to bath them after. I give him a bit of me pasty. Come on, said the elder sulkily. They tramped off, slurring their heavy boots. Merry Christmas, I called after them. In the morning, replied the elder. Same to you, said the younger, and he began to sing with a tinge of bravado. In the fields with their flocks abiding, they lay on the dewy ground. Auntie said, Eddie, those boys are working for me. We were all going to the party at Highclose. I happened to go into the kitchen about half past seven. The lamp was turned low and Rebecca sat in the shadows. On the table in the light of the lamp I saw a glass vase with five or six very beautiful Christmas roses. And Rebecca, who sent you these? said I. They're not sent, replied Rebecca from the depth of the shadow with suspicions of tears in her voice. Why, I never saw them in the garden. Perhaps not, but I've watched them these three weeks and kept them under glass. For Christmas? They are beauties. I thought someone must have sent them to you. It's little as has ever been sent me, replied Rebecca, unless as will be. Why, what's the matter? Nothing. Who am I to have anything the matter? Nobody, nor ever was, nor ever will be. And I'm getting old as well. Something's upset you, Becky. What does it matter if it has? What are my feelings? A bunch of felder old flowers as a garden clips off with never a thought is preferred before mine as I've fettled after this three week. I can sit at home to keep my flowers company. Nobody wants them. I remembered that Letty was wearing hothouse flowers. She was excited and full of the idea of the party at High Close. I can imagine her quick, Oh no, thank you, Rebecca. I've had a spray sent to me. Never mind, Becky, said I. She is excited tonight. And I'm easy forgotten. So are we all, Becky. Tomio. At High Close, Letty made a stir. Among the little bells of the countryside, she was decidedly the most distinguished. She was brilliant, moving as if in a drama. Leslie was enraptured, ostentatious in his admiration, proud of being so well infatuated. They looked into each other's eyes when they met, both triumphant, excited, blazing arch looks at one another. Letty was enjoying her public demonstration immensely. It exhilarated her into quite a vivid love for him. He was magnificent in response. Meanwhile, the honoured lady of the house, pompous and ample, sat aside with my mother conferring her patronage on the latter amiable little woman, who smiled sardonically and watched Letty. It was a splendid party. It was brilliant. It was dazzling. I danced with several ladies and honourably kissed each under the mistletoe, except that two of them kissed me first. It was all done in a most correct manner. You wolf, said Miss Wookie, archly. I believe you are a wolf, a very cool rude de femme. And you look such a lamb, too, such a dear. Even my bleach reminds you of Mary's pet. But you're not my pet. At least, it is well that my golo doesn't hear you. If he is so very big, said I. Oh, he is really. He's beefy. I've engaged myself to him somehow or other. One never knows how one does these things, do they? I couldn't speak from experience, said I. Cruel man. I suppose I felt Christmassy, and I'd just been reading Mitterlink. And he really is big. Who? I asked. Oh, he, of course, my gulo. I can't help admiring men who are a bit avoir du poisy. It is unfortunate they can't dance. Perhaps fortunate, said I. I could see you hate him. 
Pity I didn't think to ask him if he danced before. Would it have influenced you very much? Well, of course, one can be free to dance all the more with the really nice men whom one never marries. <laughs> Why not? Oh, you can only marry one. No, of course. There he is. He's coming for me. Oh, Frank, you leave me to the tender mercies of the world at large. I thought you'd forgotten me, dear. I thought the same, replied her Golo, a great fat fellow with a childish bare face. He smiled awesomely, and one never knew what he meant to say. We drove home in the early Christmas morning. Letty, warmly wrapped in her cloak, had had a little stroll with her lover in the shrubbery. She was still brilliant, flashing in her movements. He, as he bade her goodbye, was almost beautiful in his grace and his low musical tone. I nearly loved him myself. She was very fond towards him. As we came to the gate where the private road branched from the highway, we heard John say, Thank you. Looking out, saw our two boys returning from the pit. They were very grotesque in the dark night as the lamplight fell on them, showing them grimy, flecked with bits of snow. They shouted merrily their good wishes. Letty leaned out and waved to them, and they cried, Hooray! Christmas came in with their acclamations. End of Part 1, Chapter 8Part 1, Chapter 9 of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 9, Letty Comes of Age. Letty was twenty-one on the day after Christmas. She woke me in the morning with cries of dismay. There was a great fall of snow, multiplying the cold morning light, startling the slow-footed twilight. The lake was black like the open eyes of a corpse. The woods were black like the beard on the face of a corpse. A rabbit bobbed out and floundered in much consternation. Little birds settled into the depths and rose in a dusty whirr, much terrified at the universal treachery of the earth. The snow was eighteen inches deep and drifted in places. They will never come, lamented Letty, for it was the day of her party. At any rate, Leslie will said I. One, she exclaimed. That one is all, isn't it? said I. And for sure George will come, though I've not seen him this fortnight. He's not been in one night, they say, for a fortnight. Why not? I cannot say. Letty went away to ask Rebecca for the fiftieth time if she thought they would come. At any rate, the extra woman help came. It was not more than ten o'clock when Leslie arrived, ruddy, with shining eyes, laughing like a boy. There was much stamping in the porch, and knocking of leggings with his stick, and crying of Letty from the kitchen to know who had come, and loud, cheery answers from the porch, bidding her come and see. She came, and greeted him with effusion. "'Ah, my little woman,' he said, kissing her, "'I declare you are a woman. Look at yourself in the glass now.' She did so. What do you see? he asked, laughing. You, mighty gay, looking at me. Ah, but look at yourself. There, I declare you're more afraid of your own eyes than of mine, aren't you? I am, she said, and he kissed her with rapture. It's your birthday, he said. I know, she replied. So do I. You promised me something. What? she asked. Yeah, see if you like it. He gave her a little case. She opened it, and instinctively slipped the ring on her finger. He made a movement of pleasure. She looked up, laughing breathlessly at him. Now, said he, in tones of finality. Ah, she exclaimed in a strange, thrilled voice. He caught her in his arms. After a while, when they could talk rationally again, she said, Do you think they will come to my party? I hope not, by heaven. But, oh yes, we've made all preparations. What does that matter? Ten thousand folks here today? Not ten thousand, only five or six. I, I should be wild if they can't come. You want them? We've asked them, and everything is ready, and I do want us to have a party one day. But today, damn it all, Letty. But I did want my party today. Don't you think they'll come? They won't if there's any sense. 
You might help me, she pouted. Well, I'll be. And you've set your mind on having a house full of people today? You know how we look forward to it, my party. At any rate, I know Tom Smith will come, and I'm almost sure Emily Saxton will. He bit his moustache angrily and said at last, Then I suppose I'd better send John round for the lot. It wouldn't be much trouble, would it? No trouble at all. Do you know, she said, twisting the ring on her finger, it makes me feel as if I've tied something round my finger to remember by. It somehow remains in my consciousness all the time. At any rate, said he, I've got you. After dinner, when we were alone, Letty sat at the table, nervously fingering her ring. It is pretty, mother, isn't it? She said, a trifle pathetically. Yes, very pretty. I've always liked Leslie, replied my mother. But if you're so heavy, it fidgets me. I, I should like to take it off. You're like me. I never could wear rings. I hated my wedding ring for months. Did you, mother? I longed to take it off and put it away. But after a while I got used to it. I'm glad this isn't a wedding ring. Leslie says it is as good, said I. Oh, well, yes, but still it is different. She put the jewel round under her finger and looked at the plain gold band. Then she twisted it back quickly, saying, I'm glad it's not, not yet. I begin to feel a woman, little mother. I feel grown up today. My mother got up suddenly and went and kissed Letty fervently. Let me kiss my girl goodbye, she said, and her voice was muffled with tears. Letty clung to my mother and sobbed a few quiet sobs hidden in her bosom. Then she lifted her face, which was wet with tears, and kissed my mother, murmuring, No, mother, no. About three o'clock the carriage came with Leslie and Marie. Both Letty and I were upstairs, and I heard Marie come tripping up to my sister. Oh, Letty, he's in such a state of excitement you never knew. He took me with him to buy it. Let me see it on. I think it's awfully lovely. Here, let me help you to do your hair, all in those little rolls. It will look charming. You've really got beautiful hair. There's so much life in it. It's a pity to twist it into a coil, as you do. I wish my hair were a bit longer. Though really, it's all the better for this fashion. Don't you like it? It's so chic. I think those little puffs are just fascinating. It is rather long for them, but it will look ravishing. Really, my eyes and eyebrows and eyelashes are my best features, don't you think? Marie, the delightful, charming little creature, twittered on. I went downstairs. Leslie started when I entered the room, but seeing only me, he leaned forward again, resting his arms on his knees, looking in the fire. What the dickens is she doing? he asked. Dressing. Then we may keep on waiting. Isn't it a deuce nuisance, these people coming? Well, we generally have a good time. Oh, it's all very well. We're not in the same boat, you and me. Fact, said I, laughing. By Jove, Cyril, you don't know what it is to be in love. I never thought I couldn't have believed I should be like it. All the time when it isn't at the top of your blood, it's at the bottom. The girl, the girl. He stared into the fire. It seems pressing you, pressing you on, never leaves you alone a moment. Again he lapsed into reflection. Then all at once you remember how she kissed you, and all your blood jumps afar. He mused again for a while. Or rather, he seemed fiercely to con over his sensations. You know, he said, I don't think she feels for me as I do for her. Would you want her to? said I. I don't know. Perhaps not, but still I don't think she feels... At this he lighted a cigarette to soothe his excited feelings, and there was silence for some time. Then the girls came down. We could hear their light chatter. Nettie entered the room. He jumped up and surveyed her. She was dressed in soft, creamy, silky stuff. Her neck was quite bare. Her hair was, as Marie promised, fascinating. She was laughing nervously. She grew warm like a blossom in the sunshine in the glow of his admiration. He went forward and kissed her. You are splendid, he said. She only laughed for answer. He drew her away to the great armchair and made her sit in it beside him. She was indulgent and he radiant. He took her hand and looked at it, and at his ring, which she wore. It looks all right, he murmured. 
anything would, she replied. What do you mean, sapphires and diamonds? For, for I don't know. Nor do I. Blue for hope, because Sporanza and Fairy Queen had a blue gown, and diamonds for the crystalline clearness of my nature. It's glitter and hardness, you mean. You're a hard little mistress. But why hope? Why? No reason whatever, like most things. No, that's not right. Hope. Oh, blindfolded, hugging a silly harp with no strings. I wonder why she didn't drop her harp framework over the edge of the globe and take the handkerchief off her eyes and have a look round. But of course she was a woman, and a man's woman. Do you know, I believe most women can sneak a look down their noses from underneath the handkerchief of hope they've tied over their eyes. They could take the whole muffler off, but they don't do it, the dears. I don't believe you know what you're talking about, and I'm sure I don't. Sapphires remind me of your eyes, and isn't it blue that kept the faith? I remember something about it. Yeah, said she, pulling off the ring. You ought to wear it yourself, faithful one, to keep me in constant mind. Keep it on, keep it on. It holds you faster than that fair damsel tied to a tree in Millet's picture. I, I believe it's Millet. She sat, shaking with laughter. What a comparison! Who'll be the brave knight to rescue me, discreetly, from behind? Ah, he answered, it doesn't matter. You don't want rescuing, do you? Not yet, she replied, teasing him. They continued to talk half-nonsense, making themselves eloquent by quick looks and gestures and communion of warm closeness. The ironical tones went out of Betty's voice, and they made love. Marie drew me away into the dining room to leave them alone. Marie is a charming little maid whose appearance is neatness, whose face is confident little goodness. Her hair is dark and lies low upon her neck in wavy coils. She does not affect the fashion in coiffure, and generally is a little behind the fashion in dress. Indeed, she is a half-opened bud of a matron, conservative, full of proprieties and of gentle indulgence. She now smiled at me with a warm delight in the romance upon which she had just shed her grace, but her demureness allowed nothing to be said. She glanced round the room and out of the window and observed, I always love Woodside. It is restful. There is something about it, oh, assuring, really. It comforts one. I've been reading Maxim Gorky. You shouldn't, said I. That I'll read some, but I don't like them. I shall read no more. I like Woodside. It makes you feel really at home. It soothes one like the old wood does. It seems right. Life is proper here, not ulcery. Just healthy living flesh, said I. No, I don't mean that, because one feels oh, as if the world were old and good, not old and bad. Young and undisciplined and mad, said I. No, but here you and Letty and Leslie and me, it's so nice for us and it seems so natural and good. Woodside is so old and so sweet and serene, it does reassure one. Yes, said I. We just live, nothing abnormal, nothing cruel and extravagant, just natural, like doves in a dovecot. Oh, doves, they're so, so mushy. They're dear little birds, doves. You look like one yourself with a black band round your neck. You, a turtle dove, and Letty, a wood pigeon. Letty is splendid, isn't she? What a swing she has, what a mastery. I wish I had her strength. She just marches straight through in the right way. I think she's fine. I laughed to see her so enthusiastic in her admiration of my sister. Marie is such a gentle, serious little soul. She went to the window. I kissed her and pulled two berries off the mistletoe. I made her a nest in the heavy curtains, and she sat there looking out on the snow. It is lovely, she said reflectively. People must be ill when they write like Maxim Gorky. They live in town, said I. Yes, but then look at Hardy. Life seems so terrible. It isn't, is it? If you don't feel it, it isn't. If you don't see it. I don't see it for myself. It's lovely enough for heaven. Eskimo's heaven, perhaps. And we're the angels, eh? And I'm an archangel. No, you're a vain, frivolous man. Is that... What is that moving through the trees? Somebody coming, said I. 
was a big burly fellow moving curiously through the bushes. Doesn't he walk funnily? exclaimed Marie. He did. When he came near enough, we saw he was straddled upon Indian snowshoes. Marie peeped and laughed and peeped and hid again in the curtains, laughing. He was very red and looked very hot as he hauled the great meshes shuffling over the snow. His body rolled most comically. I went to the door and admitted him, while Marie stood stroking her face with her hands to smooth away the traces of her laughter. He grasped my hand in a very large and heavy glove, with which he then wiped his perspiring brow. Well, Bertel, old man, he said, and how's things? God, I'm not half hot. Fine idea, though. He showed me his snowshoes. Ripping, aren't they? I've come like an Indian brave. He rolled his R's and lengthened out his R's tremendously. Brave. Couldn't resist it, though, he continued. Remember your party last year? Girls turned up. On the warpath, eh? Burst up his childish lips and rubbed his fat chin. Having removed his coat and the white wrap which protected his collar, not to mention the snowflakes, which Rebecca took almost as an insult to herself, he seated his fat, hot body on a chair and proceeded to take off his gaiters and his boots. Then he donned his dancing pumps and I led him upstairs. Lord, I skimmed here like a swallow, he continued and I looked at his corpulence. Never met a soul, though they've had a snowplow down the road. I saw the marks of a cart up the drive, so I guess the Tempest's for here. So, let his put her nose in Tempest's nosebag. Leaves nobody a chance, that. Some women have rum taste. Only they're like ravens, they go for the gilding. Don't blame them. Only it leaves nobody a chance. Maybe how it's coming, I suppose. I ventured something about the snow. She'll come, he said, if it's up to the neck. Her mother saw me go past. He proceeded with his toilet. I told him that Leslie had sent the carriage for Alice and Mady. He slapped his flat legs and exclaimed, Miss Gall, I smell sulphur. Beardsel, old boy, there's fun in the wind. Mady and the coy little tempest and... He hissed a line of a musical song through his teeth. During all this he had straightened his cream and lavender waistcoat. Little pick of a girl worked it for me. Real juicy little peach. Chip, somehow or other. He'd arranged his white bow. He had drawn forth two rings, one a great signet, the other gorgeous with diamonds, and had adjusted them on his fat white fingers. He'd run his fingers delicately through his hair, which rippled backwards a trifle tawdrily, being fine and somewhat sapless. He produced a box containing a cream carnation with suitable greenery, he flicked himself with a silk handkerchief and had dusted his patent leather shoes. Lastly, he had pursed up his lips and surveyed himself with great satisfaction in the mirror. Then he was ready to be presented. Couldn't forget today, Letty. Wouldn't have let old Pluto and all the bunch of them keep me away. I skimmed here like a brave on my snowshoes, like Hiawatha coming to Minnehaha. Ah, oh, that was famine, said Marie softly. And this is a feast, a gorgeous feast, Miss Tempest, he said, bowing to Marie, who laughed. You have brought some music? asked Mother. Wish I was Orpheus, he said, uttering his words with exaggerated enunciation, a trick he had caught from his singing, I suppose. I see you're in full feather, Tempest. Is she kind as she is fair? Who? Will pursed up his smooth, sensuous face that looked as if it had never needed shaving. Letty went out with Marie, hearing the bell ring. "'He's in a hurry!' exclaimed William. "'God, I'm almost done for. She's a lotus blossom. But is that your ring she's wearing, Tempest?' "'Keep off,' said Leslie. "'Don't be a fool,' said I. "'Ho, oh, ho!' drawled Will. "'So we must look the other way. La belle homme sans merci!' He sighed profoundly, and ran his fingers through his hair, keeping one eye on himself in the mirror as he did so. Then he adjusted his rings and went to the piano. At first he only splashed about brilliantly. Then he sorted the music and took a volume of Tchaikovsky's songs. He began the long opening of one song, was unsatisfied, and found another, a serenade of Don Juan. Then at last he began to sing. His voice is a beautiful tenor, softer, more mellow, less strong and brassy than Leslie's. Now it was raised that it might be heard upstairs. As the melting gush poured forth, 
The door opened. William softened his tones and sang Dolce, but he did not glance round. Rapture! Choir of angels! exclaimed Alice, clasping her hands and gazing up at the lintel of the door like a sainted virgin. Persephone, Europa, murmured Maidie at her side, getting tangled in her mythology. Alice pressed her clasped hands against her bosom in ecstasy as the notes rose higher. Hold me, Maidie! Why, I shall rush to extinction in the arms of this siren. Clung to Mady. The song finished and Will turned round. Take it calmly, Miss Gall, he said. I hope you're not hit too badly. Oh, how can you say take it calmly? How can the savage beast be calm? I'm sorry for you, said Will. You are the cause of my trouble, dear boy, replied Alice. I never thought you'd come, said Mady. Skimmed here like an Indian brave, said Will, like Hiawatha towards Minnehaha. I knew you were coming. You know, said Bud Mady, he gave me quite a flutter when I heard the piano. It is a year since I saw you. How did you get here? I came on snowshoes, said he. Real Indian. Came from Canada. They're just ripping. Oh, oh. do go and put them on and show us. Do, do perform for us, Billy dear, cried Alice. Out of the cold and driving sleet, no fear, said he, and he turned to talk to Mady. Alice sat chatting with Mother. Soon Tom Smith came and took a seat next to Marie, and sat quietly looking over his spectacles with his sharp brown eyes, full of scorn for William, full of misgiving for Leslie and Letty. Shortly after, George and Emily came in. They were rather nervous. When they had changed their clogs, and Emily had taken off her brown paper leggings, and he his leather ones, they were not anxious to go into the drawing-room. I was surprised, and so was Emily, to see that he had put on dancing shoes. Emily, riding from the cold air, was wearing a wine-coloured dress, which suited her luxurious beauty. George's clothes were well made. It was a point on which he was particular, being somewhat self-conscious. He wore a jacket and a dark bow. The other men were in evening dress. We took them into the drawing-room, where the lamp was not lighted, and the glow of the fire was becoming evident in the dusk. We had taken up the carpet. The floor was all polished, and some of the furniture was taken away, so that the room looked large and ample. There was general handshaking, and the newcomers were seated near the fire. First, Mother talked to them. Then the candles were lighted to the piano, and Will played to us. He is an exquisite pianist, full of refinement and poetry. It is astonishing, and it is a fact. Mother went out to attend to the tea, and after a while Letty crossed over to Emily and George, and, drawing up a low chair, sat down to talk to them. Leslie stood in the window bay, looking out on the lawn where the snow grew bluer and bluer, and the sky almost purple. Letty put her hands on Emily's lap and said softly, Look, do you like it? "'What, engaged?' exclaimed Emily. "'I am of age, you see,' said Letty. "'It is a beauty, isn't it? Let me try it on, will you? "'Yes, I've never had a ring. "'There, it won't go over my knuckle. "'No, I thought not. "'Oh, my hand's red. It's the cold. "'Yes, it's too small for me. "'I do like it.' George sat watching the play of the four hands in his sister's lap, two hands moving so white and fascinating in the twilight. The other two rather red, with rather large bones, looking so nervous, almost hysterical. The ring played between the four hands, giving an occasional flash from the twilight or candlelight. You must congratulate me, she said in a very low voice, and two of us knew she spoke to him. As yes, said Emily, I do. And you, she said, turning to him who was silent. What do you want me to say? he asked. Say what you like. Sometime when I've thought about it. Oh, dinners, laughed Letty, awaking Alice's old sarcasm at his lowness. What? he exclaimed, looking up suddenly at her taunt. She knew she was playing false. She put the ring on her finger and went across the room to Leslie, laying her arm over his shoulder and leaning her head against him, murmuring softly to him. He, poor fellow, was delighted with her, for she did not display her fondness often. We went into tea. The yellow-shaded lamp shone softly over the table, 
where Christmas roses spread wide open among some dark coloured leaves, where the china and silver and the coloured dishes shone delightfully. We were all very gay and bright. Who could be otherwise, seated round a well-laid table with young company and the snow outside? George felt awkward when he noticed his hands over the table, but for the rest we enjoyed ourselves exceedingly. The conversation veered inevitably to marriage. But what have you to say about it, Mr Smith? asked little Marie. Nothing yet, replied he in his peculiar grating voice. My marriage is in the unanalyzed solution of the future. When I've done the analysis, I'll tell you. But what do you think about it? Do you remember, Letty? said Will Bancroft, that little red-haired girl who was in our year at college? She's just married old Craven out of physics department. I wish her joy of it, said Letty. Wasn't she an old flame of yours? Among the rest, he replied, smiling. Don't you remember you were one of them? You had your day. What a joke that was, exclaimed Letty. We used to go into the Arboretum at dinner time. You lasted half one autumn. Do you remember when we gave a concert, you and I, and Frank Boyshaw, in the small lecture theatre? When the pretty was such an old buck flattering you, continued Will, and that night Wishaw's took you to the station, sent old Get him for a cab and saw you in large as life. Never was such a thing before. Oh, Wishaw won you with that cab, didn't he? Oh, how I swelled, cried Letty. There were you all at the top of the steps, gazing with admiration. But Frank Wishaw was not a nice fellow, though he played the violin beautifully. I never liked his eyes. No, added Will. He didn't last long, did he? Though long enough to oust me. We had a giddy, ripping time in coal, didn't we? It was not bad, said Letty. Rather foolish. I'm afraid I wasted my three years. I think, said Letty, smiling, you proved the shining hours to great purpose. It pleased him to think what a flirt you'd been, since the flirting had been harmless and only added to the glory of his final conquest. George felt very much left out during these reminiscences. When we had finished tea, we adjourned to the drawing room. It was in darkness, save for the firelight. The mistletoe had been discovered and was being appreciated. Georgie, Sybil, Sybil, Georgie, come and kiss me, cried Alice. Will went forward to do her the honour. She ran to me, saying, Get away, you fat fool, keep on your own preserves. Now, Georgie dear, come and kiss me, because you haven't got nobody else but me. No, you haven't. Do you want to run away like Lord Georgie Porgy Apple Pie? Shan't cry, sure I shan't, if you were ugly. She took him and kissed him on either cheek, saying softly, You shan't be so serious, old boy. Buck up, there's a good fellow. He lighted the lamp, and charades were proposed. Leslie and Letty, Will and Maidie and Alice went out to play. The first scene was an elopement to Gretna Green, with Alice, her maid servant, a part that she played wonderfully well as a caricature. It was very noisy and extremely funny. Leslie was in high spirits. It was remarkable to observe that, as he became more animated, more abundantly energetic, Letty became quieter. The second scene, which they were playing as excited melodrama, she turned into small tragedy with her bitterness. They went out and Letty blew us kisses from the doorway. Doesn't she act well? exclaimed Marie, speaking to Tom. Quite realistic, said he. She could always play a part well, said Mother. I should think, said Emily, she could take a role in life and play up to it. I believe she could, Mother answered. There would only be intervals when she would see herself in a mirror, acting. And what then, said Marie? She would feel desperate and wait till the fit passed off, replied my mother, smiling significantly. The players came in again. Letty kept her part subordinate. Leslie played with brilliance. It was rather startling how he excelled. The applause was loud, but he could not guess the word. Then they laughed and told us. We clamoured for more. Do go, dear, said Letty to Leslie and I will be helping to arrange the room for the dances. I want to watch you. I'm rather tired. It's so exciting. Emily will take my place. They went. Marie and Tom and Mother and I 
played bridge in one corner. Nettie said she wanted to show George some new pictures, and they bent over a portfolio for some time. Then she bade him help her to clear the room for the dances. Well, you've had time to think, she said to him. Short time, he replied. What shall I say? Tell me what you've been thinking. Well, about you, he answered, smiling foolishly. What about me? she asked, venturesome. About you, how you were at college, he replied. Oh, I had a good time. I had plenty of boys. I liked them all, till I found there was nothing in them. Then they tired me. Poor boys, he said, laughing. Were they all alike? All alike, she replied, and they are still. Pity, he said, smiling. Hard lines on you. Why, she asked. It leaves you nobody to care for, he replied. How very sarcastic you are. You make one reservation. Do I? he answered, smiling. But you fire sharp into the air, and then say we're all blank cartridges, except one, of course. You? she queried ironically. Oh, you would forever hang fire. Old dinners, he quoted in bitterness. But you knew I loved you. You knew well enough. Past tense, she replied. Thanks. Make it perfect next time. It's you who hang far, it's you who make me, he said. And so from the retort circumstantial to the retort direct, she replied, smiling. You see, you put me off, he insisted, growing excited. For reply, she held out her hand and showed him the ring. He smiled very quietly. He stared at her with darkening anger. Will you gather the rugs and stools together and put them in that corner, she said. He turned away to do so, but he looked back again and said in low, passionate tones, You never counted me. I was a figure, naught in the counting all along. See, there is a chair that will be in the way, she replied calmly, but she flushed and bowed her head. She turned away, and he dragged an armful of rugs into a corner. When the actors came in, Letty was moving a vase of flowers. While they played, she sat looking on, smiling, clapping her hands. When it was finished, Leslie came and whispered to her, whereon she kissed him unobserved, delighting and exhilarating him more than ever. Then they went out to prepare the next act. George did not return to her till she called him to help her. Her colour was high in her cheeks. How do you know you did not count? she said nervously unable to resist the temptation to play this forbidden game. He laughed, and for a moment could not find any reply. I do, he said. You knew you could have me any day, so you didn't care. Then we're behaving in quite the traditional fashion, she answered with irony. But you know, he said, you began it. You played with me and showed me heaps of things. And those mornings, when I was binding corn, and when I was gathering the apples, and when I was finishing the straw stack. You came then. I can never forget those mornings. Things will never be the same. You have awakened my life. I imagined things that I couldn't have done. Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm so sorry. Don't be. Don't say so. But what of me? What? she asked, rather startled. He smiled again. He felt the situation was a trifle dramatic, though deadly in earnest. Well, said he, you start me off, then leave me at a loose end. What am I going to do? You are a man, she replied. He laughed. What does that mean? he said contemptuously. You can go on which way you like, she answered. Oh, well, he said, we'll see. Don't you think so? she asked, rather anxious. I don't know. We'll see, he replied. They went out with some things. In the hall she turned to him with a break in her voice, saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. He said very low and soft, Never mind, never mind. She heard the laughter of those preparing the charade. She drew away and went in the drawing room, saying aloud, Now I think everything is ready. We can sit down now. After the actors had played the last charade, Leslie came and claimed her. Now, madam, are you glad to have me back? 
that I am, she said. Don't leave me again, will you? I won't, he replied, drawing her beside him. I've left my handkerchief for the dining room, he continued, and they went out together. Mother gave me permission for the men to smoke. You know, said Marie to Tom, I'm surprised that a scientist should smoke. Isn't it a waste of time? Carmen liked me, he said. No, she replied, let science light you. Science does. Ah, but science is nothing without a girl to set it going. Yes, come on. Now don't burn my precious nose. Poor George, cried Alice. Does he want a ministering angel? He was half lying in a big armchair. I do, he replied. Come on, be my box of soothing ointments. My matches are all loose. I'll strike it on my heel, eh? Now rouse up, or I shall have to sit on your knee to reach you. Poor dear, he shall be luxurious. And the dauntless girl perched on his knee. What if I singe your whiskers? Would you set an armada? Oh, oh, pretty, you do look sweet. Doesn't he suck prettily? Do you envy me? he asked, smiling whimsically. Rather. Shame to debar you, he said, almost with tenderness. Smoke with me. He offered her the cigarette from his lips. She was surprised and, and exceedingly excited by his tender tone. He took the cigarette. I'll make a heifer like Mrs. Dawes, she said. Don't call yourself a cow, he said. Nasty thing, let me go, she exclaimed. No, you fit me, don't go, he replied, holding her. But you must have growed. I want great hands. Let go. Let him come and pinch him. What's the matter? asked my sister. He won't let me go. He'll be tired first, Letty answered. Alice was released, but she did not move. She sat with a wrinkled forehead, trying his cigarette. She blew out little tiny whiffs of smoke and thought about it. She sent a small puff down her nostrils and rubbed her nose. It's not as nice as it looks, she said. He laughed at her with masculine indulgence. Pretty boy, she said, stroking his chin. Am I? he murmured languidly. Cheek, she cried, and she boxed his ears. Then, oh, poor thing, she said, and kissed him. She turned round to wink at my mother and at Letty. She found the latter sitting in the old position with Leslie, two in a chair. He was toying with her arm, holding it and stroking it. Isn't it lovely, he said, kissing the forearms, so warm and yet so white. Io, it reminds one of Io. Somebody else talking about heifers, murmured Alice to George. Can you remember, said Leslie, speaking low, that man in Merry May who wanted to bite his wife and taste her blood? I do, said Betty. Have you a strain of wild beast too? Perhaps, he laughed. I wish these folks had gone. Your hair is all loose in your neck. It looks lovely like that, though. Alice, the mocker, had unbuttoned the cuff of the thick wrist that lay idly on her knee, and had pushed his sleeve a little way. Ah, she said, what a pretty arm, brown as an overbaked loaf. He watched her smiling. Hard as a brick, she added. You like it, he drawled. No, she said emphatically, in a tone that meant yes. Makes me feel shivery. He smiled again. She superposed her tiny, pale, flower-like hands on his. He lay back, looking at them curiously. Do you feel as if your hands were full of silver? she asked, almost wistfully, mocking. Better than that, he replied gently. And your heart full of gold? she mocked. Of hell, he replied briefly. Alice looked at him searchingly. And am I like a blue bottle buzzing in your window to keep your company? she asked. He laughed. Goodbye, she said, slipping down and leaving him. Don't go, he said, but too late. The eruption of Alice into the quiet, sentimental party was like taking a bright light into a sleeping hen roost. Everybody jumped up and wanted to do something. They cried out for a dance. Emily, play a waltz. You won't mind, will you, George? What, you don't dance, Tom? Oh, Marie. I don't mind, Letty, protested Marie. Dance with me, Alice, said George, smiling, and Cyril will take Miss Tempest. 
Glory! Come on, do or die, said Alice. They began to dance. I saw Letty watching, and I looked round. George was waltzing with Alice, dancing passably, laughing at her remarks. Letty was not listening to what her lover was saying to her. She was watching the laughing pair. At the end she went to George. Why, she said, you can... Did you think I couldn't, he said. You are pledged for a minuet and a valita with me. You remember? Yes. You promise? Yes, but... I went to Nottingham and learned. Why? Because... Very well, Leslie, a mazurka. Will you play it, Emily? Yes, it is quite easy. Tom, you look quite happy talking to the mater. We danced the mazurka with the same partners. He did it better than I expected, without much awkwardness, but stiffly. However, he moved quietly through the dance, laughing and talking abstractedly all the time with Alice. Then Letty cried a change of partners, and they took their valita. There was a little triumph in his smile. Do you congratulate me? he said. I am surprised, she answered. So am I, but I congratulate myself. Do you? Well, so do I. Thanks, you're beginning at last. What? she asked. To believe in me. Don't begin to talk again, she pleaded sadly. Nothing vital. You like dancing with me? he asked. Now be quiet, that's real, she replied. By heaven, Letty, you make me laugh. Good bye, she said. What if you married Alice soon? I? Alice? Letty! Besides, I've only a hundred pounds in the world and no prospects whatever. That's why well, I, I shan't marry anybody, unless it's somebody with money. I have a couple of thousand or so of my own. Have you? It would have done nicely, he said, smiling. You're different tonight she said, leaning on him. Am I? he replied. It's because things are altered too. They're settled one way now, for the present at least. Don't forget the two steps this time, said she, smiling, and adding seriously. You see, I couldn't help it. No, why not? Things? I had been brought up to expect it. Everybody expected it. And you're bound to do what people expect you to do. You can't help it. We can't help ourselves. We're all chessmen, she said. Aye, he agreed, but doubtfully. I wonder where it will end, she said. Letty, he cried, and his hand closed in a grip on hers. Don't, don't say anything. It's no good now. It's too late. It's done. And what is done is done. If you talk any more, I shall say I'm tired and stop the dance. Don't say another word. He did not, at least to her. Their dance came to an end. Then he took Marie, who talked winsomely to him. As he waltzed with Marie, he regained his animated spirits. He was very lively the rest of the evening, quite astonishing and reckless. At supper he ate everything and drank much wine. Have some more turkey, Mr. Saxton. Thanks, but give me some of that stuff in brown jelly, will you? It's new to me. Have some of this trifle, Georgie. I will. You are a jewel. So will you be a yellow topaz tomorrow? Ah, tomorrow's tomorrow. After supper was over, Alice cried, Georgie, dear, have you finished? Don't die the death of a king, King John. I can't spare you, pet. Are you so fond of me? I am. Oh, I'd throw my best Sunday hat under a milk cart for you, I would. No, throw yourself into the milk cart some Sunday when I'm driving. Yes, come and see us, said Emily. How oh, nice. Tomorrow you won't want me, Georgie, dear, so I'll come. Don't you wish Pa would make Tony Bungay? Wouldn't you marry me then? I would, said he. When the cart came, and Alice, Maidy, Tom, and Will departed, Alice bade Letty a long farewell, blew Georgie many kisses, promised to love him faithful and true, and was gone. George and Emily lingered a short time. Now the room seemed empty and quiet, and all the laughter seemed to have gone. The conversation dribbled away. There was an awkwardness. Well, said George heavily at last, today is nearly gone. It will soon be tomorrow. I feel a bit drunk. We had a good time tonight. I am glad, said Letty. They put on their clogs and leggings and wrapped themselves up and stood in the hall. 
We must go, said George, before the clock strikes, like Cinderella. Look at my glass slippers. He pointed to his clogs. Midnight and rags and fleeing, very appropriate. I shall call myself Cinderella who wouldn't fit. I believe I'm a bit drunk. The world looks funny. We looked out of the haunting wanness of the hills beyond Nethermere. Goodbye, Letty. Goodbye. They were out in the snow, which peered pale and eerily from the depths of the black wood. Goodbye, he called out of the darkness. Leslie slammed the door and drew Letty away into the drawing room. The sound of his low, vibrating satisfaction reached us as he murmured to her and laughed low. Then he kicked the door of the room shut. Letty began to laugh and mock and talk in a high-strained voice. The sound of their laughter mingled was strange and incongruous. Then her voice died down. Marie sat at the little piano, which was put in the dining room, strumming and tinkling the false, quavering old notes. It was a depressing jingling in the deserted remains of the feast, but she felt sentimental and enjoyed it. This was a gap between today and tomorrow, a dreary gap, where one sat and looked at the dreary comedy of yesterdays and the grey tragedies of dawning tomorrows, vacantly, missing the poignancy of an actual today. The cart returned. Leslie, Leslie, John is here. Come along, called Marie. There was no answer. Leslie, John is waiting in the snow. All right, but you must come at once. He went to the door and spoke to him. Then he came out looking rather sheepish and rather angry at the interruption. Letty followed, tidying her hair. She did not laugh and look confused, as most girls do on similar occasions. She seemed very tired. At last, Leslie tore himself away, and after more returns for a farewell kiss, mounted the carriage, which stood in a pool of yellow light, blurred and splotched with shadows, and drove away, calling something about tomorrow. End of Part 1, Chapter 9Part two, chapter one of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part two, chapter one. Strange blossoms and a strange new budding. Winter lay a long time prostrate on the earth. The men in the mines of Tempest, Worrell and Co. came out on strike on a question of the rearranging of the working system down below. The distress was not awful, for the men were on the whole wise and well-conditioned. But there was a dejection over the face of the countryside, and some suffered keenly. Everywhere, and on the lanes and in the streets, loitered gangs of men, unoccupied and spiritless. Week after week went on, and the agents of the miners' union held great meetings, and the ministers held prayer meetings, but the strike continued. There was no rest. Always the crier's bell was ringing in the street. Always the servants of the company were delivering handbills, stating the case clearly. And always the people talked and filled the months with bitter and then hopeless resenting. Schools gave breakfasts. Chapels gave soup. Well-to-do people gave teas. The children enjoyed it. But we, who knew the faces of the old men and the privations of the women, breathed a cold, disheartening atmosphere of sorrow and trouble. Determined poaching was carried on in the squire's woods and warrens. Annabel defended his game heroically. One man was at home with a leg supposed to be wounded by a fall on the slippery roads, but really by a man-trap in the woods. Then Annabel caught two men, and they were sentenced to two months' imprisonment. On both the lodge gates of Highclose, on our side and on the far Eberwich side, were posted notices that trespassers on the drive or in the grounds would be liable to punishment. These posters were soon muddied over, and fresh ones fixed. The men loitering on the road by Nethermere looked angrily at Letty as she passed, in her black furs which Leslie had given her, and their remarks were pungent. She heard them, and they burned in her heart. From my mother she inherited democratic views, which she now proceeded to debate warmly with her lover. 
Then she tried to talk to Leslie about the strike. He heard her with mild superiority, smiled, and said she did not know. Women jumped to conclusions at the first touch of feeling. Men must look at the thing all round, then make a decision. Nothing hasty and impetuous. Careful, long thought out, correct decisions. Women could not be expected to understand these things. Business was not for them. In fact, their mission was above business, etc., etc. Unfortunately, Nettie was the wrong woman to, to treat thus. So, said she, with a quiet, hopeless tone of finality. There now, you understand, don't you, Minnie? Ha-ha, my laughing water. So laugh again, darling, and don't worry about these things. We will not talk about them any more, eh? No more. No more, that's right. You are as wise as an angel. Come here. Pooh, the wood is thick and lonely. Look, there is nobody in the world but us. And you are my heaven and earth. And hell? <laughs> if you are so cold, how cold you are. It gives me a little shivers when you look so. And I am always hot, Letty. Well? You are cruel. Kiss me, now. No, I don't want your cheek. Kiss me yourself. Why don't you say something? What for? What's the use of saying anything when there's nothing immediate to say? You're offended. Feels like snow today, she answered. At last, however, winter began to gather her limbs, to rise and drift with saddened garments northward. The strike was over. The men had compromised. It was a gentle way of telling them they were beaten. But the strike was over. The birds fluttered and dashed. The catkins on the hazel loosened their winter rigidity and swung soft tassels. All through the day sounded long, sweet whistlings from the brushes. Then later, loud, laughing shouts of bird triumph on every hand. I remember a day when the breast of the hills was heaving in a last quick waking sigh, and the blue eyes of the waters opened bright. Across the infinite skies of March, great rounded masses of cloud had sailed stately all day, domed with a white radiance, softened with faint fleeting shadows, as if companies of angels were gently sweeping past, adorned with resting silken shadows like those of a full white breast. All day the clouds had moved on to their vast destination, and I had clung to the earth yearning and impatient. I took a brush and tried to paint them, then I raged at myself. I wished that in all the wild valleys where cloud shadows were travelling like pilgrims, something would call me forth from my rooted loneliness. Through all the grandeur of the white and blue day, the poised cloud masses swung their slow flight and left me unnoticed. At evening they were all gone, and the empty sky, like a blue bubble over us, swam on its pale bright rims. Leslie came and asked his betrothed to go out with him under the darkening wonderful bubble. She bade me accompany her, and, to escape from myself, I went. It was warm in the shelter of the wood and in the crouching hollows of the hills, but over the slanting shoulders of the hills the wind swept, whipping the redness into our faces. Give me some of those older catkins, Leslie, said Letty, as we came down to the stream. Yes, those, where they hang over the brook. They are ruddy like new blood freshening under the skin. Look, tassels of crimson and gold. He pointed to the dusty hazel catkins mingled with the alder on her bosom. Then she began to quote Christina Rossetti's A Birthday. I'm glad you came to take me a walk, she continued. Doesn't Strelly Mill look pretty? Like a group of orange and scarlet fungi in a fairy picture. Do you know, I haven't been. No, not for quite a long time. Shall we call now? The daylight will be gone if we do. It is half past five, more. I saw him, the son, the other morning. Where? He was carting mature. I made haste by. Did he speak to you? Did you look at him? No, he said nothing. I glanced at him. He was just the same. Brick colour, solid. Mind that stone, it rocks. I'm glad you've got strong boots on. Seeing that I usually wear them. She stood poised a moment on a large stone, the fresh spring brook hastening towards her, deepening, sidling round her. You won't call and see them, then? she asked. No. 
I like to hear the brook tinkling, don't you? he replied. Ah, yes, it's full of music. Shall we go on? he said, impatient but submissive. I'll catch up in a minute, said I. I went in and found Emily putting some bread into the oven. Come out for a walk, said I. Now, let me tell Mother, I was longing. She ran and put on her long grey coat and her red tam o -shanter. As we went down the yard, George called to me. I'll come back, I shouted. He came to the crew yard gate to see us off. When we came out onto the path, we saw Letty standing on the top bar of the stile, balancing with her hand on Leslie's head. She saw us, she saw George, and she waved to us. Leslie was looking up at her anxiously. She waved again, then we could hear her laughing and telling him excitedly to stand still and steady her while she turned. She turned round and leaped with a great flutter, like a big bird launching, down from the top of the stile to the ground and into his arms. Then we climbed the steep hillside, sunny bank that had once shone yellow with wheat, and now waved black tattered ranks of thistles where the rabbits ran. We passed the little cottages in the hollow scooped out of the hill, and gained the highlands that looked out over Leicestershire to Charmwood on the left, and away into the mountain knob of Derbyshire straight in front and towards the right. The upper road is all grassy, fallen into long disuse. It used to lead from the abbey to the hall, but now it ends blindly on the hillbrow. Halfway along is the old White House farm, with its green mountain steps mouldering outside. Ladies have mounted here and ridden towards the Vale of Beaver, but now a labourer holds the farm. We came to the quarries and looked in at the lime kilns. Let us go right into the wood, out of the quarry, said Leslie. I have not been since I was a little lad. It is trespassing, said Emily. We don't trespass, he replied grandiloquently. So we went along by the hurrying brook, which fell over little cascades in its haste, never looking once at the primroses that were glimmering all along its banks. We turned aside and climbed the hill through the woods. Velvety green sprigs of dog mercury were scattered on the red soil. We came to the top of a slope where the wood thinned. As I talked to Emily, I became dimly aware of a whiteness over the ground. She exclaimed with surprise, and I found that I was walking, in the first shades of twilight, over clumps of snowdrops. The hazels were thin, and only here and there an oak tree uprose. All the ground was white with snowdrops, like drops of manna scattered over the red earth on the grey-green clusters of leaves. There was a deep little dell, sharp sloping like a cup, and white sprinkling of flowers all the way down, with white flowers showing pale among the first inpouring of shadow at the bottom. The earth was red and warm, pricked with the dark, succulent green of bluebell sheaths, and embroidered with grey-green clusters of spears and many white flowerets. High above, above the light tracery of hazel, the weird oaks tangled in the sunset. Below, in the first shadows, drooped hosts of little white flowers, so silent and sad. It seemed like a holy communion of pure wild things, numberless, frail, and folded meekly in the evening light. Other flower companies are glad, stately barbaric hordes of bluebells, merry-headed cowslip groups, even light tossing wood anemones. But snowdrops are sad and mysterious. They have lost their meaning. They do not belong to us who ravished them. The girls bent among them, touching them with their fingers, and symbolising the yearning which I felt. Folded in the twilight, these conquered flowerets are sad like forlorn little friends of dryads. What do they mean, do you think? said Letty in a low voice, as her white fingers touched the flowers and her black furs fell on them. Well, not so many this year, said Leslie. They remind me of mistletoe, which is never ours, though we wear it, said Emily to me. What do you think they say? What do they make you think, Cyril? Letty repeated. I don't know. Emily says they belong to some old, wild, lost religion. They were the symbol of tears, perhaps, to some strange-hearted druid folk before us. More than tears, said Letty, more than tears, they're so still. 
something out of an old religion that we have lost. They make me feel afraid. What should you have to fear? asked Leslie. If I knew, I shouldn't fear, she answered. Look at all the snowdrops. They hung in dim, strange flecks among the dusty leaves. Look at them, closed up, retreating, powerless. They belong to some knowledge we have lost, that I have lost, and that I need. I feel afraid. They seem like something in fate. Do you think, Cyril, we could lose things off the earth, like mastodons and those old monstrosities, but things that matter, wisdom? It is against my creed, said I. I believe I have lost something, said she. Come, said Leslie, don't trouble with fancies. Come with me to the bottom of this cup and see how strange it will be with the sky marked with branches like a filigree lid. She rose and followed him down the steep side of the pit, crying, Ah, you're treading on the flowers. No, said he, I've been very careful. They sat down together on a fallen tree at the bottom. She leaned forward, her fingers wandering white among the shadowed grey spaces of leaves, plucking, as if it were a right, flowers here and there. He could not see her face. Don't you care for me? he asked softly. You? She sat up and looked at him and laughed strangely. You do not seem real to me, she replied in a strange voice. For some time they sat thus, both bowed and silent. Birds scurred off from the bushes, and Emily looked up with a great start as a quiet sardonic voice said above us, But I've got my eyes if it ain't. It struck me, I heard a cooing, and here's the birds. Come on, sweethearts, it's the wrong place for billing and cooing in the middle of these ear snowdrops. Let's have your names, come on. Clear off, you fool, answered Leslie from below, jumping up in anger. We all four turned and looked at the keeper. He stood in the room of light, darkly, fine, powerful form, menacing us. He did not move, but like some malicious pan, looked down on us and said, Very pretty, pretty. Two and two makes four. Tis true, two and two makes four. Come on, come on out of this here bridal bed and let's have a look at you. Can't you use your eyes, you fool? replied Leslie, standing up and helping Nettie with her furs. At any rate, you can see there are ladies here. Very sorry, sir. You can't tell a lady from a woman at this distance at dusk. Who may you be, sir? Clear out. Come along, Nettie. You can't stay here now. They climbed into the light. Oh, very sorry, Mr. Tempest. When you look down on a man, he never looks the same. I thought it was some young fools come here dallying. Damn you, shut up, exclaimed Leslie. I beg your pardon, Letty. Will you have my arm? They looked very elegant, the pair of them. Letty was wearing a long coat which fitted close. She had a small hat whose feathers flushed straight back with her hair. The keeper looked at them. Then, smiling, he went down the dell with great strides and returned, saying, Well, the lady might as well take her gloves. He took them from him, shrinking to Leslie. Then she started and said, Let me fetch my flowers. She ran for the handful of snowdrops that lay among the roots of the trees. We all watched her. Sorry I made such a mistake. A lady, said Hannibal. But I've nearly forgot the sight of one, save the squire's daughters who are never out of minds. I should think you never have seen many unless... Have you ever been a groom? No groom but a bridegroom, sir. And then I think I'd rather groom a horse than a lady, for I got well bit, if you'll excuse me, sir. And you deserved it, no doubt. I got it, and I wish you better look, sir. Once more a man here in the wood, though, than in my lady's parlour, it strikes me. A lady's parlour? laughed Leslie, indulgent in his amusement of the facetious keeper. Oh, yes, will you walk into my parlour? A very smart for a keeper. Oh, yes, sir, I was once a ladies' man, but I'd rather watch the rabbits and the birds, and it's easier breeding brats in the kennels than in the town. They're yours, are they? said I. You know them, do you, sir? Aren't they a lovely little litter? Aren't they a pretty bag of ferrets? Natural as weasels, that's what I said they should be. Put up like a bunch of young foxes to run as they would. Emily had joined Letty, and they kept aloof from the man they instinctively hated. 
They'll get nicely trapped one of these days, said I. Oh, they're natural. They can fend for themselves like wild bees do, he replied, grinning. You're not doing your duty, it strikes me, put in Leslie sententiously. The man laughed. Duties of parents. Tell me I've need of it. I've nine, that is, eight and one not four off. She breeds well, the old lass. One every two years, nine, fourteen years. Done well, hasn't she? You've done pretty badly, I think. I? Why? It's natural. When a man's more than nature, he's a devil. Be a good animal, says I, whether it's man or woman. You, sir, are a good natural male animal. The lady there, a female one. That's proper as long as you enjoy it. And what then? Do as the animals do. I watch me brats, I let them grow. The beauties they are. Sound as a young ash pole, every one. They shan't learn to dirty themselves with smirking deviltry. Not if I can help it. They can be like birds, or weasels, or vipers, or squirrels. So long as they ain't human rot, that's what I say. It's one way of looking at things, said Leslie. Aye, look at the women looking at us. I'm something between a bull and a couple of worms took together, I am. See that spink? He raised his voice for the girls to hear. Pretty, isn't he? What for? And for what do you wear a fancy vest and twist your moustache, sir? What for at the bottom? Ha! Tell a woman not to come in a wood till she can look at natural things. She might see something. Good night, sir. He marched off into the darkness. Coarse fellow, that, said Leslie, when he had rejoined Letty. But he's a character. He makes you shudder, she replied. But yet you are interested in him. I believe he has a history. He seems to lack something, said Emily. I thought him rather a fine fellow, said I. Splendidly built fellow, but callous. No soul, remarked Leslie, dismissing the question. No, assented Emily. No soul, and among the snowdrops. But it was thoughtful, and I smiled. It was a beautiful evening, still with red shaken clouds in the west. The moon in heaven was turning wistfully back to the east. Dark purple woods lay around us, painting out the distance. The near, wild, ruined land looked sad and strange under the pale afterglow. The turf path was fine and springy. Let us run, said Letty, and joining hands we raced wildly along with a flutter and a breathless laughter till we were happy and forgetful. When we stopped, we exclaimed at once, Hark! A child, said Letty. At the kennels, said I. We hurried forward. From the house came the mad yelling and yelping of children, and the wild, hysterical shouting of a woman. Thou little devil, thou little devil, thou shunner, thou, thou shunner. This was accompanied by the hollow sound of blows and a pandemonium of howling. We rushed in and found the woman in a tousled frenzy, belabouring a youngster with an enamelled pan. The lad was rolled up like a young hedgehog. The woman held him by the foot, and like a flail came the hollow utensil thudding on his shoulders and back. He lay in the firelight and howled, while, scattered in various groups with the leaping firelight twinkling over their tears and their open mouths, were the other children, crying too. The mother was in a state of hysteria. Her hair streamed over her face, and her eyes were fixed in a stare of overwrought irritation. Up and down went her long arm like a windmill sail. I ran and held it. When she could hit no more, the woman dropped the pan from her nerveless hand and staggered, trembling, to the squab. She looked desperately weary and fordone. She clasped and unclasped her hands continually. Emily hushed to the children, while Letty hushed to the mother, holding her hard, cracked hands as she swayed to and fro. Gradually the mother became still and sat staring in front of her. Then aimlessly she began to finger the jewels on Letty's finger. Emily was bathing the cheek of a little girl, who lifted up her voice and wept loudly when she saw the speck of blood on the cloth. But presently she became quiet too, and Emily could empty the water from the late instrument of castigation, and at last light the lamp. I found Sam under the table in a little heap. I put out my hand for him, and he wriggled away like a lizard into the passage. After a while I saw him in a corner, lying whimpering with little savage cries of pain. I cut off his retreat and captured him, 
bearing him struggling into the kitchen. Then, weary with pain, he became passive. We undressed him and found his beautiful white body all discoloured with bruises. The mother began to sob again with a chorus of babies. The girls tried to, to soothe the weeping while I rubbed butter into the silent, wincing boy. Then his mother caught him in her arms and kissed him passionately and cried with abandon. The boy let himself be kissed. Then he too began to sob till his little body was all shaken. They folded themselves together, the poor dishevelled mother and the half-naked boy, and wept themselves still. Then she took him to bed, and the girls helped the other little ones into their nightgowns, and soon the house was still. I canna manage them, I canna, said the mother mournfully. They're grown beyond me. I don't know what to do with them. I never ran does he lift to help me. No, he cares not a thing for me, not a thing. Now but makes a mock and a sludge of me. Ah, oh, baby, cried Betty, setting the bonny boy on his feet and holding up his trailing nightgown behind him. Do you want to walk to your mother? Go then. <laughs> the child, a handsome little fellow of some sixteen months, toddled across to his mother, waving his hands as he went, and laughing, while his large hazel eyes glowed with pleasure. His mother caught him, pushed the silken brown hair back from his forehead, and laid his cheek against hers. Ah, she said, I've got a funny dad, that has, not like another man, no, my ducky. He's got no heart to care for nobody, he has na, my pigeon. No, lives like a stranger to his own flesh and blood. The girl with the wounded cheek had found comfort in Leslie. She was seated on his knee, looking at him with solemn blue eyes, her solemnity increased by the quaint round head, whose black hair was cut short. It's my job, yes it is, and our Sam says it isn't, and he takes it and marks it all gone, so I wouldn't give it to him. She clutched in her fat little hand a piece of red chalk. Me dad gin it me, to mark me dolly's face red, not only wood, I'll show you. She wriggled down, and holding up her trailing gown with one hand, trotted to a corner piled with a child's rubbish, and hauled out a hideous carven caricature of a woman, and brought it to Leslie. The face of the object was streaked with red. Here she is, my dolly, what my dad made me. Her name's Lady Mima. Is it, said Letty, and are these her cheeks? She's not pretty, is she? Um, she is. My dad says she is, like a lady. And he gave you her rouge, did he? Rouge, she nodded. And you wouldn't let Sam have it? No, and my mother says, don't give it to him, and he bite me. What would your father say? Me dad? He'd no but laugh, put in the mother, and say as a bite's better than a kiss. Brute, said Leslie feelingly. No, but he never laid a finger on her, nor on me neither. But he's not like another man, never tells you an out. He's more a stranger to me this day than he were the day I first set eyes on him. Where was that? asked Letty. When I were a lass at the hall, and him a new man come. Fair a gentleman and all and all. And even I can read and talk like a gentleman. But he tells me nothing. Oh no, what I am in his eyes, but a sludge bump. He is above me, he is, and above his own child. God a mercy, he'll be in in a minute. Come on here. Passed the children to bed, swept the litter into a corner, and began to lay the table. The cloth was spotless, and she put him a silver spoon in the saucer. We had only just got out of the house when he drew near. I saw his massive figure in the doorway, and the big prolific woman move subserviently about the room. Hello, Proserpini, and visitors. I never asked them. They come in here and the children crying. I never encouraged them. He hurried away into the night. Ah, it's always the woman bears the burden, said Letty bitterly. If he'd helped her, wouldn't she have been a fine woman now? Splendid! But she's dragged to bits. Men are brutes, and marriage just gives scope to them, said Emily. Oh, you wouldn't take that as a fair sample of marriage, replied Leslie. Think of you and me, Minnie Ha Ha. Hi. Oh, I meant to tell you, what do you think of Grey Mead Old Vicarage for us? It's a lovely old place, exclaimed Letty, and we passed out of hearing. We stumbled over the rough path. 
The moon was bright, and we stepped apprehensively on the shadows thrown from the trees, for they lay so black and substantial. Occasionally a moonbeam would trace out a suave white branch that the rabbits had gnawed quite bare in the hard winter. We came out of the woods into the full heavens. The northern sky was full of a gush of green light. In front, eclipsed Orion leaned over his bed, and the moon followed. When the northern lights are up, said Emily, I feel so strange, half eerie. They do fill you with awe, don't they? Yes, said I. They make you wonder and look and expect something. What do you expect? She said softly and looked up and saw me smiling and she looked down again, biting her lips. When we came to the parting of the roads, Emily begged them just to step into the mill just for a moment and Letty consented. The kitchen window was uncurtained and the blind, as usual, was not drawn. We peeped in through the cords of budding honeysuckle. George and Alice were sitting at the table playing chess. The mother was mending a coat, and the father, as usual, was reading. Alice was talking quietly, and George was bent on the game. His arms lay on the table. We made a noise at the door and entered. George rose heavily, shook hands, and sat down again. Hello, Letty Birdsell, you are a stranger, said Alice. Are you so much engaged? Aye, we don't see much of her nowadays added the father in his jovial way. And isn't she a toff in her fine hat and furs and snowdrops? Look at her, George. You never look to see what a toff she is. He raised his eyes and looked at her apparel and at her flowers, but not at her face. Aye, she is fine, he said, and returned to the chess. We've been gathering snowdrops, said Letty, fingering the flowers in her bosom. They are pretty. Give me some, will you? said Alice, holding out her hand. Letty gave her the flowers. Check, said George deliberately. Get out, replied his opponent. I've got some snowdrops. Don't they snoop me, an innocent little soul like me? Letty won't wear them. She's not meek and mild and innocent like me. Do you want some? If you like. What for? To make you pretty, of course, and to show you an innocent little meekling. You're in check, he said. Where can you wear them? There's only your shirt. Or... There. She stuck a few flowers in his ruffled black hair. Look, Letty, isn't he sweet? Letty laughed with a strained little laugh. He's like Bottom and the ass's head, she said. Then I'm Titania. Don't I make a lovely fairy queen, Bully Bottom? And who's jealous Oberon? He reminds me of that man in Hedda Gabler, crowned with vine leaves. Oh, yes, vine leaves, said Emily. How's your mare spraying, Mr. Tempest? George asked, taking no notice of the flowers in his hair. Oh, she'll soon be all right, thanks. Ah, George told me about it, put in the father, and he held Leslie in conversation. Am I in check, George? said Alice, returning to the game. She knitted her brows and cogitated. Pooh, she said, that's soon remedied. She moved her piece and said triumphantly, Now, sir. He surveyed the game, and with deliberation moved. Alice pounced on him. With a leap of her night, she called, Check! I didn't see it. You may have the game now, he said. Beaten, my boy. Then crow over a woman any more. Stale mate with flowers in your hair? He put his hand to his head and felt among his hair and threw the flowers on the table. Would you believe it? said the mother, coming into the room from the dairy. What? We all asked. Nicky Ben's been and eaten the sile cloth. Yes. When I went to wash it, there sat Nicky Ben gulping and wiping the froth off his whiskers. George laughed loudly and heartily. He laughed till he was tired. Letty looked and wondered when he would be done. I imagine, he gasped, how he'd feel with half a yard of muslin creeping down his throttle. This laughter was most incongruous. He went off into another burst. Alice laughed too. It was easy to infect her with laughter. Then the father began, and in walked Nicky Ben, stepping disconsolately. We all roared again, till the rafters shook. Only Letty looked impatiently for the end. George swept his bare arms across the table, and the scattered little flowers fell, broken to the ground. Oh, what a shame! exclaimed Letty. What? said he, looking round. 
Oh, your flowers. Do you feel sorry for them? You're too tender-hearted, isn't she, Cyril? Always was, for dumb animals and things, said I. Don't you wish you was a little dumb animal, Georgie? said Alice. He smiled, putting away the chessmen. Shall we go, dear? said Letty to Leslie. If you are ready, he replied, rising with alacrity. I'm tired, she said plaintively. He attended to her with little tender solicitations. Have we walked too far? he asked. No, it's not that. No, it's the snowdrops and the man and the children and everything. I feel just a bit exhausted. She kissed Alice and Emily and the mother. Good night, Alice, she said. It's not altogether my fault we're strangers. You know, really, I'm just the same, really. Only you imagine, and then what can I do? She said farewell to George and looked at him through a quiver of suppressed tears. George was somewhat flushed with triumph over Letty. She had gone home with tears shaken from her eyes, unknown to her lover. At the farm, George laughed with Alice. He escorted Alice home to Eberwich. Like a blooming little monkey dangling from two boughs, as she put it, when we swung her along on our arms. We laughed and said many preposterous things. George wanted to kiss her at parting, but she tipped him under the chin and said, Sweet, as one does to a canary. Then she laughed with her tongue between her teeth and ran indoors. He is a little devil, said he. We took the long way home by Greymead and passed the dark schools. Come on, said he, let's go in the Ram Inn and have a look at my cousin Meg. It was half past ten when he marched me across the road and into the sanded passage of the little inn. The place had been an important farm in the days of George's grand-uncle, but since his decease it had declined under the governance of the widow and a man of all work. The old grand-aunt was propped and supported by a splendid granddaughter. The near kin of Meg were all in California, so she, a bonny, delightful girl of twenty-four, stayed near her grandma. As we tramped grittily down the passage, the red head of Bill poked out of the bar, and he said as he recognised George, Good evening. Go forward. There's none about yet. We went forward and unlatched the kitchen door. The great aunt was seated in her little round-backed armchair, sipping her nightcap. Well, George, my lad, she cried in her querulous voice, that never says it's thy head as to. I'm coming for some for sure. Else what brings thee to see me? No, he said, I'm come to see thee. Now tells. Where's Meg? Ha, 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 me, did to say? Come to see me? Ha, where's Meg? And who's this young gentleman? I was formally introduced and shook the clammy, corded hand of the old lady. That looks delicate, she observed, shaking her cap at its scarlet geranium sadly. Come now, sit thee down, and don't look so long with the leg. I sat down on the sofa on the cushions covered with blue and red checks. The room was very hot, and I stared about uncomfortably. The old lady sat paring at nothing in reverie. She was a hard-visaged, bosomless dame, clad in thick black cloth-like armour, and wearing an immense twisted gold brooch in the lace at her neck. We heard heavy, quick footsteps above. "'That's coming,' remarked the old lady, rousing from her apathy. The footsteps came downstairs, quickly, then cautiously round the bend. Meg appeared in the doorway. She started with surprise, saying, Well, I hear somebody, but I never thought it was you. All colour still flamed into her glossy cheeks, and she smiled in her fresh, frank way. I think I have never seen a woman who has more physical charm. There was a voluptuous fascination in her every outline and movement. One never listened to the words that came from her lips. One watched the ripe motion of those red fruits. Get him a drop of whisky, Meg. You'll have a drop. I declined firmly, but did not escape. Nay, nee, declared the old dame. I shall have none of your nose. Should you like it not? Say the word, and that's at it. I did not say the word. Then game claret, pronounced my hostess. Oh, it's thin bedded stuff to go to the bed on. And claret it was. Meg went out again to see about closing. The grand aunt sighed and sighed again for no perceptible reason but the whisky. 
well, you've come to see me now, she moaned, for you not have a chance next time you come. No, I'm all gone, but me cap. He shook that geraniumed erection, and I wonder what sardonic fate left it behind. And I'm forced to say it, I should be thankful to be gone, she added, after a few sighs. This weariness of the flesh was touching. The cruel truth is, however, that the old lady clung to life like a louse to a pig's back. Dying, she faintly but emphatically declared herself, a bit better, a bit better. I shall be up tomorrow. I should have gone before now, she continued, but for that blessed wench. I cannot bear to think of leaving her. Come, drink up, me lad, drink up. Nay, that nubbit young yet, that nun topped up with a thimbleful. I took whisky in preference to the acrid stuff. Ay, resumed the grand aunt, I cannot go in peace till her's settled, and her's that's tickle or choosing. The right sort hasn't the gumption to axe her. She sniffed and turned scornfully to her glass. George grinned and looked conscious. As he swallowed a gulp of whisky, it crackled in his throat. The sound annoyed the old lady. I might be scared of somebody, she said. I never had six drops of spunk in thee. He turned again with a sniff to her glass. He frowned with irritation, half filled his glass with liquor, and drank again. I dare bet as thou never kissed a wench in thy life, not proper. And he tossed the last drops of her toddy down her skinny throat. Here Meg came along the passage. Come, Grandma, she said. I'm sure it's time as you was in bed. Come on. Sit thee down and drink a drop, Miss. It's not every night as we have company. No, let me take you to bed. I'm sure you must be ready. Sit thee down here, I say, and get thee a drop of port. Come, no argy-bargying. Meg fetched more glasses and a decanter. I made a place for her between me and George. We all had port wine. Meg, naive and unconscious, waited on us deliciously. Her cheeks gleamed like satin when she laughed save where the dimples held the shadow. Her suave, tawny neck was bare and bewitching. She turned suddenly to George as he asked her a question, and they found their faces close together. He kissed her, and when she started back, jumped and kissed her neck with warmth. La lady do de lady tady dare cried the old woman in delight, and she clutched her wine glass. Come on, chink, she cried. All together, chink to him before chinked and drank. George poured wine in a tumbler and drank it off. He was getting excited, and all the energy and passion that normally were bound down by his caution and self-instinct began to flame out. Here, aunt, said he, lifting his tumbler. Here's to what you want, you know. I know there were as spunky as any on them, she cried. The nubble wanted warming up. I see as you're all right. It's a bargain. Chink again, everybody. A bargain, said he, before he put his lips to the glass. What bargain's that? said Meg. The old lady laughed loudly and winked at George, who, with his lips wet with wine, got up and kissed Meg soundly, saying, There it is. That seals it. Meg wiped her face with her big pinafore and seemed uncomfortable. Aren't you coming, Grandma? she pleaded. Eh, that wants to hurry me off. What's the say, George? A deep one, isn't her? Don't go on. Don't be hustled off. Tush, pish, snorted the old lady. Yeah, that a slow one and no mistakes. Get a candle, Meg. I'm ready. Meg brought a brass bedroom candlestick. Bill brought in the money in a tin box and delivered it into the hands of the old lady. Go thy ways to bed now, lad, said she to the ugly, wizened serving man. He sat in a corner and pulled off his boots. Come and kiss me good night, George, said the old woman. And as he did so, she whispered in his ear, whereat he laughed loudly. She poured whisky into her glass and called to the serving man to drink it. Then, pulling herself up heavily, she leaned on Meg and went upstairs. She had been a big woman, one could see, but now her shapeless, broken figure looked pitiful beside Meg's luxuriant form. We heard them slowly, laboriously, climb the stairs. George sat pulling his moustache and half smiling, 
His eyes were alight with that peculiar childish look they had when he was experiencing new and doubtful sensations. Then he poured himself more whisky. I say, steady, I admonished. What for? he replied, indulging himself like a spoiled child and laughing. Bill, who had sat for some time looking at the hole in his stocking, drained his glass, and with a sad, Good night, creaked off upstairs. Presently Meg came down, and I rose and said we must be going. I'll just come and lock the door after you, said she, standing uneasily waiting. George got up. He gripped the edge of the table to steady himself. Then he got his balance, and with his eyes on Meg said, Here. Yeah. He nodded his head to her. Come here. I want to ask this somewhat. She looked at him, half smiling, half doubtful. He put his arm round her, and looking down into her eyes, with his face very close to hers, said, Let's have a kiss. Quite unresisting, she yielded him her mouth, looking at him intently with her bright brown eyes. He kissed her, and pressed her closely to him. I'm going to marry thee, he said. Go on, she replied softly, half glad, half doubtful. I am an all, he repeated pressing her more tightly to him. I went down the passage and stood in the open doorway, looking out into the night. It seemed a long time. Then I heard the thin voice of the old woman at the top of the stairs. Meg, Meg, send him off now. Come on. In the silence that followed, there was a murmur of voices, and then they came into the passage. Good night, my lad. Good luck to thee, cried the voice, like a ghoul from upper regions. He kissed his betrothed, a rather hurried good night at the door. Good night, she replied softly, watching him retreat. Then we heard her shoot the heavy bolts. You know, he began, and he tried to clear his throat. His voice was husky and strangulated with excitement. He tried again. You know, she, she's a clinker. I did not reply, but he took no notice. Damn, he ejaculated. What did I let her go for? walked along in silence. His excitement abated somewhat. It's the way she swings her body and the curves as she stands. It's when you look at her you feel, you know. I suppose I knew, but it was unnecessary to say so. You know, if ever I dream in the night, of women, you know, it's always Meg. She seems to look so soft and to curve her body. Gradually his feet began to drag. When we came to the place where the colliery railway crossed the road, he stumbled and pitched forward, only just recovering himself. I took hold of his arm. Good Lord Cyril, am I drunk? he said. Not quite, said I. No, he muttered. Couldn't be. But his feet dragged again, and he began to stagger from side to side. I took hold of his arm. He murmured angrily, then, subsiding again, muttered with slovenly articulation, I, I feel fit to drop with sleep. Along the dead, silent roadway and through the uneven blackness of the wood, we lurched and stumbled. He was very heavy and difficult to direct. When at last we came to the brook, we splashed straight through the water. I urged him to walk steadily and quietly across the yard. He did his best, and we made a fairly still entry into the farm. He dropped with all his weight on the sofa, and, leaning down, began to unfasten his leggings. In the midst of his fumblings, he fell asleep, and I was afraid he would pitch forward onto his head. I took off his leggings, and his wet boots, and his collar. Then, as I was pushing and shaking him awake to get off his coat, I heard a creaking on the stairs, and my heart sank, for I thought it was his mother. But it was Emily, in her long, white nightgown. She looked at us with great dark eyes of terror and whispered, What's the matter? I shook my head and looked at him. His head had dropped down on his chest again. Is he hurt? she asked, her voice becoming audible and dangerous. He lifted his head and looked at her with heavy, angry eyes. George, she said sharply, in bewilderment and fear. His eyes seemed to contract evilly. Is he drunk? she whispered, shrinking away and looking at me. Have you made him drunk? You? I nodded. I too was angry. Oh, if mother gets up, I must get him to bed. Oh, how could you? 
His sibilant whispering irritated him and me. I tugged at his coat. He snarled incoherently and swore. She caught her breath. He looked at her sharply, and I was afraid he would wake himself into a rage. Upstairs, I whispered to her. She shook her head. I could see him taking heavy breaths, and the veins of his neck were swelling. I was furious at her disobedience. Go at once, I said fiercely. And she went, still hesitating and looking back. I had hauled off his coat and waistcoat, so I let him sink again into stupidity while I took off my boots. Then I got into his feet and, walking behind him, impelled him slowly upstairs. I lit a candle in his bedroom. There was no sound from the other rooms. So I undressed him and got him in bed at last, somehow. I covered him up and put over him the calfskin rug, because the night was cold. Almost immediately he began to breathe heavily. I dragged him over to his side and pillowed his head comfortably. He looked like a tired boy asleep. I stood still. Now I felt myself alone and looked round. Up to the low roof rose the carven pillars of dark mahogany. There was a chair by the bed and a little yellow chest of drawers by the windows. That was all the furniture, save the calfskin rug on the floor. In the drawers I noticed a book. It was a copy of Omar Khayyam that Letty had given him in her Khayyam days, a little shilling book with coloured illustrations. I blew out the candle when I had looked at him again. As I crept onto the landing, Emily peeped from her room, whispering, Is he in bed? I nodded and whispered good night. Then I went home heavily. After the evening at the farm, Letty and Leslie drew closer together. They eddied unevenly down the little stream of courtship, jostling and drifting together and apart. He was unsatisfied and strove with every effort to bring her close to him, submissive. Gradually, she yielded and submitted to him. She folded round her and him the snug curtain of the present, and they sat like children playing a game behind the hangings of an old bed. She shut out all distant outlooks, as an Arab unfolds his tent and conquers the mystery and space of the desert. So she lived gleefully in a little tent of present pleasures and fancies. Occasionally, only occasionally, she would peep from her tent into the outspace. Then she sat poring over books, and nothing would be able to draw her away. Or she sat in her room looking out of the window for hours together. She pleaded headaches. Mother said liver. He, angry like a spoilt child, denied his wish, declared it moodiness and perversity. End of part two, chapter one. Part two, chapter two of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part two, chapter two, A Shadow in Spring. With spring came trouble. The Saxons declared they were being bitten off the estate by rabbits. Suddenly, in a fit of despair, the farmer bought a gun. Although he knew that the squire would not for one moment tolerate the shooting of that manor, the rabbits, yet he was out in the first cold morning twilight banging away. At first he but scared the brutes and brought Annabel on the scene. Then, blooded by the use of the weapon, he played havoc among the furry beasts, bringing home some eight or nine couples. George entirely approved of this measure. It rejoiced him even. Yet he had never had the initiative to begin the like himself, or even to urge his father to it. He prophesied trouble, and a possible loss of the farm. It disturbed him somewhat, to think they must look out for another place, but he postponed the thought of the evil day till the time should be upon him. A vendetta was established between the mill and the keeper, Annabel. The latter cherished his rabbits. Call them vermin, he said. I only know one sort of vermin, and that's the talking sort. So he set himself to thwart and harass the rabbit slayers. It was about this time I cultivated the acquaintance of the keeper. All the world hated him. To the people in the villages he was like a devil of the woods. Some miners had sworn vengeance on him for having caused their committal to jail. 
but he had a great attraction for me, his magnificent physique, his great vigour and vitality, and his swarthy, gloomy face drew me. He was a man of one idea, that all civilization was the painted fungus of rottenness. He hated any sign of culture. I won his respect one afternoon when he found me trespassing in the woods because I was watching some maggots at work in a dead rabbit. That led us to a discussion of life. He was a thorough materialist. He scorned religion and all mysticism. He spent his days sleeping, making intricate traps for weasels and men, putting together a gun, or doing some amateur forestry, cutting down timber, splitting it in logs for use in the hole, and planting young trees. When he thought, he reflected on the decay of mankind, the decline of the human race into folly and weakness and rottenness. Be a good animal, true to your animal instinct, was his motto. With all this, he was fundamentally very unhappy, and he made me also wretched. It was this power to communicate his unhappiness that made me somewhat dear to him, I think. He treated me as an affectionate father treats a delicate son. I noticed he liked to put his hand on my shoulder or my knee as we talked. Yet withal, he asked me questions and saved his thoughts to tell me, and believed in my knowledge like any acolyte. I went up to the quarry woods one evening in early April, taking a look for Animal. I could not find him, however, in the wood, so I left the wild lands and went along by the old red wall of the kitchen garden, along the main road as far as the mouldering church which stands high on a bank by the roadside, just where the trees tunnel the darkness and the gloom of the highway startles the travellers at noon. Great trees growing on the banks suddenly fold over everything at this point in the swinging road, and in the obscurity rots the hall church, black and melancholy above the shrinking head of the traveller. The grassy path to the churchyard was still clogged with decayed leaves. The church is abandoned. As I drew near, an owl floated softly out of the black tower. Grass overgrew the threshold. I pushed open the door, grinding back a heap of fallen plaster and rubbish, and entered the place. In the twilight, the pews were leaning in ghostly disorder. The prayer books dragged from their ledges, scattered on the floor in the dust and rubble, torn by mice and birds. Birds scuffled in the darkness of the roof. I looked up. In the upper well of the tower, I could see a bell hanging. I stooped and picked up a piece of plaster from the ragged confusion of feathers and broken nests and remnants of dead birds. Up into the vault overhead, I tossed pieces of plaster until one hit the bell and it tonged out its faint remonstrance. There was a rustle of many birds like spirits. I sounded the bell again, and dark forms moved with cries of alarm overhead, and something fell heavily. I shivered in the dark, evil-smelling place, and hurried to get out of doors. I clutched my hands with relief and pleasure when I saw the sky above me quivering with the last crystal lights, and the lowest red of sunset behind the u bowls I drank the fresh air that sparkled with the sound of the blackbirds and thrushes whistling their strong, bright notes. I strayed round to where the headstones, from their eminence, leaned to look on the hall below, where great windows shone a yellow light onto the flagged courtyard and the little fish pool. A stone staircase descended from the graveyard to the court, between stone balustrades whose pock-marked grey columns still swelled gracefully and with dignity, encrusted with lichens. The staircase was filled with ivy and rambling roses, impassable. Ferns were unrolling round the big square halting place, halfway down where the stairs turned. A peacock, startled from the back premises of the hall, came flapping up the terraces to the churchyard. Then a heavy footstep crossed the flags. It was the keeper. I whistled the whistle he knew, and he broke his way through the vicious rose boughs up the stairs. The peacock flapped beyond me, onto the neck of an old bowed angel, rough and dark, an angel which had long ceased to sorrowing for the lost Lucy, and had died also. The bird bent its voluptuous neck and peered about. Then it lifted up its head and yelled. The sound tore the dark sanctuary of twilight. 
The old grey grass seemed to stir, and I could fancy the smothered primroses and violets beneath it, waking and gasping for fear. The keeper looked at me and smiled. He nodded his head towards the peacock, saying, Hark at that damn thing! Again the bird lifted its crested head and gave a cry, at the same time turning awkwardly on its ugly legs, so that it showed us the full wealth of its tail, glimmering like a stream of coloured stars over the sunken face of the angel. A proud fool! Look at it! Perched on an angel, too, as if it were a pedestal for vanity. That's the soul of a woman, or oh, it's the devil. He was silent for a time and we watched the great bird moving uneasily before us in the twilight. "'That's the very soul of a lady,' he said. "'The very, very soul. Damn the thing to perch on that old angel. I should like to wring its neck.' Again the bird screamed and shifted awkwardly on its legs. It seemed to stretch its beak at us in derision. Annabel picked up a piece of sod and flung it at the bird, saying, "'Get out, you screeching devil! God!' he laughed. There must be plenty of hearts twisting under here. And he stamped on a grave. When they hear that row. He kicked another sod from a grave and threw at the big bird. The peacock flapped away over the tombs, down the terraces. Just look, he said. The miserable Bruce has dirtied that angel. A woman to the end, I tell you, all vanity and screech and defilement. He sat down on a vault and lit his pipe. But before he had smoked two minutes, it was out again. I had not seen him in a state of perturbation before. The church, said I, is rotten. I suppose they'll stand all over the country like this soon, with peacocks trailing the graveyards. Aye, he muttered, taking no notice of me. This stone is cold, I said, rising. He got up too and stretched his arms as if he were tired. It was quite dark, save for the waxing moon which leaned over the east. It's a very fine night, I said. Don't you notice a smell of violets? Aye, the mood looks like a woman with child. I wonder what time's got in her belly. You, I said, you don't expect anything exciting, do you? Exciting? No, but as exciting as this rotten old place, just rot off. Oh, my God, I'm like a good house built and finished and left to tumble down again with nobody to live in it. Why? What's up, really? He laughed bitterly, saying, Come and sit down. He led me off to a seat by the north door, between two pews, very black and silent. There we sat, he putting his gun carefully beside him. He remained perfectly still, thinking. What's up? he said at last. Why, I'll tell you. I went to Cambridge. My father was a big cattle dealer. He died bankrupt while I was in college, and I never took my degree. They persuaded me to be a parson, and a parson I was. I went a curate to a little place in Leicestershire, a bonny place with not many people, and a fine old church, and a great rich parsonage. I hadn't over much to do, and the rector, he was the son of an earl, was generous. He lent me a horse, and would have me hunt like the rest. I always think of that place where the smell of honeysuckle while the grass is wet in the morning. It was fine, and I enjoyed myself, and did the parish work all right. I believe I was pretty good. A cousin of the rector's used to come in the hunting season, a Lady Christabel, lady in her own right. The second year I was there, she came in June. There wasn't much company, so she used to talk to me. I used to read then. And she used to pretend to be so childish and unknowing and would get me telling her things and talking to her and i was hot on things we must play tennis together and ride together and i must row her down the river she said we were in the wilderness and could do as we liked she made me wear flannels and soft clothes she was very fine and frank and unconventional ripping i thought her all the summer she stopped on I should meet her in the garden early in the morning when I came from a swim in the river. It was cleared and deepened on purpose. And she'd blush and make me walk with her. I can remember I used to stand and dry myself on the bank, full where she might see me. I was mad on her. And she was madder on me. 
We went to some caves in Derbyshire once, and she would wander from the rest and loiter, and for a game we played a sort of hide-and-seek with the party. They thought we'd gone, and they went and locked the door. Then she pretended to be frightened, and clung to me, and said what would they think, and hid her face in my coat. I took her, and kissed her, and we made it up properly. I found out afterwards, she actually told me, she got the idea from a sloppy French novel, the romance of a poor young man. I was the poor young man. We got married. She gave me a living she had in her parsonage, and we went to live at her hall. She wouldn't let me out of her sight. Lord, we were an infatuated couple, and she would choose to view me in an aesthetic light. I was Greek statues for her, bless you. Croton, Hercules, I don't know what. She had her own way too much. I let her do as she liked with me. Then, gradually, she got tired. It took her three years to be really glutted with me. I had a physique then. For that matter, I have now. He held out his arm to me and bade me try his muscle. I was startled. The hard flesh almost filled his sleeve. Ah, he continued, you don't know what it is to have the pride of a body like mine. But she wouldn't have children. No, she wouldn't. Said she daren't. That was the root of the difference at first. But she cooled down, and if you don't know the pride of my body, you'd never know my humiliation. I tried to remonstrate, and she looked simply astounded at my cheek. I never got over that amazement. She began to get solely. A poet got hold of her, and she began to affect Burn Jones, or Waterhouse. It was Waterhouse. She was a lot like one of his women. Lady of Charlotte, I believe. At any rate, she got solely, and I was her animal. Son animal, son boeuf. I put up with that for above a year. Then I got some servants' clothes, and went. I was seen in France, then in Australia, though I never left England. I was supposed to have died in the bush. She married a young fellow. Then I was proved to have died, and I read a little obituary notice on myself in a woman's paper she subscribed to. She wrote it herself, as a warning to other young ladies of position not to be seduced by plausible, poor young men. Now she's dead. They've got the paper, her paper in the kitchen down there, and it's full of photographs, even an old photo of me, an unfortunate misalliance. I feel somehow as if I were at an end, too. I thought I'd grown a solid middle-aged man. And here I feel sore as I did at twenty-six, and I talk as I used to. One thing, I have got some children, and they're of a breed as you'd not meet anywhere. I was a good animal before anything, and I've got some children. He sat looking up where the big moon swam through the black branches of the yew. So she's dead, your poor peacock, I murmured. Got up, looking always at the sky, and stretched himself again. He was an impressive figure, massed in blackness against the moonlight, with his arms outspread. I suppose, he said, it wasn't all her fault. A white peacock, we will say, I suggested. He laughed. Go home by the top road, will you, he said. I believe there's something on in the bottom wood. All right, I answered with a quiver of apprehension. Yes, she was fair enough, he muttered. Aye, said I, rising. I held out my hand from the shadow. I was startled myself by the white sympathy it seemed to express, extended towards him in the moonlight. He gripped it and cleaved to me for a moment. Then he was gone. I went out of the churchyard feeling a sullen resentment against the tousled graves that lay inanimate across my way. The air was heavy to breathe and fearful in the shadow of the great trees. I was glad when I came out on the bare white road and could see the copper lights from the reflectors of a pony cart's lamps and could hear the amiable chit-chat of the hoofs trotting towards me. I was lonely when they had passed. Over the hill, the big flushed face of the moon poised just above the treetops, very majestic and far off, yet imminent. 
I turned with swift, sudden friendliness to the net of elm boughs spread over my head, dotted with soft clusters winsomely. I jumped up and pulled the cool, soft tufts against my face for company, and as I passed, still I reached upward for the touch of this budded gentleness of the trees. The wood breathed fragrantly with a subtle sympathy. The firs softened their touch to me, and the larches woke from the barren winter sleep and put out velvet fingers to caress me as I passed. Only the clean, bare branches of the ash stood emblem of the discipline of life. I looked down on the blackness where trees filled the quarry and the valley bottoms, and it seemed that the world, my own home world, was strange again. Some four or five days after Animal had talked to me in the churchyard, I went out to find him again. It was Sunday morning. The larch wood was afloat with clear, lyric green, and some primroses scattered whitely on the edge under the fringing boughs. It was a clear morning, as when the latent life of the world begins to vibrate afresh in the air. The smoke from the cottage rose blue against the trees and thick yellow against the sky. The fire, it seemed, was only just lighted, and the wood smoke poured out. Sam appeared outside the house and looked round. Then he climbed the water trough for a better survey. Evidently unsatisfied, paying slight attention to me, he jumped down and went running across the hillside to the wood. He's going for his father, I said to myself, and I left the path to follow him downhill across the waste meadow, crackling the blanched stems of last year's thistles as I went, and stumbling in rabbit holes. He reached the wall that ran along the quarry's edge, and was over it in a twinkling. When I came to the place, I was somewhat nonplussed, for, sheer from the stone fence, the quarry side dropped for some twenty or thirty feet, piled up with unmortared stones. I looked round. There was a plain, dark thread down the hillside which marked a path to this spot, and the wall was scored with the marks of heavy boots. Then I looked again down the quarry side, and I saw, how could I have failed to see, stones projecting to make an uneven staircase, such as is often seen in the Derbyshire fences. I saw this ladder was well used, so I trusted myself to it, and scrambled down, clinging to the face of the quarry wall. Once down, I felt pleased with myself for having discovered and used the unknown access, and I admired the care and ingenuity of the keeper, who had fitted and wedged the long stones into the uncertain pile. It was warm in the quarry. There the sunshine seemed to thicken and sweeten. There the little mounds of overgrown waste were aglow with very early dog violets. There the sparks were coming out on the bits of gorse, and among the stones the colt-foot plumes were already silvery. Here was Spring sitting just awake, unloosening her glittering hair, and opening her purple eyes. I went across the quarry, down to where the brook ran murmuring a tale to the primroses and the budding trees. I was startled from my wandering among the fresh things by a faint clatter of stones. What's that young rascal doing? I said to myself, setting forth to see. I came towards the other side of the quarry. On this, the moister side, the bushes grew up against the wall, which was higher than on the other side though piled the same with old, dry stones. As I drew near, I could hear the scrape and rattle of stones and the vigorous grunting of Sam as he laboured among them. He was hidden by a great bush of sallow catkins, all yellow and murmuring with bees, warm with spice. When he came in view, I laughed to see him lugging and grunting among the great pile of stones that had fallen in a mass from the quarry side, a pile of stones and earth and crushed vegetation. There was a great bare gap in the quarry wall. Somehow the lad's labouring earnestness made me anxious, and I hurried up. He heard me, and glancing round, his face red with exertion, eyes big with terror, he called, commanding me, Put him off him! Put him off! Suddenly my heart beating in my throat nearly suffocated me. I saw the hand of the keeper lying among the stones. I set to tearing away the stones, and we worked for some time without a word. Then I seized the arm of the keeper and tried to drag him out, but I could not. Put it off him, whined the lad, working in a frenzy. When we got him out, I saw at once he was dead. 
and I sat down, trembling with exertion. There was a great smashed wound on the side of the head. Sam put his face against his father's and snuffled round him like a dog to feel the life in him. The child looked at me. He won't get up, he said, and his little voice was hoarse with fear and anxiety. I shook my head. Then the boy began to whimper. He tried to close the lips which were drawn with pain and death, leaving the teeth bare. Then his fingers hovered round the eyes, which were wide open, glazed, and I could see he was trembling to touch them into life. He's not asleep, he said, because his eyes is open. Look! I could not bear the child's questioning terror. I took him up to carry him away, but he struggled and fought to be free. Make him get up! Make him get up! He cried in a frenzy, and I had to let the boy go. He ran to the dead man, calling, Father! Father! and pulling his shoulder. Then he sat down, fascinated by the sight of the wound. He put out his finger to touch it, and shivered. Come away, said I. Is it that? he asked, pointing to the wound. I covered the face with a big silk handkerchief. Now, said I, he'll go to sleep if you don't touch him, so sit still while I go and fetch somebody. Will you run to the hall? He shook his head. I knew he would not. So I had told him again not to touch his father, but to let him lie still till I came back. He watched me go, but did not move from his seat on the stones beside the dead man, though I know he was full of terror at being left alone. I ran to the hall. I did not go to the kennels. In a short time I was back with the squire and three men. As I led the way, I saw the child lifting a corner of the handkerchief to peep and see if the eyes were closed in sleep. Then he heard us and started violently. When we removed the covering and he saw the face unchanged in its horror, he looked at me with a look I have never forgotten. A bad business, an awful business, repeated the squire. Bad business. I said to him from the first that the stones might come down when he was going up, and he said he had taken care to fix them. But you can't be sure, you can't be certain, and he'd be about halfway up, I, and the whole wall would come down on him. An awful business it is, is really. Terrible piece of work. They decided at the inquest that the death came by misadventure. But there were vague rumours in the village that this was revenge which had overtaken the keeper. They decided to bury him in our churchyard at Greymead under the beeches. The widow would have it so, and nothing might be denied her in her state. It was a magnificent morning in early spring when I watched among the trees to see the procession come down the hillside. The upper air was woven with the music of the larks, and my whole world thrilled with the conception of summer. The young, pale windflowers had arisen by the wood gale and under the hazels, when perchance the hot sun pushed his way, new little suns dawned and blazed with real light. There was a certain thrill and quickening everywhere, as a woman must feel when she has conceived. A sallow tree in a favoured spot looked like a pale gold cloud of summer dawn. Nearer it had poised a golden fairy busby on every twig, and was voiced with a hum of bees, like any sacred golden bush, uttering its gladness in the thrilling murmur of bees and in warm scent. Birds called and flashed on every hand. They made off exultant with streaming strands of grass or wisps of fleece, plunging into the dark spaces of the wood and out again into the blue. A lad moved across the field from the farm below with a dog trotting behind him. A dog, no, a fussy black-legged lamb trotting along on its toes, with its tail swinging behind. They were going to the mothers on the common, who moved like little grey clouds among the dark growths. I cannot help forgetting, and sharing the sphinx triumph, when he flashes past with a fleece from the bramble bush. It will cover the bedded moss, it will weave among the soft red cow hair beautifully. It is a prize, it is an ecstasy to have captured it at the right moment and the nest is nearly ready. Ah, 
of the thrush's scornful, ringing out his voice from the hedge. He sets his breast against the mud and models it warm for the turquoise eggs, blue, blue, bluest of eggs, which cluster so close and round against the breast, which round up beneath the breast, nestling content. You should see the bright ecstasy in the eyes of a nesting thrush because of the rounded caress of the eggs against her breast. What a hurry the Jenny Wren makes, hoping I shall not see her dart into the low bush. I have a delight in watching them against their shy little wills. But they have all risen with a rush of wings and are gone, the birds. The air is brushed with agitation. There is no lark in the sky, not one. The heaven is clear of wings or twinkling dot. Till the heralds come, till the heralds wave like shadows in the bright air, crying, lamenting, fretting forever. Rising and failing and circling round and round, the slow-waving peewits cry and complain and lift their broad wings in sorrow. They stoop suddenly to the ground, the lapwings. Then in another throb of anguish and protest, they swing up again, offering a glistening white breast to the sunlight, to deny it in black shadow, then a glisten of green, and all the time crying and crying in despair. The pheasants are frightened into cover. They run and dart through the hedge. The cold cock must fly in his haste, spread himself on his streaming plumes, and sail into the wood's security. There is a cry in answer to the peewits, echoing louder and stronger the lamentation of the lapwings, a wail which hushes the birds. The men come over the brow of the hill, slowly, with the old squire walking tall and straight in front. Six bowed men bearing the coffin on their shoulders, treading heavily and cautiously under the great weight of the glistening white coffin. Six men following behind, ill at ease, waiting their turn for the burden. You can see the red handkerchiefs knotted round their throats, and their shirt fronts blue and white between the open waistcoats. The coffin is of new unpolished wood, gleaming and glistening in the sunlight. The men who carry it remember all their lives after the smell of new, warm elm wood. Again a loud cry from the hilltop. The woman has followed thus far, the big, shapeless woman, and she cries with loud cries after the white coffin as it descends the hill, and the children that cling to her skirts weep aloud and are not to be hushed by the other woman, who bends over them, but does not form one of the group. Other crying frightens the birds and the rabbits, and the lambs away there run to their mothers. But the peewits are not frightened. They add their notes to the sorrow. They circle after the white retreating coffin. They circle round the woman. It is they who forever keen the sorrows of this world. They are like priests in their robes, more black than white, more grief than hope, driving endlessly round and round, turning, lifting, falling, and crying always in mournful desolation, repeating their last syllables like the broken accents of despair. The bearers have at last sunk between the high banks and turned out of sight. The big woman cannot see them, and yet she stands to look. She must go home. There is nothing left. They have rested the coffin on the gateposts, and the bearers are wiping the sweat from their faces. They put their hands to their shoulders on the place where the weight has pressed. The other six are placing the pads on their shoulders, when a girl comes up with a jug and a blue pot. The squire drinks first and fills for the rest. Meanwhile the girl stands back under the hedge away from the coffin, which smells of new elm wood. In imagination she pictures the man shut up there in close darkness, while the sunlight flows all outside, and she catches her breast with terror. She must turn and rustle among the leaves of the violets for the flowers she does not see. Then, trembling, she comes to herself and plucks a few flowers and breathes them hungrily into her soul for comfort. The men put down the pots beside her with thanks, and the squire gives the word. The bearers lift up the burden again, and the elm boughs rattle along the hollow white wood, and the pitiful red clusters of elm flowers sweep along it as if they whispered in sympathy. We're so sorry, so sorry. 
always the compassionate buds in their fullness of life bend down to comfort the dark man shut up there. Perhaps, the girl thinks, he hears them and goes softly to sleep. She shakes the tears out of her eyes onto the ground and, taking up her pots, goes slowly down over the brooks. In a while I too got up and went down to the mill, which lay red and peaceful, with the blue smoke rising as winsomely and carelessly as ever. On the other side of the valley I could see a pair of horses nod slowly across the fallow. A man's voice called to them now and again, with a resonance that filled me with longing to follow my horses over the fallow, in the still lonely valley, full of sunshine and eternal forgetfulness. The day had already forgotten. The water was blue and white and dark burnished with shadows. Two swans sailed across the reflected trees with perfect, blithe grace. The gloom that had passed across was gone. I watched the swan with his ruffled wings swell onwards. I watched his slim consort go peeping into corners and under bushes. I saw him steer clear of the bushes to keep full in view, turning his head to me imperiously, till I longed to pelt him with the empty husks of last year's flowers, knapweed and scabious. I was too indolent, and I turned instead to the orchard. There the daffodils were lifting their heads and throwing back their yellow curls. At the foot of each sloping grey old tree stood a family of flowers, some burstened with golden fullness, some lifting their heads slightly to show a modest, sweet countenance, others still hiding their faces, leaning forward pensively from the jaunty grey-green spears. I wished I had their language to talk to them distinctly. Overhead, the trees, with lifted fingers, shook out their hair to the sun, decking themselves with buds as white and cool as a water nymph's breast. I began to be very glad. The colt's foot discs glowed and laughed in a merry company down the path. I stroked the velvet faces and laughed also, and I smelled the scent of black currant leaves, which is full of childish memories. The house was quiet and complacent. It was peopled with ghosts again. But the ghosts had only come to enjoy the warm place once more, carrying sunshine in their arms and scattering it through the dusk of gloomy rooms. End of Part 2 Chapter 2Part 2, Chapter 3 of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 2, Chapter 3 The Irony of Inspired Moments. It happened, the next day after the funeral, I came upon reproductions of Aubrey Beardsley's Atalanta and of the tailpiece Salome and others. I sat and looked, and my soul leaped out upon the new thing. I was bewildered, wondering, grudging, fascinated. I looked a long time, but my mind, or my soul, would come to no state of coherence. I was fascinated and overcome, but yet full of stubbornness and resistance. Letty was out, so, although it was dinner time, even because it was dinner time, I took the book and went down to the mill. The dinner was over. There was the fragrance of cooked rhubarb in the room. I went straight to Emily, who was leaning back in her chair, and put the salome before her. Look, said I, look here. She looked. She was short-sighted and peered close. I was impatient for her to speak. She turned slowly at last and looked at me, shrinking with questioning. Well, I said. Isn't it fearful? She replied softly. No, why is it? It makes you feel... Why have you brought it? I wanted you to see it. Already I felt relieved, seeing that she too was caught in the spell. George came and bent over my shoulder. I could feel the heavy warmth of him. Good Lord, he drawled, half amused. The children came crowding to see, and Emily closed the book. I should be late. Hurry up, Dave. 
and she went to wash her hands before going to school. "'Give it to me, will you?' George asked, putting out his hand for the book. I gave it to him, and he sat down to look at the drawings. When Molly crept near to look, he angrily shouted to her to get away. She pulled a mouth and got her hat over her wild brown curls. Emily came in ready for school. "'I'm going. Good-bye,' she said, and she waited hesitatingly. I moved to get my cap. He looked up with a new expression in his eyes and said, "'Are you going? Wait a bit. I'm coming.' I waited. "'Oh, very well. Good-bye,' said Emily bitterly, and she departed. When he had looked long enough, he got up, and we went out. He kept his finger between the pages of the book as he carried it. We went towards the fallow land without speaking. There he sat down on a bank, leaning his back against a holly tree, and saying, very calmly, "'There's no need to be in any hurry now.' whereupon he proceeded to study the illustrations. "'You know,' he said at last, "'I do want her.' I started at the irrelevance of this remark and said, "'Who?' "'Letty. We've got notice, did you know?' I started to my feet this time with amazement. "'Notice to leave? What for?' "'Rabbits, I expect. I wish she'd have me, Cyril.' "'To leave Strelly Mill?' I repeated. That's it, and I'm rather glad. But do you think she might have me, Cyril? What a shame! Where would you go? And do you lie there joking? I don't. Never mind about the damned notice. I want her more than anything. And the more I look at these naked lines, the more I want her. It's a sort of fine, sharp feeling, like these curved lines. I don't know what I'm saying. But do you think she'd have me? Has she seen these pictures? No. If she did, perhaps she'd want me. I mean, she'd feel it clear and sharp coming through her. I'll show her and see. I've been sort of thinking about it since Father had that notice. It seemed as if the ground was pulled from under our feet. I never felt so lost. And I began to think of her, if she'd have me. But not clear till you showed me those pictures. I must have her if I can, and I must have something. It's rather ghostish to have the road suddenly smudged out, and all the world anywhere, nowhere for you to go. I must get something sure, soon, or else I feel as if I should fall from somewhere and hurt myself. I'll ask her. I looked at him as he lay there under the holly tree, his face all dreamy and boyish, very unusual. You'll ask, Letty, said I. When? How? I must ask her quick, while I feel as if everything had gone, and I was ghostish. I think I must sound rather a lunatic. He looked at me, and his eyelids hung heavy over his eyes, as if he had been drinking, or as if he were tired. Is she at home? he said. No, she's gone to Nottingham. She'll be home before dark. I'll see her then. Can you smell violets? I replied that I could not. He was sure that he could, and he seemed uneasy till he had justified the sensation. So he arose, very leisurely, and went along the bank, looking closely for the flowers. I knew I could. White ones. He sat down and picked three flowers, and held them to his nostrils, and inhaled their fragrance. Then he put them to his mouth, and I saw his strong white teeth crush them. He chewed them for a while without speaking, then he spat them out and gathered more. They remind me of her, too, he said and he twisted a piece of honeysuckle stem round the bunch and handed it to me. "'A white violet, is she?' I smiled. "'Give them to her, and tell her to come and meet me just when it's getting dark in the wood.' "'But if she won't?' "'She will.' "'If she's not at home, come and tell me.' He lay down again with his head among the green violet leaves, saying, "'I ought to work, because it all counts in the valuation, but I don't care.' He lay looking at me for some time. Then he said, I don't suppose I shall have above twenty pounds left when we've sold up, but she's got plenty of money to start with, if she has me, in Canada. I could get well off, and she could have what she wanted. I'm sure she'd have what she wanted. He took it all calmly, as if it were realised. I was somewhat amused. What frock will she have on when she comes to meet me? he asked. 
I don't know. The same as she's gone to Nottingham in, I suppose. A sort of gold-brown costume with a rather tight-fitting coat. Why? I was thinking how she'd look. What chickens are you counting now? I asked. But what do you think I look best in? He replied. You? Just as you are. No, put that old smooth cloth coat on. That's all. I smiled as I told him, but he was very serious. Shan't I put my new clothes on? No, you want to leave your neck showing. He put his hand to his throat and said naively, Do I? And it amused him. Then he lay looking dreamily up into the tree. I left him and went wandering round the fields, finding flowers and birds' nests. When I came back, it was nearly four o'clock. He stood up and stretched himself. He pulled out his watch. Good Lord, he drawled. I've lain there thinking all afternoon. I didn't know I could do such a thing. Where have you been? It's with being all upset, you see. You left the violets. Here, take them, will you? And tell her I'll come when it's getting dark. I feel like somebody else, or else really like myself. I hope I shan't wake up to the other things, you know, like I am always, before then. Why not? Oh, I don't know. Only I feel as if I could talk straight off without arranging, like birds, without knowing what note is coming next. When I was going, he said, Here, leave me that book. It'll keep me like this. I mean, I'm not the same as I was yesterday, and that book will keep me like it. Perhaps it's a bidious bout. I do sometimes have one if something very extraordinary happens. When is getting dark, then? Letty had not arrived when I went home. I put the violets in a little vase on the table. I remembered he had wanted her to see the drawings. It was perhaps as well he had kept them. He came about six o'clock, in the motor-car with Marie. But the latter did not descend. I went out to assist with the parcels. Letty had already begun to buy things. The wedding was fixed for July. The room was soon over-covered with stuffs, table linen, underclothing, pieces of silken stuff and lace stuff, patterns for carpets and curtains, a whole gleaming, glowing array. Letty was very delighted. She could hardly wait to take off her hat, but went round cutting the string of her parcels, opening them, talking all the time to my mother. Look, little woman, I've got a ready-made underskirt. Isn't it lovely? Listen! And she ruffled it through her hands. Shan't I sound splendid? Frou-frou! But it is a charming shade, isn't it? And not a bit bulky or clumsy anywhere. She put the band of the skirt against her waist and put forward her foot and looked down, saying, It's just the right length, isn't it, little woman? And they said I was tall. It was a wonder. Don't you wish it were yours, little? Oh, you won't confess it. Yes, you like to be as fine as anybody. That's why I bought you this piece of silk. Isn't it sweet, though? You needn't say there's too much lavender in it. There it is not. Now, she pleated it up and held it against my mother's chin. It suits you beautifully, doesn't it? Don't you like it, sweet? You don't seem to like it a bit, and I'm sure it suits you. Makes you look ever so young. I wish you wouldn't be so old-fashioned in your notions. You do like it, don't you? Of course I do. I was only thinking what an extravagant mortal you are when you begin to buy. You know you mustn't keep on always. Now, now, sweet, don't be naughty and preachy. Such a treat to go by. You will come with me next time, won't you? Oh, I have enjoyed it, but I wished you were there. Marie takes anything. She's so easy to suit. I'd like to have a good buy. Oh, it was splendid. And there's lots more yet. Oh, did you see this cushion cover? These are the covers I want for that room. Gold and amber. This was a bad opening. I watched the shadows darken further and further along the brightness, hushing the glitter of the water. I watched the golden brightness come upon the west, and thought the rencontre was never to take place. At last, however, Letty flung herself down with a sigh, saying she was tired. "'Come into the dining-room and have a cup of tea,' said Mother. "'I told Rebecca to mash when you came in.' "'All right. Letty's coming up later on, I believe. About half-past eight, he said. "'Should I show him what I've bought?' "'There's nothing there for a man to see. "'I shall have to change my dress, and I'm sure I don't want the fag. "'Rebecca, just go and look at the things I've bought in the other room.' And, Becky, fold them up for me, will you, and put them on my bed? As soon as she'd gone out, Letty said, She'll enjoy doing it, won't she, Mother? That's so nice. Do you think I need dress, Mother? Please yourself. Do as you wish. 
I suppose I shall have to. He doesn't like blouses and skirts of an evening, he says. He hates the belt. I'll wear that old cream cashmere. It looks nice now I've put that new lace on it. Don't those violets smell nice? Who got them? Cyril brought them in. George sent them you, said I. Well, I'll just run up and take my dress off. Why are we troubled with Ben? It's a trouble you like well enough, said Mother. Oh, do I? Such a bother. And she ran upstairs. The sun was red behind Highclays. I kneeled in the window seat and smiled at fate and at people who imagined that strange states are near to the inner realities. The sun went straight down behind the cedar trees, deliberately, and, it seemed as I watched, swiftly lowered itself behind the trees, behind the rim of the hill. I must go, I said to myself, and tell him she will not come. Yet I fidgeted about the room, loath to depart. Then it came down, dressed in white, or cream, cut low round the neck. She looked very delightful and fresh again, with the sparkle of the afternoon's excitement still. I'll put some of these violets on me, she said, glancing at herself in the mirror, and then, taking the flowers from their water, she dried them and fastened them among her lace. Don't Letty and I look nice tonight, she said, smiling, glancing from me to her reflection, which was like a light in the dusky room. That reminds me, I said, George Saxton wants to see you this evening. Whatever for? I don't know. They've got notice to leave their farm, and I think he feels a bit sentimental. Oh, well, is he coming here? He said, would you just go a little way in the wood to meet him? Did he? Oh, indeed. Well, of course I can't. Of course not, if you won't. They're his violets you're wearing, by the way. Are they? Let them stay. It makes no difference. But whatever did he want to see me for? I couldn't say, I assure you. She glanced at herself in the mirror and then at the clock. Let's see, she remarked. It's only a quarter to eight, three quarters of an hour. But what can he want for me for? I never knew anything like it. Startling, isn't it? I observed satirically. Yes. She glanced at herself in the mirror. I can't go out like this. All right, you can't then. Besides, it's nearly dark. It will be too dark to see in the wood, won't it? It will directly. Well, I'll just go to the end of the garden for one moment. Run and fetch that silk shawl out of my wardrobe. Be quick while it's light. I ran and brought the wrap. She arranged it carefully over her head. We went out down the garden path. Letty held her skirts carefully gathered from the ground. A nightingale began to sing in the twilight. We stepped along in silence as far as the rhododendron bushes, now in rosy bud. I cannot go into the wood, she said. Come to the top of the riding. And we went round the dark bushes. George was waiting. I saw at once he was half distrustful of himself now. Letty dropped her skirts and trailed towards him. He stood awkwardly awaiting her, conscious of the clownishness of his appearance. She held out her hand with something of a grand air. See, she said, I have come. Yes, I thought you wouldn't, perhaps. He looked at her and suddenly gained courage. You've been putting white on. You, you do look nice. They're not like... What? Who else? Nobody else, only I... Well, I... I thought about it different, like some pictures. She smiled with a gentle radiance and asked indulgently, And how was I different? Not all that soft stuff. Plainer. But don't I look very nice with all this soft stuff, as you call it? And she shook the silk away from her smiles. Oh, yes, better than those naked lines. You are quaint tonight. What did you want before? To say goodbye? Goodbye? Yes, you're going away, Cyril tells me. I'm very sorry. Fancy horrid strangers at the mill. But then I shall be gone away soon, too. We're all going, you see, now we've grown up. She kept hold of my arm. Yes. And where will you go? Canada? You'll settle there and be quite a patriarch, won't you? I don't know. You're not really sorry to go, are you? No, I'm glad. Glad to go away from us all? I suppose so, since I must. Ah, fate, fate. It separates you whether you want it or not. What? Why, you see, you have to leave. 
I mustn't stay out here. It's growing chilly. How soon are you going? I don't know. Not soon, then. I don't know. Then I may see you again. I don't know. Oh, yes, I shall. Well, I must go. Shall I say good-bye now? That was what you wanted, was it not? To say good-bye? Yes. No, it wasn't. I wanted, I, I wanted to ask you... What? she cried. You don't know, Letty, now the old life's gone, everything, how I want you to set out with it. It's like beginning life, and I want you. What could I do? I could only hinder. What help should I be? I should feel as if my mind was made up, as if I could do something clearly. Now it's all hazy, not knowing what to do next. And if, if you had, what then? If I had you, I could go straight on. Where? Oh, I should take a farm in Canada. Well, wouldn't it be better to get it first to make sure? I have no money. Oh, so you wanted me? I only wanted you. I only wanted you. I would have given you... What? You'd have me. You'd have all me and everything you wanted. That I paid for, a good bargain. No, oh no, George, I beg your pardon. This is one of my flippant nights. I don't mean it like that. But you know it's impossible. Look how I'm fixed. It is impossible, isn't it now? I suppose it is. You know it is. Look at me now and say if it's not impossible. A farmer's wife with you in Canada. Yes, I didn't expect you'd like that. Yes, I see it is impossible. But I've thought about it and felt as if I must have you. Should have you. Yes, it doesn't do to go on dreaming. I think it's the first time, and it'll be the last. Yes, it is impossible. Now I have made up my mind. And what will you do? I shall not go to Canada. You must not. You must not do anything rash. No, I shall get married. You will? Oh, I am glad. I thought you, you were too fond, but you're not. Of yourself, I mean. I'm so glad. Yes, do marry. Well, I shall, since you are... Yes, said Letty, it is best, but I thought that you... She smiled at him in sad reproach. Did you think so? he replied, smiling gravely. Yes, she whispered. They stood, looking at each other. He made an impulsive movement towards her. She, however, drew back slightly, checking him. Well, I shall see you again sometime, so good-bye, he said, putting out his hand. We heard a foot crunching on the gravel. Leslie halted at the top of the riding. Letty, hearing him, relaxed into a kind of feline graciousness, and said to George, I'm so sorry you're going to leave. It breaks the old life up. You said I would see you again. He left her hand in his a moment or two. Yes, George replied. Good night. And he turned away. She stood for a moment in the same drooping, graceful attitude, watching him. Then she turned round slowly. She seemed hardly to notice Leslie. Who was that you were talking to? he asked. He's gone now, she replied irrelevantly, as if even then she seemed hardly to realise it. He has to upset you, his going. Who is it? He, oh, why, it's George Saxon. Oh, him? Yes. What did he want? Huh? What did he want? Oh, nothing. A mere trysting in the interim, eh? He said this laughing, generously passing off his annoyance in a jest. I feel so sorry, she said. What for? Oh, don't let us talk about him. Talk about something else. I can't bear to talk about him. All right, he replied, and after an awkward little pause. What sort of a time had you in Nottingham? Oh, a fine time. You'll enjoy yourself in the shops between now and July. Sometime I'll go with you and see them. Very well. That sounds as if you don't want me to go. Am I already in the way on a shopping expedition, like an old husband? I should think you would be. That's nice of you. Why? Oh, I don't know. Yes, you do. Oh, I suppose you'd hang about. I'm much too well brought up. Rebecca has lighted the hall lamp. Yes, it's grown quite dark. I was here early. You never gave me a good word for it. 
I didn't notice. There's a light in the dining room. We'll go there. They went into the dining room. She stood by the piano and carefully took off the wrap. Then she wandered listlessly about the room for a minute. Aren't you coming to sit down? he said, pointing to the seat on the couch beside him. Not just now, she said, training aimlessly to the piano. She sat down and began to play at random, a memory. Then she did that most irritating thing, played accompaniments to songs with snatches of the air where the voice should have predominated. I say, Letty, he interrupted after a time. Yes, she replied, continuing to play. It's not very interesting. No, she continued to play. Nor very amusing. He did not answer. He bore it for a little time longer, then he said, How much longer is it going to last, Letty? What? That sort of business. A piano. I'll stop playing if you don't like it. It did not, however, cease. Yes, and all this dry business. I don't understand. Don't you? You make me. Then she went on, tinkling away at, If I built a world for you, my dear. I say, stop it, do, he cried. She tinkled to the end of the verse, and very slowly closed the piano. Come on, come and sit down, he said. No, I don't want to. I'd rather have gone on playing. Go on with your damn playing, then, and I'll go where there's more interest. You ought to like it. He did not answer, so she turned slowly round on the stool, opened the piano, and laid her fingers on the keys. At the sound of the chord, he started up, saying, Then I'm going. Very early. Why? she said, through the calm jingle of my ruisim. He stood biting his lips. Then he made one more appeal. Letty. Yes? Aren't you going to leave off and be amiable? Amiable? You're a jolly torment. What upset you now? Nay, it's not I who am upset. Glad to hear it. What do you call yourself? I? Nothing. Oh, well, I'm going, then. Must you? So early tonight? He did not go, and she played more and more softly, languidly, aimlessly. Once she lifted her head to speak, but did not say anything. Look here! He ejaculated all at once, so that she started and jarred the piano. What do you mean by it? She jingled leisurely a few seconds before answering, then she replied, What a worry you are! I suppose you want me out of the way while you sentimentalise over that milkman. You needn't bother. You can do it while I'm here. Or I'll go and leave you in peace. I'll go and call him back for you, if you like. That's what you want. She turned on the piano stool slowly and looked at him, smiling faintly. It's very good of you, she said. Tenched his fists and grinned with rage. You tantalising little... He began, lifting his fists expressively. He smiled. Then he swung round, knocked several hats flying off the stand in the hall, slammed the door, and was gone. Letty continued to play for some time, after which she went up to her own room. Leslie did not return to us the next day, nor the day after. The first day Marie came and told us he had gone away to Yorkshire to see about the new mines that were being sunk there, and was likely to be absent for a week or so. These business visits to the north were rather frequent. The firm of which Mr Tempest was director and chief shareholder were opening important new mines in the other county, as the seams at home were becoming exhausted or unprofitable. It was proposed that Leslie should live in Yorkshire when he was married to superintend the new workings. He at first rejected the idea, but he seemed later to approve of it more. During the time he was away, Letty was moody and cross-tempered. She did not mention George nor the mill. Indeed, she preserved her best, most haughty and ladylike manner. On the evening of the fourth day of Leslie's absence, we were out in the garden. The trees were uttering joyous leaves. My mother was in the midst of her garden, lifting the dusky faces of auriculars to look at the velvet lips, or tenderly taking a young weed from the black soil. The thrushes were calling and clamouring all round. The japonica flamed on the wall as the light grew thicker. The tassels of white cherry blossoms swung gently in the breeze. "'What shall I do, mother?' said Letty, as she wandered across the grass to pick at the japonica flowers. 
What shall I do? There's nothing to do. Well, my girl, what do you want to do? You've been moping about all day. Go and see somebody. Such a long way to Ebowich. Is it? Then go somewhere nearer. Letty fretted about with a restless, petulant indecision. I don't know what to do, she said, and I feel as though I might just as well never have lived at all as waste days like this. I wish we weren't buried in this dead little hole. I wish we were near the town. It's hateful having to depend on about two or three folk for your, your pleasure in life. I can't help it, my dear. You must do something for yourself. What can I do? I can do nothing. And I go to bed. That I won't, with the dead weight of a wasted day on me. I feel as if I do something desperate. Very well, then, said Mother. Do it and have done. Oh, it's no good talking to you. I don't want... She turned away, went to the Laurestinus, and began pulling off it the long red berries. I expected she would fret the evening wastefully away. I noticed all at once that she stood still. There was the noise of a motor car running rapidly down the hill towards Nethermere, a light, quick clicking sound. I listened also. I could feel the swinging drop of the car as it came down the leaps of the hill. We could see the dust trail up among the trees. Letty raised her head and listened expectantly. The car rushed along the edge of Nethermere. Then there was a jar of brakes as the machine slowed down and stopped. In a moment, with a quick flutter of sound, it was passing the lodge gates and whirling up the drive, through the wood, to us. Letty stood with flushed cheeks and brightened eyes. She went towards the bushes that shut off the lawn from the gravelled space in front of the house, watching. A car came racing through the trees. It was the small car Leslie used on the firm's business. Now it was white with dust. Leslie suddenly put on the brakes and tore to a standstill in front of the house. He stepped to the ground. There he staggered a little, being giddy and cramped with the long drive. His motor jacket and cap were thick with dust. Letty called to him, Leslie, and flew down to him. He took her into his arms, and clouds of dust rose round her. He kissed her, and they stood perfectly still for a moment. She looked up into his face. Then she disengaged her arms to take off his disfiguring motor spectacles. After she had looked at him a moment, tenderly, she kissed him again. He loosened his hold of her, and she said in a voice full of tenderness, You're trembling, dear. It's the ride. I've never stopped. Without further words, she took him into the house. How pale you are. See, lie on the couch. Never mind the dust. All right, I'll find you a coat of Cyril's. Oh, mother, he's come all those miles in the car without stopping. Make him lie down. He ran and brought him a jacket, and put the cushions round and made him lie on the couch. Then she took off his boots and put slippers on his feet. He lay watching her all the time. He was white with fatigue and excitement. I wonder if I shall be had up for scorching. I can feel the road coming at me yet, he said. Why were you so headlong? I felt as if I should go wild if I didn't come, if I didn't rush. I didn't know how you might have taken me, Letty, when I said what I did. She smiled gently at him, and he lay resting, recovering, looking at her. It's a wonder I haven't done something desperate. I've been half mad since I said. Oh, Letty, I was a damn fool and a wretch. I, I could have torn myself in two. I've done nothing but curse and rage at myself ever since. I feel as if I'd just come out of hell. You don't know how thankful I am, Letty, that you've not oh, turned against me for what I said. She went to him and sat down by him, smoothing his hair from his forehead, kissing him, her attitude tender, suggesting tears, her movements impulsive, as if with a self-reproach she would not acknowledge, but which she must silence with lavish tenderness. He drew her to him, and they remained quiet for some time, till it grew dark. The noise of my mother stirring in the next room disturbed them. Then he rose, and he also got up from the couch. I suppose, he said, I shall have to go home and get bathed and dressed, though, he added in tones which made it clear he did not want to go, I shall have to get back in the morning. I don't know what they'll say. At any rate, she said, you could wash here. But I must get out of these clothes, and I want a bath. You could. You might have some of Cyril's clothes. The water's hot, I know. 
At all events, you can stay to supper. If I'm going, I shall have to go soon, or they'd not like it if I go in late. They've had no idea I've come. They don't expect me till next Monday or Tuesday. Perhaps you could stay here, and they needn't know. They looked at each other with wide, smiling eyes, like children on the brink of a stolen pleasure. Oh, but what would your mother think? No, I'll go. She won't mind a bit. Oh, but I'll ask her. He wanted to stay far more than she wished it, so it was she who put down his opposition and triumphed. My mother lifted her eyebrows and said very quietly, He'd better go home and be straight. But look how he'd feel. He'd have to tell them. And how would he feel? It's really my fault in the end. Don't be piggling and mean and grundyish, Matryoshka. It is neither meanness nor grundyishness. Oh, he grun, he grun, exclaimed Letty, ironically. He may certainly say if he likes, said Mother, slightly nettled at Letty's jibe. All right, Mutterchen, and be a sweetling, do. Letty went out a little impatient at my mother's unwillingness. But Leslie stayed, nevertheless. In a few moments, Letty was up in the spare bedroom, arranging and adorning, and Rebecca was running with hot water bottles and hurrying down with clean bedclothes. Letty hastily appropriated my best brushes, which she had given me, and took the suit of pyjamas of the thinnest, finest flannel, and discovered a new toothbrush, and made selections from my shirts and handkerchiefs and underclothing, and directed me which suit to lend him. Altogether I was astonished, and perhaps a trifle annoyed, at her extraordinary thoughtfulness and solicitude. He came down to supper, bathed, brushed, and radiant. He ate heartily, and seemed to emanate a warmth of physical comfort and pleasure. The colour was flushed again into his face, and he carried his body with the old, independent, assertive air. I've never known the time when he looked handsomer, when he was more attractive. There was a certain warmth about him, a certain glow that enhanced his words, his laughter, his movements. He was the predominant person, and we felt a pleasure in his mere proximity. My mother, however, could not quite get rid of her stiffness, and soon after supper she rose, saying she would finish her letter in the next room bidding him good-night, as she would probably not see him again. The cloud of this little coolness was the thinnest and most transitory. He talked and laughed more gaily than ever, and was ostentatious in his movements, throwing back his head, taking little attitudes which displayed the broad firmness of his breast, the grace of his well-trained physique. I left them at the piano. He was sitting, pretending to play, and looking up all the while at her, who stood with her hand on his shoulder. In the morning he was up early, by six o'clock downstairs, and attending to the car. When I got down I found him very busy, and very quiet. I know I'm a beastly nuisance, he said, but I must get off early. Rebecca came and prepared breakfast, which we too ate alone. He was remarkably dull and wordless. It's a wonder Letty hasn't got up to have breakfast with you. She's such a one for raving about the perfection of the early morning. It's purity and promises and so forth, I said. He broke his bread nervously and drank some coffee as if he were agitated, making noises in his throat as he swallowed. It's too early for her, I should think, he replied, wiping his moustache hurriedly. Yet he seemed to listen for her. Then his bedroom was over the study where Rebecca had laid breakfast, and he listened now and again, holding his knife and fork suspended in their action. Then he went on with his meal again. When he was laying down his serviette, the door opened. He pulled himself together and turned round sharply. It was Mother. When she spoke to him, his face twitched with a little frown, half of relief, half of disappointment. I must be going now, he said. Thank you very much, Mother. You are a harem scarum boy. I wonder why Lady doesn't come down. I know she's up. Yes, he replied. Yes, I've heard her. Perhaps she's dressing up. I must get off. I'll call her. No, don't bother her. She'd come if she wanted. The mother had called from the foot of the stairs. Letty! Letty, he's going! All right, said Letty. And in another minute she came downstairs. She was dressed in dark, severe stuff, and she was somewhat pale. 
She did not look at any of us, but turned her eyes aside. Goodbye, she said to him, offering him her cheek. He kissed her, murmuring, Goodbye, my love. He stood in the doorway a moment, looking at her with beseeching eyes. She kept her face half averted, and would not look at him, but stood pale and cold, biting her underlip. He turned sharply away with a motion of keen disappointment, set the engines of the car into action, mounted, and drove quickly away. Letty stood pale and inscrutable for some moments. Then she went into breakfast and sat toying with her food, keeping her head bent down, her face hidden. In less than an hour he was back again, saying he had left something behind. He ran upstairs, and then, hesitating, went into the room where Letty was still sitting at table. I had to come back, he said. She lifted her face towards him, but kept her eyes averted, looking out of the window. She was flush. What had you forgotten? she asked. I left my cigarette case, he replied. There was an awkward silence. But I shall have to be getting off. He added. Yes, I suppose you will, she replied. After another pause, he asked, Won't you just walk down the path with me? She rose without answering. He took a shawl and put it round her carefully. She merely allowed him. They walked in silence down the garden. You, are you, are you angry with me? He faltered. Tears suddenly came to her eyes. What did you come back for? she said, averting her face from him. He looked at her. I knew you were angry, and he hesitated. Why didn't you go away? she said impulsively. He hung his head and was silent. I don't see why why you make trouble between us, Letty, he faltered. She made a swift gesture of repulsion, whereupon, catching sight of her hand, she hid it swiftly against her skirt again. You make my hands, my very hands, disclaim me, she struggled to say. He looked at her clenched fist, pressed against the folds of her dress. But, he began, much troubled. I tell you, I can't bear the sight of my own hands, she said in low, passionate tones. But surely, Letty, there's no need, if you love me. She seemed to wince. He waited, puzzled and miserable. And we're going to be married, aren't we? He resumed, looking pleadingly at her. She stirred and exclaimed, Oh, why don't you go away? What did you come back for? You'll kiss me before I go? He asked. She stood with averted face and did not reply. His forehead was twitching in a puzzled frown. Letty, he said. She did not move or answer, but remained with her face turned full away, so that he could see only the contour of her cheek. After waiting a while, he flushed, turned swiftly, and set his machine rattling. In a moment, he was racing between the trees. End of Part 2 Chapter 3Part 2, Chapter 4 of The White Peacock by D. H. Lawrence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 2, Chapter 4 Kiss When She's Ripe for Tears. It was the Sunday after Leslie's visit. We'd had a wretched week with everybody mute and unhappy. Though spring had come, none of us saw it. Afterwards, it occurred to me that I had seen all the ranks of poplars suddenly bursten into a dark crimson glow, with a flutter of blood red where the sun came through the leaves, that I had found high cradles where the swan's eggs lay by the waterside, that I had seen the daffodils leaning from the moss-grown wooden walls of the boathouse, and all, moss, daffodils, water, scattered with the pink scarves from the elm buds, that I had broken the half-spread fans of the sycamore, and had watched the white clouds of slow blossom go silver-grey against the evening sky. But I had not perceived it, and I had not any vivid spring pictures left from the neglected week. It was Sunday evening, just after tea, when Letty suddenly said to me, 
Come with me down to Stradley Mill. I was astonished, but I obeyed unquestioningly. On the threshold we heard a chattering of girls, and immediately Alice's voice greeted us. Hello, Sybil, love. Hello, Letty. Come on, here's a gathering of the goddesses. Come on, you just make us right. You're Juno, and here's Meg. She's Venus, and I'm Pierre, somebody. Who am I? Tell us quick. Did you say Minerva, Sybil, dear? Well, you ought, then. Now, Paris, hurry up. He's putting his Sunday clothes on to take us a walk. Laws, what a time it takes him. Get your blushes ready, Meg. Now, Letty, look haughty, and I'll look wise. I wonder if he wants me to go and tie his tie. Oh, glory, where on earth did you get that antimacassar? In Nottingham, don't you like it? said George, referring to his tie. Hello, Letty, have you come? Yes, it's a gathering of the goddesses. Have you that apple? If so, hand it over, said Alice. What apple? Oh, lum, his education. Paris's apple. Can't you see we've come to be chosen? Oh, well, I haven't got any apple. I've eaten mine. Isn't he flat? He's like boiling magnesia that's done boiling for a week. Are you going to take us all to church, then? If you like. Come on, then. Where's the abode of love? Look at Letty looking shocked. Awfully sorry, old girl. Thought love agreed with you. Did you say love? inquired George. Yes, I did, didn't I, Meg? And you say love as well, don't you? I don't know what it is, laughed Meg who was very red and rather bewildered. Amor est titillatio. Love is a tickling. There, that's it, isn't it, Sybil? How should I know? Of course not, old fellow. Leave it to the girls. See how knowing Letty looks. And, laws, Letty, you are solemn. It's love, suggested George over his new necktie. I'll bet it is de gustasse sat est. Ain't it, Letty? One link's enough, and damned be he that first cries hold enough. Which one do you like? But are you going to take us to the church, Georgie Darley? One by one, or all at once? What do you want me to do, Meg? he asked. Oh, I don't mind. And do you mind, Letty? I'm not going to church. Let's go walk somewhere, and let us start now, said Emily somewhat testily. She did not like this nonsense. There you are, Sib. You've got your orders. Don't leave me behind, wailed Alice. Emily frowned and bit her finger. Come on, Georgie, you look like the finger of a pair of scales between two weights. Which will draw? The heavier, he replied, smiling, and looking neither at Meg or Letty. Then it's Meg, cried Alice. Oh, I wish I was fleshy. I've no chance with Sib against Pem. Emily flashed looks of rage. Meg blushed and felt ashamed. Letty began to recover from her first outraged indignation and smiled. Thus we went a walk, in two trios. Unfortunately, as the evening was so fine, the roads were full of strollers. Groups of three or four men dressed in pale trousers and shiny black cloth coats, following their suspicious little dogs. Gangs of youths slouching along, occupied with nothing, often silent, talking now and then in raucous tones on some subject of brief interest. Then the gallant husbands, in their tail coats, very husbandly, pushing a jingling perambulator, admonished by a much-dressed spouse round whom the small members of the family gyrated. Occasionally, two lovers walking with a space between them, disowning each other. Occasionally, a smartly-dressed mother with two little girls in white silk frocks and much expanse of yellow hair, stepping mincingly, and nearby a father awkwardly controlling his Sunday suit. To endure all this, it was necessary to chatter unconcernedly. George had to keep up the conversation behind, and he seemed to do it with ease, discoursing on the lambs, discussing the breed, when Meg exclaimed, Oh, aren't they black? They might have crept down the chimney. I never saw any like them before. He described how he had reared two on the bottle, exciting Meg's keen admiration by his mothering of the lambs. Then he went on to the peewits, harping on the same string, how they would cry and pretend to be wounded. Just fancy, though and how he had moved the eggs of one pair while he was ploughing, and the mother had followed them, and had even sat watching as he drew near again with the plough, watching him come and go. Well, she knew you, but they do know those who are kind to them. Yes, he agreed. Her little bright eyes seem to speak as you go by. Oh, I do think they're nice little things, don't you, Letty? 
cried Egg in access of tenderness. Letty did, with brevity. We walked over the hills and down into Greymead. Meg thought she ought to go home to her grandmother, and George bade her go, saying he would call and see her in an hour or so. The dear girl was disappointed, but she went, unmurmuring. We left Alice with a friend and hurried home through Selsby to escape the after-church parade. As you walk home past Selsby, the pit stands up against the west, with beautiful tapering chimneys marked in black against the swim of sunset, and the headstocks etched with tall significance on the brightness. Then the houses are squat in rows of shadow at the foot of these high monuments. "'You know, Cyril,' said Emily, "'I have meant to go and see Mrs. Annabel, the keeper's wife. She's moved into Bonsard's Row, and the children come to school. Oh, it's awful!' They've never been to school, and they are unspeakable. What's she gone there for? I asked. I suppose the squire wanted the kennels, and she chose it herself, but the way they live it's fearful to think of. And why haven't you been? I don't know. I've meant to, but... Emily stumbled. You didn't want, and you daren't? Perhaps not. Would you? Ha! Let's go now. There, you hang back. No, I don't she replied sharply. Come on, then, we'll go through the Twitchell. Let me tell Letty. Letty at once declared, No, with some asperity. All right, said George, I'll take you home. But this suited Letty still less. I don't know what you want to go for, Cyril, she said, and Sunday night and everybody everywhere. I want to go home. Where do you go, then? Emily will come with you. Ha! Huh, cried the latter. You think I won't go to see her? I shrugged my shoulders, and George pulled his moustache. "'Well, I don't care,' declared Letty, and we marched down the Twitchell, Indian file. We came near to the ugly rows of houses that back up against the pit hill. Everywhere is black and sooty. The houses are back to back, having only one entrance, which is from a square garden where black speckled weeds grow sulkily, and which looks on to a row of evil little ash-pit huts. The road everywhere is trodden over with a crust of soot and coal dust and cinders. Between the rows, however, was a crowd of women and children, bare heads, bare arms, white aprons and black Sunday frocks bristling with gimp. One or two men squatted on their heels with their backs against a wall, laughing. The women were waving their arms and screaming up at the roof of the end house. Emily and Letty drew back. "'Look there, it's that little beggar Sam!' said George. There, sure enough, perched on the ridge of the roof against the M chimney, was the young imp, coatless, his shirt sleeves torn away from the cuffs. I knew his bright reddish young head in a moment. He got up, his bare toes clinging to the tiles, and spread out his fingers fanwise from his nose, shouting something, which immediately caused the crowd to toss with indignation and the women to shriek again. Sam sat down suddenly, having almost lost his balance. The village constable hurried up, his thin neck stretching out of his tunic, and demanded the cause of the hubbub. Immediately a woman with bright brown squinting eyes and a birthmark on her cheek rushed forward and seized the policeman by the sleeve. "'Take him up! Take him up! And birch him till his bloody bucks roar!' she screamed. The thin policeman shook her off and wanted to know what was the matter. "'I'll smush him like a rotten dater!' cried the woman, "'if I can lay hands on him!' He's not fit to live nowhere where there's decent folks, the thieving, brazen little devil. As she went on. But what's up? interrupted the thin constable. What's up with him? Up? It's him as it up, and let him wait till I get him done, as crafty little. Sam, seeing her look at him, distorted his honest features and overheated her wrath till Letty and Emily trembled with dismay. The mother's head appeared at the bedroom window. She slid the sash back and craned out, vainly trying to look over the gutter below the slates. She was even more dishevelled than usual, and the tears had dried on her pale face. She stretched further out, clinging to the window frame and to the gutter overhead, till I was afraid she would come down with a crash. The men, squatting on their heels against the wall of the ash pit, laughed, saying, "'Nub him, Bull. Can't I see him? Clork him!' And then the pitiful voice of the woman was heard, crying, Come thy ways down, me ducky, come on, only come to my mother. I shall not touch thee. Do thy mother's bidden now. Sam, Sam, Sam! Her voice rose higher and higher. 
Sammy, Sammy, go to thy mammy, jeered the wits below. Shonna to come, shonna to come to thy mother, me ducky. Come on, come thy way doon. Sam looked at the crowd and at the eaves from under which rose his mother's voice. He was going to cry. A big gaunt woman with a family steel comb stuck in her back hair shouted, Thou mun well bend thy face, thy knees to scrape. And aided by the woman with the birthmark and the squint, she reviled him. The little scoundrel, in a burst of defiance, picked a piece of mortar from between the slates, and in a second it flew into fragments against the family steel comb. The wearer thereof declared her head was laid open, and there was general confusion. The policeman, I don't know how thin he must have been when he was taken out of his uniform, lost his head, and he too began branching his fists, spitting from under his sweep's brush moustache, as he commanded in tones of authority, Now then, no more on it. Let's have thee down here, and no more messing about. The boy tried to creep over the ridge of the roof and escape down the other side. Immediately the brats rushed round, yelling to the other side of the row, and pieces of red burnt gravel began to fly over the roof. Sam crouched against the chimney. Got him! yelled one little devil. Got him! Aye, go again! A shower of stones came down, scattering the women and the policemen. The mother rushed from the house and made a wild onslaught on the throws. She caught one and flung him down. Immediately the rest turned and aimed their missiles at her. Then George and the policeman and I dashed after the young wretches, and the women ran to see what happened to their offspring. We caught two lads of fourteen or so and made the policeman haul them after us. The rest fled. When we returned to the field of battle, Sam had gone too. If he hasn't slived off, cried the woman with a squint, but I'll see him locked up for this. At this moment, a band of missioners from one of the chapels or churches arrived at the end of the row, and the little harmonium began to bray, and the place vibrated with the sound of a woman's powerful voice, propped round by several others singing, And even ere the sun was set, everybody hurried towards the new noise, save the policeman with his captives, the woman with the squint, and the woman with the family comb. I told the limb of the law he'd better get rid of the two boys and find out what mischief the others were after. Then I inquired of the woman with the squint what was the matter. Thirty-seven young uns, and we had from that door, and there's no knowing how many more, if they hadn't a gone and eaten her, she replied, lapsing, now her fury was spent into sullen resentment. And never a word should we ha' known, added the family comb brer, but for that blessed cat of horn as scrat it up. Indeed, said I, the rabbit. No, the one out left but the skin. They'd seen to that, a thieving, dirt-eating lot. When was that, said I? This mortal night, and there was the head and the back of the dirty stew-pot. I can show you this instant. I've got him in our pantry for a brew, haven't I, Martha? That lot of good it is, but I'll rip the neck out of him before I lay hands on him. At last, I made out that Samuel had stolen a large lop-eared doe out of a bunch of the coal-house of the squint-eyed lady, had skinned it, buried the skin, and offered his booty to his mother as a wild rabbit trapped. The doe had been the chief item of the animal's Sunday dinner, albeit a portion was unluckily saved till Monday, providing undeniable proof of the theft. The owner of the rabbit had supposed the creature to have escaped. This peaceful supposition had been destroyed by the comb-bearers seeing her cat, scratching in the animal's garden, unearthed the white and brown doe-skin, after which the trouble had begun. The squint-eyed woman was not so hard to manage. I talked to her as if she were some male friend of mine, only appealing to her womanliness with all the soft sadness I could press into the tones of my voice. In the end she was mollified, and even tender and motherly in her feelings towards the unfortunate family. I left on her dresser the half-crown I shrank from offering her, and, having reduced the comb-wearer also, I marched off, carrying the stew-pot and the fragments of the ill-fated dough to the cottage of the widow, where George and the girls awaited me. The house was in a woeful state. In the rocking-chair beside the high guard that surrounded the hearth sat the mother, rocking, looking sadly shaken now her excitement was over. Letty was nursing the little baby, and Emily the next child. George was smoking his pipe and trying to look natural. The little kitchen was crowded. There was no room. There was not even a place on the table for the stew jar. So I gathered together cups and mugs containing tea-sops 
and set down the vessel of ignominy on the much slopped tea cloth. The four little children were striped and patched with tears. At my entrance, one under the table recommenced to weep, so I gave him my pencil, which pushed in and out, but which pushes in and out no more. The sight of the stewpot affected the mother afresh. She wept again, crying, And I never thought as how it were all but a snared one, as if I should set him on to thieve that old door. And if it wasn't all, I am a thief, and me call all the names they could lay their tongues to, and then in my bit of a pantry taking the very pots out. That stewpot as I brought all the way from Nottingham, and I've had it afore our Minnie were born. The baby, the little baby, then began to cry. The mother got up suddenly and took it. Oh, come then, come then, my pet. Why, why cause the shanna? No, the shanna. Yes, he's his mother's least little lad, he is a little un. Hush then, there, there. What's the matter, my little? She hushed the baby and herself. At length she asked, Has the policeman gone as well? Yes, it's all right, I said. She sighed deeply, and her look of weariness was painful to see. How old is your eldest? I asked. Funny, she's fourteen. She's out of service at Webster's. Then Jim, as is thirteen next month. Let's see. Yes, it is next month. He's gone to Flint's, farming. They can't do much, and I shan't let them go into the pit if I can help it. My husband always used to say they should never go in the pit. They can't do much for you. They do what they can, but it's a hard job it is to keep them all going. The Weshing and the Parish Bay and five shilling from the squad, it's hard. It was different when my husband was alive. It ought to have been me as should have died. I don't seem as if I can manage them. They get beyond me. I wish I was dead this minute and him here. I can't understand it. Him as was so capable to be took, and me left. He were a man in a thousand, he were. Full of management like a gentleman. I wish it was me as had been took. And he's restless, because he knows I find it hard. I stood at the door till last night, when they were all asleep, looking out over the pit-pond, and I saw a light, and I knowed it was him, because it were our wedding day yesterday, by the day and the date. And I said to him, Frank, is it thee, Frank? I'm all right. I'm getting on all right. And then he went. He seemed to go over the whimsy and back towards the wood. I know it were him, and he couldn't rest, thinking I couldn't manage. After a while we left, promising to go again, and to see after the safety of Sam. It was quite dark, and the lamps were lighted in the houses. We could hear the throb of the fan-house engines, and the soft whir of the fan. "'Isn't it cruel?' said Emily, plaintively. "'Wasn't the man a wretch to marry the woman like that?' I did let him with decision. "'Speak of Lady Christabel,' said I. And then there was silence. I suppose he did not know what he was doing any more than the rest of us. I thought you were going to your aunt's, to the Ram Inn, said Letty to George when they came to the crossroads. Not now, it's too late, he answered quietly. You will come round our way, won't you? Yes, she said. We were eating bread and milk at the farm, and the father was talking with vague sadness and reminiscence, lingering over the thoughts of their departure from the old house. He was a pure romanticist, forever seeking the colour of the past in the present's monotony. He seemed settling down to an easy, contented middle age, when the unrest on the farm and development of his children quickened him with fresh activity. He read books on the land question and modern novels. In the end, he became an advanced radical, almost a socialist. Occasionally his letters appeared in the newspapers. He had taken a new hold on life. Over supper he became enthusiastic about Canada, and to watch him, his ruddy face lighted up, his burly form straight and nerved with excitement, was to admire him. To hear him, his words of thoughtful common sense, all warm with the young man's hopes, was to love him. At forty-six he was more spontaneous and enthusiastic than George, and far more happy and hopeful. Emily would not agree to go away with them. What should she do in Canada, she said, and she did not want the little ones to be drudges on a farm, in the end to be nothing but cattle. Nay, hey, said her father gently, Molly shall learn the daring, and David will just be right to take to the place when I give up. It'll perhaps be a bit rough and hard at first, but when we've got over it we shall think it was one of the best times, like you do. 
And you, George? asked Etty. I'm not going. What should I go for? There's nothing at the end of it, only a long life. It's like a day here in June, a long work day, pleasant enough, and when it's done, you sleep well. But it's work and sleep and comfort, half a life. It's not enough. What's the odds? I might as well be a flower for mayor. His father looked at him gravely and thoughtfully. Now it seems to me so different, he said sadly. It seems to me you can live your own life and be independent and think as you like without being choked with harassments. I feel as if I could keep on like that. I'm going to get more out of my life, I hope, laughed George. No. Do you know? And here he's turned straight to Letty. Do you know, I'm going to get pretty rich so that I can do what I want for a bit. I want to see what it's like to taste all sides, to taste the towns. I want to know what I've got in me. I'll get rich, or at least I'll have a good try. And pray, how will you manage it? asked Emily. I'll begin by marrying, and then you'll see. Emily laughed with scorn. Let us see you begin. Ah, you're not wise, said the father sadly. Then, laughing, he said to Letty in coaxing, confidential tones, But he'll come out there to me in a year or two. You see if he doesn't. I wish I could come now, said I. If you would, said George, I'd go with you. But not by myself to become a fat, stupid fool like my own cattle. While he was speaking, Jip burst into a rage of barking. The father got up to see what it was, and George followed. Trip, the great bull terrier, rushed out of the house, shaking the buildings with his roars. We saw the white dog flash down the yard. We heard a rattle from the hen-house ladder, and in a moment a scream from the orchard side. We rushed forward, and there on the sharp bank side lay a little figure, face down, and Trip standing over it, looking rather puzzled. I picked up the child. It was Sam. He struggled as soon as he felt my hands, but I bore him off into the house. He wriggled like a wild hare and kicked, but at last he was still. I set him on the hearthrug to examine him. He was a quaint little figure, dressed in a man's trousers that had been botched small for him, and a coat hanging in rags. "'Did he get hold of you?' asked the father. "'Where was it he got hold of you?' The child stood unanswering, his little pale lips pinched together, his eyes staring out at nothing. Emily went on her knees before him and put her face close to his, saying, with a voice that made one shrink from its unbridled emotion of caress, "'Did he hurt you, eh? Tell us where he hurt you.' She would have put her arms round him, but he shrank away. "'Look here,' said Betty. "'It's here, and it's bleeding. "'Go and get some water, Emily, and some rags. "'Come on, Sam, let me look, and I'll put some rags round it. "'Come along.' He took the child and stripped him of his grotesque garments. Tripp had given him a sharp grab on the thigh before he had realised that he was dealing with the little boy. It was not much, however, and Letty soon had it bathed and anointed with elderflower ointment. On the boy's body were several scars and bruises. Evidently he had rough times. Letty tended to him and dressed him again. He endured these attentions like a trapped wild rabbit, never looking at us, never opening his lips, only shrinking slightly. When Letty had put on him his little torn shirt and had gathered the great breeches about him, Emily went to him to coax him and make him at home. She kissed him and talked to him with her full vibration of emotional caress. It seemed almost to suffocate him. Then she tried to feed him with bread and milk from a spoon, but he would not open his mouth, and he turned his head away. "'Leave him alone. Take no notice of him,' said Letty, lifting him into the chimney-seat with a basin of bread and milk beside him. Emily fetched the two kittens out of their basket and put them too beside him. "'I wonder how many eggs he's got,' said the father, laughing softly. "'Hush,' said Letty. "'When do you think you will go to Canada, Mr. Saxon?' "'Next spring. It's no good going before.' "'And then you'll marry?' asked Letty of George. Oh, "'Before then, oh, before then,' he said. "'Why?' How is it you are suddenly in such a hurry? When would it be? When are you marry? he asked in reply. I don't know, she said, coming to a full stop. Then I don't know, he said, taking a large wedge of cheese and biting a piece from it. 
It was fixed for June, she said, recovering herself at his suggestion of hope. July, said Emily. Father, said he, holding the piece of cheese up before him as he spoke. He was evidently nervous. Would you advise me to marry Meg? His father started and said, Why, what are you thinking of doing? Yes, all things considered. Well, if she suits you. We are cousins. If you want her, I suppose you won't let that hinder you. She'll have a nice bit of money, and if you like her. I like her all right. I shan't go out to Canada with her, though. I shall stay at the Ram, for the sake of the life. It's a poor life, that, said the father, ruminating. George laughed. A bit mucky, he said, but it'll do. It would need Cyril or Letty to keep me alive in Canada. It was a bold stroke. Everybody was embarrassed. Well, said the father, I suppose we can't have everything we want. We generally have to put up with the next best thing, don't we, Letty? He laughed. Letty flushed furiously. I don't know, she said. You can generally get what you want if you want it badly enough. Of course, if you don't mind. He rose and went across to Sam. He was playing with the kittens. One was patting and cuffing his bare toe, which had poked through his stocking. He pushed and teased the little scamp with his toe till it rushed at him, clinging, tickling, biting, till he gave little bubbles of laughter, quite forgetful of us. Then the kitten was tired and ran off. Letty shook her skirts, and directly the two playful mites rushed upon it, darting round her, rolling head over heels and swinging from the soft cloth. Suddenly becoming aware that they felt tired, the young things trotted away and cuddled together by the fender, where, in an instant, they were asleep. Almost as suddenly, Sam sank into drowsiness. He'd better go to bed, said the father. Put him in my bed, said George. David would wonder what had happened. Will you go to bed, Sam? asked Emily, holding out her arms to him, and immediately startling him by the terrible gentleness of her persuasion. He retreated behind Letty. Come along, said the latter, and she quickly took him and undressed him. Then she picked him up, and his bare legs hung down in front of her. His head drooped drowsily onto her shoulder against her neck. She put down her face to touch the loose riot of his ruddy hair. She stood so, quiet, still, and wistful, for a few moments. Perhaps she was vaguely aware that the attitude was beautiful for her, and irresistibly appealing to George who loved, above all in her, her delicate dignity of tenderness. Emily waited with the lighted candle for her some moments. When she came down, there was a softness about her. Now, said I to myself, if George asks her again, he is wise. He is asleep, she said quietly. I'm thinking we might as well let him stop while we're here, should we, George? said his father. Eh? We'll keep him here while we are here. Oh, the lad. I should. Yes, he'd be better here than up yonder. Ah, yes, ever so much. It is good of you, said Letty. Oh, he'll make no difference, said the father. Not a bit, added George. What about his mother? asked Letty. I'll call and tell her in the morning, said George. Yes, she said. Call and tell her. Then she put on her things to go. He also put on his cap. Are you coming a little way, Emily? I asked. She ran, laughing with bright eyes, as we went out into the darkness. We waited for them at the woodgate. We all lingered, not knowing what to say. Letty said finally, Well, it's no good. The grass is wet. Good night. Good night, Emily. Good night, he said, with regret and hesitation, and a trifle of impatience in his voice and his manner. He lingered still a moment. She hesitated, then she struck off sharply. He's not asked her, the idiot, I said to myself. Really, she said bitterly when we were going up the garden path. You think rather quiet folks have a lot in them, but it's only stupidity. They are mostly fools. End of part two, chapter four.